Section 1 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew, 1812 to 1887. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. The Destroyers of Vermin Part 1 The Rat Killer In the Brill, or rather in Brill Place, Somerstown, there is a variety of courts branching out into Chapel Street, and in one of the most angular and obscure of these is to be found a perfect nest of rat catchers. Not altogether professional rat catchers, but for the most part, sporting mechanics and costermongers. The court is not easily to be found, being inhabited by men not so well known in the immediate neighbourhood as perhaps a mile or two away, and only to be discovered by the aid and direction of the little girl at the neighbouring cat's meat shop. My first experience of this court was the usual disturbance at the entrance. I found one end or branch of it filled with a mob of eager listeners, principally women, all attracted to a particular house by the sounds of quarrelling. One man gave it as his opinion that the disturbers must have earned too much money yesterday, and a woman speaking to another who had just come out, lifting up both her hands and laughing, said, Here they are, at it again. The rat killer whom we were in search of was out at his stall in Chapel Street when we called, but his wife soon fetched him. He was a strong, sturdy-looking man, rather above the middle height, with light hair, ending in sandy whiskers, reaching under his chin, sharp, deep-set eyes, a tight, skinned nose that looked as if the cuticle had been stretched to its utmost on its bridge. He was dressed in the ordinary corduroy costermonger habit, having, in addition, a dark blue guernsey drawn over his waistcoat. The man's first anxiety was to show us that rats were not his only diversion, and in consequence he took us into the yard of the house, where in a shed lay a bulldog, a bull bitch, and a litter of pups just a week old. They did not belong to him, but he said he did a good deal in the way of curing dogs when he could get them. On a shelf in this shed were two large dishes, the one containing mussels without the shells, and the other eels, these are the commodities in which he deals at present, so that he is properly what one would call a pickled eel seller. We found his room on the first floor clean and tidy, of a good size, containing two bedsteads and a large sea chest, besides an old-fashioned rickety mahogany table, while in a far corner of the room, perhaps waiting for the cold weather and the winter's fire, was an armchair. Behind the door hung a couple of dog leads made of strong leather and ornamented with brass. Against one side of the wall were two framed engravings of animals and a sort of chart of animated nature, while over the mantel shelf was a variety of most characteristic articles. Among these appeared a model of a bulldog's head, cut out of sandstone and painted in imitation of nature a most marvellous piece of ugliness. He was the best dog I ever see, said the host, and when I parted with him for a ten-pound note, a man as worked in the new road took and made this model. He was a real beauty, was that dog. The man as carved that there didn't have no difficulty in holding him still, because he was very good at that sort of thing, and when he'd looked at anything, he couldn't be off doing it. There were also a great many common prints about the walls, a penny each frame and all, among which were four dogs, all ratting, a gamecock, two Robinson Crusoes, and three scripture subjects. There was, besides, a photograph of another favourite dog, which he'd had give him. The man apologised for the bareness of the room, but said, You see, master, my brother went over to America, contracting for a railway under Pito's, and they sent to me about a year ago, telling me to get together as many likely fellows as I could, about a dozen, and take them over as excavators, and when I was ready, to go to Pito's and get what money I wanted. But when I'd got the men, 
sold off all my sticks and went for the money they told me my brother had got plenty and that if he wanted me he ought to be ashamed of hisself not to send some over hisself so i just got together these few things again and i ain't heard of nothing at all about it since after i had satisfied him that i was not a collector of dog tax trying to find out how many animals he kept he gave me what he evidently thought was a treat a peep at his bulldog which he fetched from upstairs and let it jump about the room with a most unpleasant liberty informing me the while how he had given five pound for him and that one of the first pups he had got by a bull he had got five pounds for and that cleared him that punch note the bulldog's name end note he said is as quiet as a lamb wouldn't hurt nobody i frequently takes him through the streets without a lead certainly he killed a cat the t'other afternoon but he couldn't help that cause the cat flew at him though he took it as quietly as a man would a woman in a passion and only went at her just to save his eyes but you couldn't easy get him off master when he once got a holt he was a good one for rats and he believed the staunchest and tricksiest dog in london when he had taken the brute upstairs for which i was not a little thankful the man made the following statement i ain't a londoner i've travelled all about the country i'm a native of ivor in buckinghamshire i've been three year here at these lodgings and five year in london altogether up to last september before i come to london i was nothing sir a labouring man an excavator i come to london the same as the rest to do anything i could i was at work at the excavations at king's cross station i work as hard as any man in london i think when the station was finished i having a large family thought i'd do the best i could so i went to the foreman at the caledonian sawmills i stopped there a twelvemonth but one day i went for a load and a half of lime and where you fetches a load and a half of lime they always gives you fourpence so as i was having a pint of beer out of it my master came by and saw me drinking and gave me the sack then he wanted me to ax his pardon and i might stop but i told him i wouldn't beg no one's pardon for drinking a pint of beer as was give me so i left there ever since the great western was begun my family has been distributed all over the country wherever there was a railway making my brothers were contractors for pito and i generally worked for my brothers but they've gone to america and taken a contract for a railway at st john's new brunswick british north america i can do anything in the excavating way i don't care what it is after i left the caledonian sawmills i went to billingsgate and bought anything i could see a chance of getting a shilling out on or towards keeping my family all my lifetime i've been a-dealing a little in rats but it was not till i come to london that i turned my mind fully to that sort of thing my father always had a great notion of the same we all like the sport when any on us was in the country and the farmers wanted us to we'd do it if anybody heard tell of my being an activish chap like in that sort of way they'd get me to come for a day or so if anybody has a place that's eaten up with rats i goes and gets some ferrets and takes a dog if i've got one and manages to kill him sometimes i keep my own ferrets but mostly i borrows them this young man that's with me he'll sometimes have an order to go fifty or sixty mile into the country and then he buys his ferrets or gets them the best way he can they charges a good sum for the loan of em sometimes as much as you get for the job you can buy ferrets at leadenhall market for five shillings or seven shillings it all depends you can't get them all at one price some of em is real cowards to what others is some won't even kill a rat the way we tries em is we puts em down anywhere in a room maybe with a rat and if they smell about or won't go up to it why they won't do cause you see sometimes the ferret has to go up a hole and at the end there may be a dozen or sixteen rats and if he hasn't got the heart to tackle one on em why he ain't worth a farden i have kept ferrets for four or five months at a time but they're nasty stinking things i've had them get loose but bless you they do no harm they're as innocent as cats they won't hurt nothing you can play with them like a kitten 
Some puts things down to catch rats, sorts of pison, which is their secret. But I don't. I relies upon my dogs and ferrets, and nothing else. I went to destroy a few rats up at Russell Square. There was a shore come right along, and a few holes. They was swarmed with them there, and didn't know how it was. But the cleverest men in the world couldn't catch many there, cause you see, master, they run down the hole into the shore, and no dog could get through a rat hole. I couldn't get my living, though, at that business. If any gentleman comes to me and says he wants a dog cured or a few rats destroyed, I does it. In the country they give you fourpence a rat, and you can kill sometimes as many in a farmyard as you can in London. The most I ever got for destroying rats was four bob, and then I filled up the brickwork and made the holes good, for there was no more come. I calls myself a coster. Some calls ourselves general dealers, but I doesn't. I goes to market, and if one thing don't suit, why, I buys another. I don't know whether you've heard of it, master, or not, but I'm the man as they say kills rats. That's to say, I kills them like a dog. I'm almost ashamed to mention it, and I shall never do it any more, but I've killed rats for a wager often. You see, it's often been done like for a lark. We've been all together daring one another and trying to do something as nobody else could. I remember the first time I did it for a wager. I was up at blank, where they've got a pit. There was a bulldog, a killing rats, so I says, Oh, that's a duffing dog. Any dog could kill quicker than him. I'd kill again him myself. Well, then they chafed me, and I weren't going to be done, so I says, I'll kill again that dog for a sovereign. The sovereign was staked. I went down to kill eight rats again the dog, and I beat him. I killed him like a dog, with my teeth. I went down hands and knees and bit him. I've done it three times for a sovereign, and I've won each time. I feels very much ashamed of it, though. On the hind part of my neck, as you may see, sir, there's a scar. That's where I was bit by one. The rat twisted itself round and held on like a vice. It was very bad, sir, for a long time. It festered and broke out once or twice, but it's all right now. Rats The rat, though small, weak, and contemptible in its appearance, possesses properties that render it a more formidable enemy to mankind and more injurious to the interests of society than even those animals that are endued with the greatest strength and the most rapacious dispositions. To the one we can oppose united powers and superior arts. With regard to the other, experience has convinced us that no art can counteract the effects of its amazing fecundity, and that force is ineffectually directed against an animal possessed of such variety of means to elude it. There are two kinds of rats known in this country. The black rat, which was formerly universal here, but is now very rarely seen, having been almost extirpated by the large brown kind, which is generally distinguished by the name of the Norway rat. This formidable invader is now universally diffused through the whole country, from whence every method has been tried in vain to exterminate it. This species is about nine inches long, of a light brown colour, mixed with tawny and ash. The throat and belly are of a dirty white, inclining to grey. Its feet are naked and of a pale flesh colour. The tail is as long as the body, covered with minute dusky scales, thinly interspersed with short hairs. In summer it frequents the banks of rivers, ponds and ditches, where it lives on frogs, fishes and small animals. But its rapacity is not entirely confined to these. It destroys rabbits, poultry, young pigeons and so on. It infests the granary, the barn, and the storehouse, does infinite mischief among corn and fruit of all kinds, and, not content with satisfying its hunger, frequently carries off large quantities to its hiding place. It is a bold and fierce little animal, and, when closely pursued, will turn and fasten on its assailant. Its bite is keen, and the wound it inflicts is painful and difficult to heal, owing to the form of its teeth which are long, sharp, and of an irregular shape. The rat is amazingly prolific, usually producing from 12 to 18 young ones at any time. 
their numbers would soon increase beyond all power of restraint were it not for an insatiable appetite that impels them to destroy and devour each other the weaker always fall a prey to the stronger and a large male rat which usually lives by itself is dreaded by those of its own species as their most formidable enemy it is a singular fact in the history of those animals that the skins of such of them as have been devoured in their holes have frequently been found curiously turned inside out every part being completely inverted even to the ends of the toes how the operation is performed it would be difficult to ascertain but it appears to be effected in some peculiar mode of eating out the contents besides the numbers that perish in these unnatural conflicts they have many fierce and inveterate enemies that take every occasion to destroy them mankind has contrived various methods of exterminating these bold intruders for this purpose traps are often found ineffectual such being the sagacity of the animals that when any are drawn into the snare the others by such means learn to avoid the dangerous allurement notwithstanding the utmost caution may have been used to conceal the design the surest method of killing them is by poison nux vomica ground and mixed with oatmeal with a small proportion of oil of rhodium and musk have been found from experience to be very effectual the water rat is somewhat smaller than the norway rat its head larger and its nose thicker its eyes are small its ears short scarcely appearing through the hair its teeth are large strong and yellow the hair on its body thicker and longer than that of the common rat and chiefly of a dark brown colour mixed with red the belly is grey the tail five inches long covered with short black hairs and the tip with white the water rat generally frequents the sides of rivers ponds and ditches where it burrows and forms its nest it feeds on frogs small fish and spawn swims and dives remarkably fast and can continue a long time under water in mr charles fothergill's essay on the philosophy study and use of natural history eighteen thirteen we find some reflections which remind us of ray and durham we shall extract a few paragraphs which relate to the subject in hand Quote, nothing can afford a finer illustration of the beautiful order and simplicity of the laws which govern the creation than the certainty precision and regularity with which the natural checks in the superabundant increase of each tribe of animals are managed and every family is subject to the operation of checks peculiar to the species whatever it may be and established by a wise law of the most high to counteract the fatal effects that might arise from an ever active populative principle it is by the admirable disposition of these checks the contemplation of which is alone sufficient to astonish the loftiest and most comprehensive soul of man that the whole system of animal life in all its various forms is kept in due strength and equilibrium this subject is worthy of the naturalist's most serious consideration this great law mr f proceeds pervades and affects the whole animal creation and so active unwearied and rapid is the principle of increase over the means of subsistence amongst the inferior animals that it is evident whole genera of carnivorous beings amongst beasts birds fish reptiles and insects have been created for the express purpose note question mark end note of suppressing the redundancy of others and restraining their numbers within proper limits but even the natural checks are insufficient to restrain the effects of a too rapid populative principle in some animals which have therefore certain destructive propensities given to them by the creator that operate powerfully upon themselves and their offspring as may be particularly observed in the natural history of the rabbit but which is still more evidently and strikingly displayed in the life and economy of the rat it has been calculated by mr pennant and there can be no doubt of the truth of the statement 
that the astonishing number of 1,274,840 may be produced from a single pair of rabbits in the short space of four years, as these animals in their wild state breed seven times in a year and generally produce eight young ones each time. They are capable of procreation at the age of five or six months, and the doe carries her burden no more than thirty days. But the principle of increase is much more powerful, active, and effective in the common grey rat than in any other animal of equal size. This destructive animal is continually under the furor of animal love. The female carries her young for one month only, and she seldom or never produces a less number than twelve, but sometimes as many as eighteen at a litter. The medium number may be taken for an average, and the period of gestation, though of such short continuance, is confined to no particular season of the year. The embraces of the male are admitted immediately after the birth of the vindictive progeny, and it is a fact which I have ascertained beyond any doubt that the female suckles her young ones almost to the very moment when another litter is dropping into the world as their successors. A celebrated Yorkshire rat catcher, whom I have occasionally employed, one day killed a large female rat that was in the act of suckling twelve young ones, which had attained a very considerable growth. Nevertheless, upon opening her swollen body, he found thirteen quick young that were within a few days of their birth. Supposing, therefore, that the rat produces ten litters in the course of a year, and that no check on their increase should operate destructively for the space of four years, a number not far short of three million might be produced from a single pair in that time. Now the consequence of such an active and productive principle of increase if suffered continually to operate without check, would soon be fatally obvious. We have heard of fertile plains devastated and large towns undermined in Spain by rabbits, and even that a military force from Rome was once requested of the great Augustus to suppress the astonishing numbers of the same animal overrunning the island of Majorca and Menorca. This circumstance is recorded by Pliny. If, therefore, rats were suffered to multiply without the restraint of the most powerful and positive natural checks, not only would fertile plains and rich cities be undermined and destroyed, but the whole surface of the earth, in a very few years, would be rendered a barren and hideous waste, covered with myriads of famished grey rats, against which man himself would contend in vain. But the same almighty being who perceived a necessity for their existence has also restricted their numbers within proper bounds by creating to them many very powerful enemies and still more effectually by establishing a propensity in themselves the gratification of which has continually the effect of lessening their numbers even more than any of their foreign enemies. The male rat has an insatiable thirst for the blood of his own offspring. The female, being aware of this passion, hides her young in such secret places as she supposes likely to escape notice or discovery, till her progeny are old enough to venture forth and stand upon their own energies. But notwithstanding this precaution, the male rat frequently discovers them and destroys as many as he can nor is the defence of the mother any very effectual protection, since she herself sometimes falls a victim to her temerity and her maternal tenderness. Besides this propensity to the destruction of their own offspring when other food fails them, rats hunt down and prey upon each other with the most ferocious and desperate avidity, inasmuch as it not unfrequently happens in a colony of these destructive animals that a single male of more than ordinary powers, after having overcome and devoured all competitors, with the exception of a few females, reigns the sole bloody and much dreaded tyrant over a considerable territory, dwelling by himself in some solitary hole, and never appearing abroad without spreading terror and dismay, even amongst the females whose embraces he seeks. 
in this relentless and bloody character may be found one of the most powerful and positive of the checks which operate to the repression of this species within proper bounds a character which attaches in a greater or less degree to the whole moose genus and in which we may readily perceive the cause of the extirpation of the old black rats of england mus ratus for the large grey rats having superior bodily powers united to the same carnivorous propensities would easily conquer and destroy their black opponents wherever they could be found and whenever they met to dispute the title of possession or of sovereignty End quote. when the young rats begin to issue from their holes the mother watches defends and even fights with the cats in order to save them a large rat is more mischievous than a young cat and nearly as strong the rat uses her foreteeth and the cat makes most use of her claws so that the latter requires both to be vigorous and accustomed to fight in order to destroy her adversary the weasel though smaller is a much more dangerous and formidable enemy to the rat because it can follow it into its retreat its strength being nearly equal to that of the rat the combat often continues for a long time but the method of using their arms by the opponents is very different the rat wounds only by repeated strokes with his foreteeth which are better formed for gnawing than biting and being situated at the extremity of the lever or jaw they have not much force but the weasel bites cruelly with the whole jaw and instead of letting go its hold sucks the blood from the wounded part so that the rat is always killed end of section one section two of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the destroyers of vermin part two a night at rat killing considering the immense number of rats which form an article of commerce with many of the lower orders whose business it is to keep them for the purpose of rat matches i thought it necessary for the full elucidation of my subject to visit the well-known public house in london where on a certain night in the week a pit is built up and regular rat-killing matches take place, and where those who have sporting dogs or are anxious to test their qualities can, after such matches are finished, purchase half a dozen or a dozen rats for them to practice upon and judge for themselves of their dogs' performances. To quote the words printed on the proprietor's card, quote, he is always at his old house at home as usual to discuss the fancy generally end quote. i arrived at about eight o'clock at the tavern where the performances were to take place i was too early but there was plenty to occupy my leisure in looking at the curious scene around me and taking notes of the habits and conversation of the customers who were flocking in the front of the long bar was crowded with men of every grade of society all smoking drinking and talking about dogs many of them had brought with them their fancy animals, so that a kind of canine exhibition was going on. Some carried under their arm small bulldogs, whose flat pink noses rubbed against my arm as I passed. Others had sky terriers, curled up like balls of hair, and sleeping like children, as they were nursed by their owners. The only animals that seemed awake and under continual excitement were the little brown English terriers, who, despite the neat black leathern collars by which they were held, struggled to get loose, as if they smelt the rats in the room above, and were impatient to begin the fray. There is a business-like look about this tavern, which at once lets you into the character of the person who owns it. The drinking seems to have been a secondary notion in its formation, for it is a low-roofed room without any of those adornments which are now generally considered so necessary to render a public house attractive. The tubs where the spirits are kept are blistered with the heat of the gas, 
and so dirty that the once brilliant gilt hoops are now quite black. Sleeping on an old hall chair lay an enormous white bulldog, a great beauty, as I was informed, with a head as round and smooth as a clenched boxing glove, and seemingly too large for the body. Its forehead appeared to protrude in a manner significant of water on the brain, and almost overhung the short nose through which the animal breathed heavily. When this dog, which was the admiration of all beholders, rose up, its legs were as bowed as a tailor's, leaving a peculiar pear-shaped opening between them, which, I was informed, was one of its points of beauty. It was a white dog with a sore look from its being peculiarly pink round the eyes, nose, and indeed at all the edges of its body. On the other side of the fireplace was a white bull terrier dog with a black patch over the eye, which gave him rather a disreputable look. This animal was watching the movements of the customers in front, and occasionally, when the entrance door was swung back, would give a growl of inquiry as to what the fresh comer wanted. The proprietor was kind enough to inform me, as he patted this animal's ribs, which showed like the hoops on a butter firkin, that he considered there had been a little of the greyhound in some of his back generations. About the walls were hung clusters of black leather collars, adorned with brass rings and clasps, and preeminent was a silver dog collar, which, from the conversation of those about me, I learnt was to be the prize in a rat match, to be killed for in a fortnight's time. As the visitors poured in, they, at the request of the proprietor, not to block up the bar, took their seats in the parlour, and, accompanied by a waiter who kept shouting, Give your orders, gentlemen! I entered the room. I found that, like the bar, no pains had been taken to render the room attractive to the customers, for with the exception of the sporting pictures hung against the dingy paper, it was devoid of all adornment. Over the fireplace were square glazed boxes, in which were the stuffed forms of dogs famous in their day. Preeminent among the prints was that representing the wonder Tiny, five pounds and a half in weight, as he appeared killing two hundred rats. This engraving had a singular look from its having been printed upon a silk handkerchief. Tiny had been a great favourite with the proprietor, and used to wear a lady's bracelet as a collar. Among the stuffed heads was one of a white bulldog, with tremendous glass eyes sticking out, as if it had died of strangulation. The proprietor's son was kind enough to explain to me the qualities that had once belonged to this favourite. They've spoilt her in stuffing, sir, he said. Made her so short in the head. But she was the wonder of her day. There wasn't a dog in England as would come nigh her. There's her daughter, he added, pointing to another head something like that of a seal. But she wasn't reckoned half as handsome as her mother, though she was very much admired in her time. That there is a dog, he continued, pointing to one represented with a rat in its mouth. It was as good as any in England, though it's so small. I've seen her kill a dozen rats, almost as big as herself, though they killed her at last. For sewer rats are dreadful for giving dogs canker in the mouth and she wore herself out with continually killing them, though we always rinsed her mouth out well with peppermint and water while she were at work. When rats bite, they are poisonous, and an ulcer is formed, which we were obliged to lance. That's what killed her. The company assembled in the parlour consisted of sporting men, or those who, from curiosity, had come to witness what a rat match was like. Seated at the same table, talking together, were those dressed in the costermonger's suit of corduroy, soldiers with their uniforms carelessly unbuttoned, coachmen in their livery, and tradesmen who had slipped on their evening frock coats and run out from the shop to see the sport. The dogs belonging to the company were standing on the different tables, or tied to the legs of the farms, or sleeping in their owner's arms, and were in turn minutely criticised their limbs being stretched out as if they were being felt for fractures, and their mouths looked into as if a dentist were examining their teeth. Nearly all the little animals were marked with scars from bites. 
Pity to bring him up to rat killing, said one who had been admiring a fierce looking bull terrier, although he did not mention at the same time what line in life the little animal ought to pursue. At another table, one man was declaring that his pet animal was the exact image of the celebrated rat killing dog, Billy at the same time pointing to the picture against the wall of that famous animal as he performed his wonderful feat of killing five hundred rats in five minutes and a half. There were amongst the visitors some French gentlemen who had evidently witnessed nothing of the kind before, and whilst they endeavoured to drink their hot gin and water, they made their interpreter translate to them the contents of a large placard hung upon a hat peg and headed, Every man has his fancy, ratting sports in reality. About nine o'clock, the proprietor took the chair in the parlour, at the same time giving the order to shut up the shutters in the room above and light up the pit. This announcement seemed to arouse the spirits of the impatient assembly, and even the dogs tied to the legs of the tables ran out to the length of their leathern thongs, and their tails curled like eels as if they understood the meaning of the words. "'Why, that's the little champion,' said the proprietor, patting a dog with thighs like a grasshopper, and whose mouth opened back to its ears. "'Well, it is a beauty. I wish I could gammon you to take a fiver for it.' Then, looking round the room, he added, "'Well, gents, I'm glad to see you look so comfortable.' The performances of the evening were somewhat hurried on by the entering of a young gentleman whom the waiters called Cap'n. "'Now, Jem, when is this match coming off?' the captain asked impatiently, and despite the assurance that they were getting ready, he threatened to leave the place if kept waiting much longer. This young officer seemed to be a great fancier of dogs, for he made the round of the room, handling each animal in its turn feeling and squeezing its feet and scrutinising its eyes and limbs with such minuteness that the French gentlemen were forced to inquire who he was. There was no announcement that the room above was ready, though everybody seemed to understand it, for all rose at once, and mounting the broad wooden staircase, which led to what was once the drawing-room, dropped their shillings into the hand of the proprietor and entered the rat-killing apartment. The pit, as it is called, consists of a small circus, some six feet in diameter. It is about as large as a centre flower bed, and is fitted with a high wooden rim that reaches to elbow height. Over it, the branches of a gas lamp are arranged, which light up the white painted floor, and every part of the little arena. On one side of the room is a recess, which the proprietor calls his private box and this apartment the captain and his friend soon took possession of, whilst the audience generally clambered upon the tables and forms, or hung over the sides of the pit itself. All the little dogs which the visitors had brought up with them were now squalling and barking and struggling in their master's arms, as if they were thoroughly acquainted with the uses of the pit, and when a rusty wire cage of rats, filled with the dark moving mass, was brought forward, the noise of the dogs was so great that the proprietor was obliged to shout out, Now, you that have dogs, do make them shut up. The captain was the first to jump into the pit. A man wanted to sell him a bull terrier, spotted like a fancy rabbit, and a dozen of rats was the consequent order. The captain preferred pulling the rats out of the cage himself, laying hold of them by their tails and jerking them into the arena. He was cautioned by one of the men not to let them bite him, for, Believe me, were the words, you'll never forget, Cap'n. These here are none of the cleanest. Whilst the rats were being counted out, some of those that had been taken from the cage ran about the painted floor and climbed up the young officer's legs, making him shake them off and exclaim, Get out, you varmint! Whilst others of the ugly little animals sat upon their hind legs, cleaning their faces with their paws. When the dog in question was brought forth and shown the dozen rats, he grew excited and stretched himself in his owner's arms, whilst all the other animals joined in a full chorus of whining. "'Chuck him in!' said the captain. 
and over went the dog and in a second the rats were running round the circus or trying to hide themselves between the small openings in the boards round the pit although the proprietor of the dog endeavoured to speak up for it by declaring it was a good un and a very pretty performer still it was evidently not worth much in a rat-killing sense and if it had not been for his second who beat the sides of the pit with his hand and shouted hi hi at him in a most bewildering manner we doubt if the terrier would not have preferred leaving the rats to themselves to enjoy their lives some of the rats when the dog advanced towards them sprang up in his face making him draw back with astonishment others as he bit them curled round in his mouth and fastened on his nose so that he had to carry them as a cat does its kittens it also required many shouts of drop it dead un before he would leave those he had killed we cannot say whether the dog was eventually bought but from its owners exclaiming in a kind of apologetic tone why he never saw a rat before in all his life we fancy no dealings took place the captain seemed anxious to see as much sport as he could for he frequently asked those who carried dogs in their arms whether his little un would kill and appeared sorry when such answers were given as my dog's mouth's a little out of order cap'n or i've only tried him at very small uns one little dog was put in the pit to amuse himself with the dead bodies he seized hold of one almost as big as himself shook it furiously till the head thumped the floor like a drumstick making those around shout with laughter and causing one man to exclaim he's a good un at shaking heads and tails ain't he preparations now began for the grand match of the evening in which fifty rats were to be killed the dead uns were gathered up by their tails and flung into the corner the floor was swept and a big flat basket produced like those in which chickens are brought to market and under whose iron wire top could be seen small mounds of closely packed rats this match seemed to be between the proprietor and his son and the stake to be gained was only a bottle of lemonade of which the father stipulated he should have first drink it was strange to observe the daring manner in which the lad introduced his hand into the rat cage sometimes keeping it there for more than a minute at a time as he fumbled about and stirred up with his fingers the living mass picking out as he had been requested only the big uns when the fifty animals had been flung into the pit they gathered themselves together into a mound which reached one-third up the sides and which reminded one of the heap of hair sweepings in a barber's shop after a heavy day's cutting these were all sewer and water-ditch rats and the smell that rose from them was like that from a hot drain the captain amused himself by flicking at them with his pocket handkerchief and offering them the lighted end of his cigar which the little creatures tamely snuffed at and drew back from as they singed their noses it was also a favourite amusement to blow on the mound of rats for they seemed to dislike the cold wind which sent them fluttering about like so many feathers indeed whilst the match was going on whenever the little animals collected together and formed a barricade as it were to the dog the cry of blow on him blow on him was given by the spectators and the dog's second puffed at them as if extinguishing a fire when they would dart off like so many sparks the company was kept waiting so long for the match to begin that the impatient captain again threatened to leave the house and was only quieted by the proprietor's reply of my dear friend be easy the boy's on the stairs with the dog and true enough we shortly heard a wheezing and a screaming in the passage without as if some strong-winded animal were being strangled and presently a boy entered carrying in his arms a bull terrier in a perfect fit of excitement foaming at the mouth and stretching its neck forward so that the collar which held it back seemed to be cutting its throat in two the animal was nearly mad with rage scratching and struggling to get loose lay hold a little closer up to the head or he'll turn round and nip yer said the proprietor to his son 
whilst the gasping dog was fastened up in a corner to writhe its impatience away the landlord made inquiries for a stopwatch and also for an umpire to decide as he added whether the rats were dead or alive when they're killed as paddy says when all the arrangements had been made the second and the dog jumped into the pit and after letting him see him a bit the terrier was let loose the moment the dog was free he became quiet in a most business-like manner and rushed at the rats burying his nose in the mound till he brought out one in his mouth in a short time a dozen rats with wetted necks were lying bleeding on the floor and the white paint of the pit became grained with blood in a little time the terrier had a rat hanging to his nose which despite his tossing still held on he dashed up against the sides leaving a patch of blood as if a strawberry had been smashed there he doesn't squeal that's one good thing said one of the lookers-on as the rats fell on their sides after a bite they were collected together in the centre where they lay quivering in their death grasps hi butcher hi butcher shouted the second good dog Brrr! and he beat the sides of the pit like a drum till the dog flew about with new life dead and drop it he cried when the terrier nosed at a rat kicking on its side as it slowly expired of its broken neck time said the proprietor when four of the eight minutes had expired and the dog was caught up and held panting his neck stretched out like a serpent's staring intently at the rats which still kept crawling about the poor little wretches in this brief interval as if forgetting their danger again commenced cleaning themselves some nibbling the ends of their tails others hopping about going now to the legs of the lad in the pit and sniffing at his trousers or strange to say advancing smelling to within a few paces of their enemy the dog the dog lost the match and the proprietor we presume honourably paid the bottle of lemonade to his son but he was evidently displeased with the dog's behaviour for he said he won't do for me he's not one of my sort here jim tell mr g he may have him if he likes i won't give him house room a plentiful shower of halfpence was thrown into the pit as a reward for the second who had backed the dog a slight pause now took place in the proceedings during which the landlord requested that the gentlemen would give their minds up to drinking you know the love i have for you he added jocularly and that i don't care for any of you whilst the waiter accompanied the invitation with a cry of give your orders gentlemen and the lad with the rats asked if any other gentleman would like any rats several other dogs were tried and amongst them one who from the size of his stomach had evidently been accustomed to large dinners and looked upon rat killing as a sport and not as a business the appearance of this fat animal was greeted with remarks such as why don't you feed your dog and you shouldn't give him more than five meals a day another impatient bull terrier was thrown into the midst of a dozen rats he did his duty so well that the admiration of the spectators was focused upon him ah said one he'd do better at a hundred than twelve whilst another observed rat killing's his game i can see while the landlord himself said he's a very pretty creature and i'd back him to kill against anybody's dog at eight and a half or nine the captain was so startled with this terrier's cleverness that he vowed that if she could kill fifteen in a minute he'd give a hundred guineas for her it was nearly twelve o'clock before the evening's performance concluded several of the spectators tried their dogs upon two or three rats either the biggest or the smallest that could be found and many offers as to what he wanted for the dog and many inquiries as to who was its father were made before the company broke up at last the landlord finding that no gentleman would like a few rats and that his exhortations to give their minds up to drinking produced no further effect upon the company spoke the epilogue of the rat tragedies in these words quote, 
Gentlemen, I give a very handsome solid silver collar to be killed for next Tuesday. Open to all the world, only they must be novice dogs, or at least such as is not considered phenomenons. We shall have plenty of sport, gentlemen, and there will be loads of rat killing. I hope to see all my kind friends, not forgetting your dogs likewise, and may they be like the Irishmen all over, who had good trouble to catch and kill em, and took good care they didn't come to life again. Gentlemen, there is a good parlour downstairs where we meets for harmony and entertainment. End quote. Jimmy Shaw the proprietor of one of the largest sporting public houses in London, who is celebrated for the rat matches which come off weekly at his establishment, was kind enough to favour me with a few details as to the quality of those animals which are destroyed in his pit. His statement was certainly one of the most curious that I have listened to, and it was given to me with a readiness and a courtesy of manner such as I have not often met with during my researches. The landlord himself is known in pugilistic circles as one of the most skilful boxers among what is termed the lightweights. His statement is curious, as a proof of the large trade which is carried on in these animals, for it would seem that the men who make a business of catching rats are not always employed as exterminators for they make a good living as purveyors for supplying the demands of the sporting portion of London. The poor people, said the sporting landlord, who supply me with rats, are what you may call barn door labouring poor, for they are the most ignorant people I ever come near. Really, you would not believe people could live in such ignorance. Talk about Latin and Greek, sir. Why, English is Latin to them. In fact, I have a difficulty to understand them myself. When the harvest is got in, they go hunting the hedges and ditches for rats. Once, the farmers had to pay tuppence a head for all rats caught on their grounds, and they nailed them up against the wall. But now that the rat catchers can get thruppence each by bringing the vermin up to town, the farmers don't pay them anything for what they catch but merely give them permission to hunt them in their stacks and barns, so that they no longer get their tuppence in the country, though they get their thruppence in town. I have some twenty families depending upon me. From Clavering in Essex, I suppose I have hundreds of thousands of rats sent to me in wire cages, fitted into baskets. From Enfield I have a great quantity, but the catchers don't get them all there but travel round the country for scores of miles, for you see threepence ahead is money. Besides, there are some liberal farmers who will still give them a halfpenny ahead into the bargain. Enfield is a kind of headquarters for rat catchers. It's dangerous work, though, for you see, there is a wonderful deal of difference in the species of rats. The bite of sewer or water-ditch rats is very bad. The water and ditch rat lives on filth, but your barn rat is a plump fellow, and he lives on the best of everything. He's well off. There's as much difference between the barn and sewer rats as between a brewer's horse and a costermonger's. Sewer rats are very bad for dogs. Their coats is poisonous. Some of the rats that are brought to me are caught in the warehouses in the city. Wherever there is anything in the shape of provisions, there you are sure to find Mr. Rat, an intruder. The catchers are paid for catching them in the warehouses, and then they are sold to me as well, so the men must make a good thing of it. Many of the more courageous kind of warehousemen will take a pleasure in hunting the rats themselves. I should think I buy, in the course of the year, on the average, from 300 to 700 rats a week. Note, Taking 500 as the weekly average, this gives a yearly purchase of 26,000 live rats. End note. That's what I kill taking all the year round, you see. Some first-class chaps will come here in the daytime and they'll try their dogs. They'll say, Jimmy, give the dog a hundred. After he's polished them off, they'll say perhaps, hang it, give him another hundred. Bless you, he added in a kind of whisper 
I've had noble ladies and titled ladies come here to see the sport, on the quiet, you know. When my wife was here, they would come regular, but now she's away, they don't come so often. The largest quantity of rats I've bought from one man was five guineas worth, or thirty-five dozen, at threepence a head, and that's a load for a horse. This man comes up from Clavering in a kind of cart, with a horse that's a regular phenomena, for it ain't like a beast nor nothing. I pays him a good deal of money at times, and I'm sure I can't tell what he does with it, but they do tell me that he deals in old iron and goes buying it up, though he don't seem to have much of a headpiece for that sort of fancy neither. During the harvest time the rats run scarcer, you see, and the getcher turns up rat-catching for harvest work. After the harvest, rats get plentiful again. I've had as many as two thousand rats in this very house at one time. They'll consume a sack of barley meal in a week, and the brutes, if you don't give em good stuff, they'll eat one another, hang em. I'm the oldest canine fancier in London, and I'm the first that started ratting. In fact, I know I'm the oldest caterer in rat killing in the metropolis. I began as a lad, and I had many noble friends, and was as good a man then as I am now. In fact, when I was seventeen or eighteen years of age, I was just like what my boy is now. I used at that time to be a great public character, and had many liberal friends, very liberal friends. I used to give them rat sports, and I have kept to it ever since. My boy can handle rats now just as I used to then. Have I been bit by them? Hi, hundreds of times. Now, some people will say, rub yourself over with caraway and stuff, and then the rats won't bite you. But I give you my word and honour, it's all nonsense, sir. As I said, I was the first in London to give rat sports, and I've kept to it ever since. Bless you, there's nothing that a rat won't bite through. I've seen my lads standing in the pit with the rats running about them, and if they haven't taken the precaution to tie their trousers round with a bit of string at the bottom... They'd have as many as five or six rats run up their trouser legs. They'll deliberately take off their clothes and pick them out from their shirts and bosoms and breeches. Some people is amused and others is horror struck. People have asked them whether they ain't rubbed. They'll say yes, but that's as a lark, cause sometimes when my boy has been taking the rats out of the cage and somebody has taken his attention off talking to him, he has had a bite and will turn to me with his finger bleeding and say, Yes, I'm rubbed, ain't I, father? Look here. A rat's bite is very singular. It's a three-cornered one, like a leech's, only deeper, of course, and it will bleed for ever such a time. My boys have sometimes had their fingers go dreadfully bad from rat bites, so that they turn all black and putrid-like, I as black as the horse hair covering to my sofa. People have said to me, you ought to send the lad to the hospital and have his finger took off. But I've always left it to the lads, and they've said, oh, don't mind it, father, it'll get all right by and by, and so it has. The best thing I ever found for a rat bite was the thick bottoms of porter casks put on as a poultice. The only thing you can do is to poultice, and these porter bottoms is so powerful and draws so that they'll actually take thorns out of horses' hoofs and feet after steeplechasing. In handling rats, it's nothing more in the world but nerve that does it. I should faint now if a rat was to run up my breeches, but I have known the time when I've been covered with them. I generally throw my dead rats away now, but two or three years since, my boys took the idea of skinning them into their heads, and they did about three hundred of them and their skins was very promising. The boys was, after all, obliged to give them away to a furrier, for my wife didn't like the notion, and I said, throw them away. But the idea strikes me to be something, and one that is lost sight of, for the skins are warm and handsome looking, a beautiful grey. There's nothing turned so quickly as dead rats, so I am obliged to have my dustmen come round every Wednesday morning, and regularly enough they call too, for they know where there is a bob and a pot. I generally prefer using the authorised dustmen, though the others come sometimes, the flying dustmen they call them, and if they're first, they has the job. 
It strikes me, though, that to throw away so many valuable skins is a good thing lost sight of. The rats want a deal of watching and a deal of sorting. Now, you can't put a sewer and a barn rat together. It's like putting a Russian and a Turk under the same roof. I can tell a barn rat from a ship rat or a sewer rat in a minute, and I have to look over my stock when they come in or they'd fight to the death. There are six or seven different kinds of rats, and if we don't sort them, they tear one another to pieces. I think when I have a number of rats in the house that I am a lucky man if I don't find a dozen dead when I go up to them in the morning, and when I tell you that at times, when I've wanted to make up my number for a match, I've given twenty-one shillings for twenty rats. You may think I lose something that way every year. Rats, even now, is occasionally six shillings a dozen but that, I think, is most inconsistent. If I had my will, I wouldn't allow sewer ratting, for the rats in the shores eats up a great quantity of sewer filth and rubbish, and is another species of scavenger in their own way. After finishing his statement, the landlord showed me some very curious specimens of tame rats, some piebald and others quite white, with pink eyes, which he kept in cages in his sitting room. He took them out from their cages and handled them without the least fear, and even handled them rather rudely, as he showed me the peculiarities of their colours. Yet the little tame creatures did not once attempt to bite him. Indeed, they appeared to have lost the notion of regaining their liberty, and when near their cages, struggled to return to their nests. In one of these boxes, a black and a white rat were confined together, and the proprietor, pointing to them, remarked, I hope they'll breed, for though white rats is very scarce, only occurring, in fact, by a freak of nature, I fancy I shall be able, with time and trouble, to breed them myself. The old English rat is a small jet black rat, but the first white rat, as I heard of, come out of a burial ground. At one time I bred rats very largely, but now I leaves that fancy to my boys, for I've as much as I can do, continuing to serve my worthy patrons. End of section two. Section three of London Labour and the London Poor, volume three, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 3. Jack Black As I wished to obtain the best information about rat and vermin destroying, I thought I could not do better now than apply to that eminent authority, the Queen's Rat Catcher, and accordingly I sought an interview with Mr. Jack Black, whose handbills are headed, quote, V.R. Rat and Mole Destroyer to Her Majesty, end quote. I had already had a statement from the Royal Bug Destroyer relative to the habits and means of exterminating those offensive vermin, and I was desirous of pairing it with an account of the personal experience of the Queen of England's rat catcher. In the sporting world, and among his regular customers, the Queen's rat catcher is better known by the name of Jack Black. He enjoys the reputation of being the most fearless handler of rats of any man living playing with them, as one man expressed it to me, as if they were so many blind kittens. The first time I ever saw Mr. Black was in the streets of London, at the corner of Hart Street, where he was exhibiting the rapid effects of his rat poison by placing some of it in the mouth of a living animal. He had a cart then with rats painted on the panels, and at the tailboard, where he stood lecturing, he had a kind of stage rigged up, on which were cages filled with rats and pills and poison packages. Here I saw him dip his hand into this cage of rats and take out as many as he could hold, a feat which generally caused an oh of wonder to escape from the crowd, especially when they observed that his hands were unbitten. Women more particularly shuddered when they beheld him place some half-dozen of the dusty-looking brutes within his shirt next his skin and men swore the animals had been tamed, as he let them run up his arms like squirrels, 
and the people gathered round beheld them sitting on his shoulders cleaning their faces with their front paws or rising up on their hind legs like little kangaroos and sniffing about his ears and cheeks but those who knew mr black better were well aware that the animals he took up in his hand were as wild as any of the rats in the sewers of london and that the only mystery in the exhibition was that of a man having courage enough to undertake the work i afterwards visited jack black at his house in battersea i had some difficulty in discovering his country residence and was indebted to a group of children gathered round and staring at the bird-cage in the window of his cottage for his address their exclamations of delight at a grey parrot climbing with his beak and claws about the zinc wires of his cage and the hopping of the little linnets there in the square boxes scarcely bigger than a brick made me glance up at the door to discover who the bird fancier was when painted on a bit of zinc just large enough to fit the shaft of a tax cart i saw the words j black rat destroyer to her majesty surmounted by the royal initials v r together with the painting of a white rat mr black was out sparrer catching as his wife informed me for he had an order for three dozen which was to be shot in a match at some tea gardens close by when i called again mr black had returned and i found him kneeling before a big rusty iron wire cage as large as a sea chest and transferring the sparrows from his bird-catching apparatus to the more roomy prison he transacted a little business before i spoke to him for the boys about the door were asking can i have one for a penny master there is evidently a great art in handling birds for when mr black held one he took hold of it by the wings and tail so that the little creature seemed to be sitting upright and had not a feather rumpled while it stretched out its neck and looked around it the boys on the contrary first made them flutter their feathers as rough as a hairball and then half smothered them between their two hands by holding them as if they wished to keep them hot i was soon at home with mr black he was a very different man from what i had expected to meet for there was an expression of kindliness in his countenance a quality which does not exactly agree with one's preconceived notions of rat-catchers his face had a strange appearance from his rough uncombed hair being nearly grey and his eyebrows and whiskers black so that he looked as if he wore powder mr black informed me that the big iron wire cage in which the sparrows were fluttering about had been constructed by him for rats and that it held over a thousand when full for rats are packed like cups he said one over the other but he added business is bad for rats and it makes a splendid havery besides sparrers is the rats of birds sir for if you look at them in the cage they always huddles up in a corner like rats in a pit and they are almost vermin in colour and habits and eats anything the rat catcher's parlour was more like a shop than a family apartment in a box with iron bars before it like a rabbit hutch was a white ferret twisting its long thin body with a snake-like motion up and down the length of its prison as restlessly as if it were a miniature polar bear when mr black called polly to the ferret it came to the bars and fixed its pink eyes on him a child lying on the floor poked its fingers into the cage but polly only smelt at them and finding them not good to eat went away mr black stuffs animals and birds and also catches fish for vivaria against the walls were the furred and feathered remains of departed favourites each in its glazed box and appropriate attitude there was a famous polecat a first rater at rats we were informed here a ferret that never was equalled this canary had earned pounds that linnet was the wonder of its day the enormous pot-bellied carp with the miniature rushes painted at the back of its case was caught in the regent's park waters in another part of the room hung fishing lines and a badger's skin and lead bobs and curious eel-hooks 
the latter as big as the curls on the temples of a Spanish dancer, and from here Mr. Black took down a transparent-looking fish, like a slip of parchment, and told me that it was a fresh-water smelt, and that he caught it in the Thames, the first he ever heard of. Then he showed me a beetle suspended to a piece of thread, like a big spider to its web, and this, he informed me, was the Thames beetle, which either live by land or water. You catch em, continued Mr. Black, when they are swimming on their backs, which is their nature, and when they turns over, you find them beautifully crossed and marked. Round the room were hung paper bags, like those in which housewives keep their sweet herbs. All of them there, sir, contain cured fish for eating, Mr. Black explained to me. I'm called down here the Battersea Otter, he went on, for I can go out at four in the morning and come home by eight with a barrow full of fresh water fish. Nobody knows how I do it, because I never takes no nets or lines with me. I assure them I catch em with my hands, which I do, but they only laughs incredulous like. I knows the fishes harnts and watches the tides. I sells fresh fish perch, roach, dace, gudgeon, and such like, and even small jack, at threepence a pound, or what they'll fetch. And I've caught near the Wandsworth Black Sea, as we calls it, half a hundredweight sometimes, and I never took less than my handkerchief full. I was inclined, like the inhabitants of Battersea, to be incredulous of the rat-catcher's hand-fishing, until, under a promise of secrecy, he confided his process to me and then not only was I perfectly convinced of its truth, but startled that so simple a method had never before been taken advantage of. Later in the day, Mr. Black became very communicative. We sat chatting together in his sanded bird shop, and he told me all his misfortunes, and how bad luck had pressed upon him and driven him out of London. I was fool enough to take a public house in Regent Street, sir, he said. My daughter used to dress as the rat-catcher's daughter and serve behind the bar, and that did pretty well for a time, but it was a brewer's house, and they ruined me. The costume of the rat-catcher's daughter was shown to me by her mother. It was a red velvet bodice, embroidered with silver lace. With a muslin skirt and her hair down her back, she looked very genteel, added the parent. Mr. Black's chief complaint was that he could not make an appearance, for his uniform, a beautiful green coat and red waistcoat, were pledged. Whilst giving me his statement, Mr. Black, in proof of his assertions of the biting powers of rats, drew my attention to the leathern breeches he wore, as were given him twelve years ago by Captain B. These were pierced in some places with the teeth of the animals, and in others were scratched and fringed, like the wash-leather of a street knife-seller. His hands, too, and even his face, had scars upon them from bites. Mr. Black informed me that he had given up tobacco since a accident he met with from a pipe. I was smoking a pipe, he said, and a friend of mine by chance jobbed it into my mouth, and it went right through to the back of my palate, and I nearly died. Here his wife added, There's a hole there to this day you could put your thumb into. You never saw such a mouth. Mr. Black informed me in secret that he had often, unbeknown to his wife, tasted what cooked rats were like, and he asserted that they were as moist as rabbits and quite as nice. If they are sure rats, he continued, just chase them for two or three days before you kill them and they are as good as barn rats, I give you my word, sir. Mr. Black's statement was as follows, quote, I should think I've been a ratting almost for five and thirty year, indeed, I may say from my childhood, for I've kept at it almost all my life. I've been dead near three times from bites, as near as a toucher. I once had the teeth of a rat break in my finger, which was dreadful bad and swole and putrefied, so that I had to have the broken bits pulled out with tweezers. When the bite is a bad one, it festers and forms a hard core in the ulcer, which is very painful, and throbs very much indeed. 
and after that core comes away, unless you cleans them out, well, the sores, even after they seem to be healed, break out over and over again, and never cure perfectly. This core is as big as a boiled fish's eye, and as hard as a stone. I generally cuts the bite out clean with a lancet, and squeeze the humour well from it, and that's the only way to cure it thorough. As you see, my hands is all covered with scars from bites. The worst bite I ever had was at the manor house, Hornsey, kept by Mr. Burnell. One day when I was there, he had some rats get loose, and he asked me to catch them for him, as they was wanted for a match that was coming on that afternoon. I had picked up a lot, indeed, I had one in each hand, and another again my knee, when I happened to come to a sheaf of straw, which I turned over, and there was a rat there. I couldn't lay hold on him, cause my hands was full, and as I stooped down, he ran up the sleeve of my coat and bit me on the muscle of the arm. I shall never forget it. It turned me all of a sudden and made me feel numb. In less than half an hour, I was took so bad I was obliged to be sent home, and I had to get someone to drive my cart for me. It was terrible to see the blood that came from me. I bled awful. Burnell, seeing me go so queer, says, Here, Jack, take some brandy. You look so awful bad. The arm swole and went as heavy as a ton weight pretty well, so that I couldn't even lift it, and so painful I couldn't bear my wife to ferment it. I was kept in bed for two months through that bite at Burnell's. I was so weak I couldn't stand, and I was dreadful feverish, all warmth-like. I knew I was going to die, cause I remember the doctor coming and opening my eyes to see if I was still alive. I've been bitten nearly everywhere, even where I can't name to you, sir, and right through my thumbnail too, which, as you see, always has a split in it, though it's years since I was wounded. I suffered as much from that bite on my thumb as anything. It went right up to my ear. I felt the pain in both places at once, a regular twinge, like touching the nerve of a tooth. The thumb went black, and I was told I ought to have it off, but I knew a young chap at the Middlesex Hospital who wasn't out of his time, and he said, no, I wouldn't, Jack, and no more I did. And he used to strap it up for me. But the worst of it was, I had a job at Camden Town one afternoon after he had dressed the wound, and I got another bite lowered down on the same thumb, and that flung me down on my bed, and there I stopped, I should think, six weeks. I was bit bad too in Edward Street, Hampstead Road, and that time I was sick near three months and close upon dying. Whether it was the poison of the bite or the medicine the doctor gave me, I can't say, but the flesh seemed to swell up like a bladder, regular blood like After all, I think I cured myself by cheating the doctor, as they calls it, for instead of taking the medicine, I used to go to Mr. Blank's house in Albany Street, note the publican, end note, and he'd say, What'll you have, Jack? And I used to take a glass of stout, and that seemed to give me strength to overcome the pison of the bite, for I began to pick up as soon as I left off doctor's stuff. When a rat's bite touches the bone, it makes you faint in a minute, and it bleeds dreadful, ah, most terrible, just as if you had been struck with a penknife. You couldn't believe the quantity of blood that come away, sir. The first rats I caught was when I was about nine years of age. I catched them at Mr. Strickland's, a large cowkeeper in Little Albany Street, Regent's Park. At that time, it was all fields and meadows in them parts, and I recollect there was a big orchard on one side of the sheds. I was only doing it for a game, and there was lots of ladies and gents looking on and wondering at seeing me taking the rats out from under a heap of old bricks and wood where they had collected themselves. I had a little dog, a little redden it was, who was well known through the fancy, and I wanted the rats for to test my dog with, I being a lad what was fond of the sport. I wasn't afraid to handle rats even then, it seemed to come natural to me. I very soon had some in my pocket and some in my hands, carrying them away as fast as I could and putting them into my wire cage. You see, the rats began to run as soon as we shifted them bricks, and I had to scramble for them. Many of them bit me, and to tell you the truth, I didn't know the bites were so many, or I dare say I shouldn't have been so venturesome as I was. After that, I bought some ferrets, four of them, off a man of the name of Butler, what was in the rat-catching line, and afterwards went out to Jamaica to kill rats there. 
I was getting on to ten years of age then, and I was, I think, the first that regularly began hunting rats to exterminate them, for all those before me used to do it with drugs, and perhaps never handled rats in their lives. With my ferrets, I at first used to go out hunting rats round by the ponds in Regent's Park, and the ditches, and in the cow sheds round about. People never paid me for catching, though maybe, if they was very much infested, they might give me a trifle. But I used to make my money by selling the rats to gents as was fond of sport, and wanted them for their little dogs. I kept to this till I was thirteen or fourteen year of age, always using the ferrets, and I bred from them too. Indeed, I've still got the strain, note, breed, end note, of them same ferrets by me now. I've sold them ferrets about everywhere. To Jim Byrne I've sold some of the strain, and to Mr. Anderson, the provision merchant, and to a man that went to Ireland. Indeed, that strain of ferrets has gone nearly all over the world. I never lost a ferret out ratting. I always let them loose, and put a bell on mine, arranged in a peculiar manner, which is a secret. And I then put them into the main run of the rats, and let them go to work. But they must be ferrets that's well trained for working dwellings, or you'll lose them as safe as death. I've had them go away two houses off and come back to me. My ferrets is very tame and so well trained that I'd put them into a house and guarantee that they'd come back to me. In Grosvenor Street, I was clearing once and the ferrets went next door and nearly cleared the house, which is the Honourable Mrs. F's, before they came back to me. Ferrets are very dangerous to handle if not well trained. They are very savage and will attack a man or a child as well as a rat. It was well known at Mr. Hamilton's at Hampstead, it's years ago this is, there was a ferret that got loose what killed a child and was found sucking it. The bite of him is very dangerous, not so poisonous as a rat's, but very painful. And when the little things is hungry, they'll attack anything. I've seen two of them kill a cat, and then they'll suck the blood till they fill themselves, after which they'll fall off like leeches. The weasel and the stoat are, I think, more dangerous than the ferret in their bite. I had a stoat once, which I caught when out ratting at Hampstead for Mr. Cunningham the butcher, and it bit one of my dogs, Black Bess by name, the truest bitch in the world, sir, in the mouth, and she died three days afterwards at the ball at Kilburn. I was along with Captain K, who'd come out to see the sport, and whilst we were at dinner and the poor bitch lying under my chair, my boy says, says he, Father, Black Bess is dying and had scarce spoke the speech when she was dead. It was all through the bite of that stoat, for I opened the wound in the lip, and it was all swole and dreadful ulcerated, and all down the throat it was inflamed most shocking, and so was the lungs quite red and fiery. She was hot with work when she got the bite, and perhaps that made her take the pison quicker. To give you a proof, sir, of the savage nature of the ferrets, I was one night at Jimmy Shaw's, where there was a match to come off with rats, which the ferret was to kill, and young Bob Shaw, note Jim's son, end note, was holding the ferret up to his mouth and giving it spittle, when the animal seized him by the lip and bit it right through, and hung on as tight as a vice, which shows the spitefulness of the ferret, and how it will attack the human frame. Young Shaw still held the ferret in his hand, whilst it was fastened to his lip and he was saying, oh, oh, in pain. You see, I think Jim kept it very hard to make it kill the rats better. There was some nobleman there, and also Mr. George of Kensal Newtown was there, which is one of the largest dog fanciers we have. To make the ferret leave go of young Shaw, they bit its feet and tail, and it wouldn't, cause, as I could have told him, it only made it bite all the more. At last, Mr. George says he to me, For God's sake, Jack, take the ferret off. I didn't like to intrude myself upon the company before, not being in my own place, and I didn't know how Jimmy would take it. Everybody in the room was at a standstill, quite horrified, and Jimmy himself was in a dreadful way for his boy. I went up and quietly forced my thumb into his mouth and loosed him, and he killed a dozen rats after that. They all said, Bravo, Jack, you are a plucked one. And the little chap said, Well, Jack, I didn't like to holler, but it was dreadful painful. 
his lips swole up directly as big as a nigger's and the company made a collection for the lad of some dozen shillings this shows that although a ferret will kill a rat yet like the rat it is always wicious and will attack the human frame when i was about fifteen sir i turned to bird fancying i was very fond of the sombre linnet i was very successful in raising them and sold them for a deal of money i've got the strain of them by me now i've risen them from some i purchased from a person in the coal yard drury lane i give him two pounds for one of the periwinkle strain but afterwards i heard of a person with as i thought a better strain lawson of holloway and i went and give him thirty shillings for a bird i then risen them i used to go and catch the nestlings off the common and risen them under the old trained birds originally linnets was taught to sing by a bird organ principally among the weavers years ago but i used to make the old birds teach the young ones i used to molt them off in the dark by covering the cages up and then they'd learn from hearing the old ones singing and would take the song if any did not sing perfectly i used to sell em as cast-offs the linnets is a beautiful song there are four and twenty changes in a linnet song it's one of the beautifulest songbirds we've got it sings toys as i call them that is it makes sounds which we distinguish in the fancy as the tolloc eek eek quick wheat single eek eek quick wheats or eek eek quick chowls each pipe chowl laugh each pow chowls rattle pipe fear pew and poi this seems like great to you sir but it's the tunes we use in the fancy what we terms fear is a sound like fear as if they was frightened laugh is a kind of shake nearly the same as the rattle i know the sounds of all the english birds and what they say i could tell you about the nightingale the black cap hedge warbler garden warbler petty chat red start a beautiful songbird the willow wren little warblers they are linnets or any of them for i have got their sounds in my ear and my mouth as if to prove this he drew from a side pocket a couple of tin bird whistles which were attached by a string to a buttonhole he instantly began to imitate the different birds commencing with their call and then explaining how when answered to in such a way they gave another note and how if still responded to they uttered a different sound in fact he gave me the whole of the conversation he usually carried on with the different kinds of birds each one being as it were in a different language he also showed me how he allured them to him when they were in the air singing in the distance and he did this by giving their entire song his cheeks and throat seemed to be in constant motion as he filled the room with his loud imitations of the lark and so closely did he resemble the notes of the bird that it was no longer any wonder how the little things could be deceived in the same manner he illustrated the songs of the nightingale and so many birds that i did not recognize the names of some of them he knew all their habits as well as notes and repeated to me the peculiar chirp they make on rising from the ground as well as the sound by which he distinguishes that it is uneasy with curiosity or that it has settled on a tree indeed he appeared to be acquainted with all the chirps which distinguished any action in the bird up to the point when as he told me it circles about and then falls like a stone to the ground with its pitch the nightingale he continued is a beautiful song-bird they're plucky birds too and they hear a call and answer to anybody and when taken in april they're plucked enough to sing as soon as put in the cage I can catch a nightingale in less than five minutes. As soon as he calls, I calls to him with my mouth, and he'll answer me, both by night or day, either from a spinny, note a little copse, end note, a dell or a wood, wherever he may be. I make my scrapes, note, that is, clear away the dirt, end note, set my traps and catch them almost before I've tried my luck. I've kept sometimes thirty in a day, for although people have got a notion that nightingales is scarce, still those who can distinguish their song in the daytime know that they are plentiful enough, almost like the lark. You see, persons fancy that them nightingales as sings at night is the only ones living, but it's wrong, 
for many on them only sings in the day. You see, it was when I was about eighteen, I was beginning to get such a judge about birds, sir. I sold to a butcher of the name of Jackson, the first young un that I made money out of, for two pounds it was, and I've sold loads of em since, for thirty shillings, or two pounds each, and I've got the strain by me now. I've also got by me now the bird that won the match at Mr. Lockwood's in Drury Lane, and won the return match at my own place in High Street, Marabun. It was in the presence of all the fancy. He's multied pied, note, piebald, end note, since, and gone a little white on the head and the back. We only sang for two pounds a side. It wasn't a great deal of money. In our matches we sing by both gas and daylight. He was a master baker I sang against, but I forget his name. They do call him Holy Face, but that's a nickname, because he's very much pockmarked. I wouldn't sell that bird at all for anything. I've been offered ten pounds for it. Captain K put ten sovereigns down on the counter for him, and I wouldn't pick him up, for I've sold lots of his strain for a pound each. When I found I was a master of the birds, then I turned to my rat business again. I had a little rat dog, a black tan terrier of the name of Billy, which was the greatest stock dog in London of that day. He is the father of the greatest portion of the small black tan dogs in London now, which Mr. Isaac, the bird fancier in Princess Street, purchased one of the strain for six or seven pounds, which Jimmy Massey afterwards purchased another of the strain for a monkey, a bottle of wine, and three pounds. That was the rummest bargain I ever made. I've raised and trained monkeys by shoals. Some of mine is about now in shows exhibiting, one in particular, Jimmy. One of the strain of this little black tan dog would draw a badger twelve or fourteen pounds to his six pounds, which was done for a wager, because it was thought the badger had his teeth drawn, but he hadn't, as was proved by his biting Mr. P from Birmingham, for he took a piece clean out of his trousers, which was pretty good proof, and astonished them all in the room. I've been offered a sovereign a pound for some of my little terriers, but it wouldn't pay me at that price for they weren't heavier than two or three pounds. I once sold one of the dogs of this same strain for fourteen pounds to the Austrian ambassador. Mrs. H., the banker's lady, wished to get my strain of terriers, and she gave me five pounds for the use of him. In fact, my terrier dog was known to all the London fancy. As rat-killing dogs, there's no equal to that strain of black tan terriers. It's fifteen year ago since I first worked for government. I found that the parks was much infested with rats, which had undermined the bridges and gnawed the drains, and I made application to Mr. Westley, who was superintendent of the park, and he spoke of it, and then it was wrote to me that I was to fulfil the situation, and I was to have six pounds a year, but after that it was altered, and I was to have so much a head, which is threepence. After that, Newton, what was a warmint destroyer to Her Majesty, dying, I wrote in to the Board of Ordnance when they appointed me to each station in London, that was, to Regency Park Barracks, to the Knightsbridge and Portland Barracks, and to all the other barracks in the metropolis. I've got the letter now by me, in which they says they is proud to appoint me. I've taken 32 rats out of one hole in the islands of Regency Park, and found in it fish, birds, and loads of eggs, duck eggs, and every kind. It must be fourteen year since I first went about the streets exhibiting with rats. I began with a cart and almost a donkey, for it was a pony scarce bigger. But I've had three or four big horses since that, and ask anybody, and they'll tell you, I'm noted for my cattle. I thought that by having a kind of costume, and the rats painted on the cart, and going round the country, I should get my name about, and get myself knowed. And so I did. For folks had come to me, so that sometimes I've had four jobs of a day from people seeing my cart. I found I was quite the master of the rat, and could do pretty well what I liked with him, so I used to go round Finchley, Highgate, and all the suburbs, and show myself, and how I handled the warmint. I used to wear a costume of white leather breeches, and a green coat and scarlet whisket, and a gold band round my hat, and a belt across my shoulder. I used to make a first-rate appearance, such as was becoming the uniform of the Queen's rat-catcher. 
Lord bless you, I've travelled all over London, and I'll kill rats again anybody. I'm open to all the world for any sum, from one pound to fifty. I used to have my belts painted at first by Mr. Bailey, the animal painter, with four white rats. But the idea come into my head that I'd cast the rats in metal, just to make more appearance for the belt, to come out into the world. I was nights and days at it, and it gave me a deal of bother. I could manage it nohow, but by my own ingenuity and perseverance I succeeded. A man asked me a pound apiece for casting the rats. That would have been four pound. I was very certain that my belt, being a handsome one, would help my business tremendous in the sale of my composition. So I took a mould from a dead rat in plaster, and then I got some of my wife's sarspans, and by G blank, I casted him with some of my own pewter pots. The wife, who was standing by, here exclaimed, Oh, my poor sarspans! I remember him. There was scarce one left to cook our whittles with. Thousands of moulders, continued Jack Black, used to come to see me do the casting of the rats, and they kept saying, You'll never do it, Jack. The great difficulty, you see, was casting the high, which is a black bead, into the metal. When the belt was done, I had a great success, for, bless you, I couldn't go a yard without a crowd after me. When I was out with my cart, selling my composition, my usual method was this. I used to put a board across the top and form a kind of counter. I always took with me an iron wire cage, so big a one that Mr. Barnett, a Jew, laid a wager that he could get into it, and he did. I used to form this cage at one end of the cart and sell my composition at the other. There were rats painted round the cart. That was the only show I had about the vehicle. I used to take out the rats and put them outside the cage and used to begin the show by putting rats inside my shirt next my bosom or in my coat and breeches pocket or on my shoulder. In fact, all about me, anywhere. The people would stand to see me take up rats without being bit. I never said much, but I used to handle the rats in every possible manner, letting them run up my arm and stroking their backs and playing with them. Most of the people used to fancy they had been tamed on purpose until they'd see me take fresh ones from the cage and play with them in the same manner. I all this time kept on selling my composition, which my man Joe used to offer about, and whenever a packet was sold, I always tested its virtues by killing a rat with it afore the people's own eyes. I once went to Tottenham to sell my composition and to exhibit with my rats afore the country people. Some countrymen, which said they were rat catchers, came up to me whilst I was playing with some rats and said, Ugh, you're not a rat catcher. That's not the way to do it. They were startled at seeing me sell the pison at such a rate, for the shilling packets was going uncommon well, sir. I said, No, I ain't a rat catcher and don't know nothing about it. You come up and show me how to do it. One of them come up on the cart and put his hand in the cage and curious enough he got three bites directly and afore he could take his hands out they was nearly bit to ribbons. My man Joe says he, I tell you, if we ain't rat catchers, who is? We are the regular rat catchers. My master kills em and then I eats em. And he takes up a live one and puts its head into his mouth and I puts my hand in the cage and pulls out six or seven in a cluster and holds them up in the air without even a bite. The countryman burst out laughing, and they said, Well, you're the best we ever see. I sold near four pounds worth of composition that day. Another day, when I'd been out flying pigeons as well, carriers which I fancied to, I drove the cart, after selling the composition, to the King's Arms, Hanwell, and there was a feller there, a tailor by trade, what had turned rat catcher. He had got with him some fifty or sixty rats, the miserablest mangy brutes you ever see in a tub, taking him up to London to sell. I, hearing of it, was determined to have a lark, so I goes up and takes out ten of them rats and puts them inside my shirt next my bosom, and then I walks into the parlour and sits down and begins drinking my ale as right as if nothing had happened. I scarce had seated myself when the landlord, who was in the lay, says... I know a man who'll catch rats quicker than anybody in the world. This put the tailor chap up. 
so he offers to bet half a gallon of ale he would, and I takes him. He goes to the tub and brings out a very large rat, and walks with it into the room to show to the company. Well, says I to the man, why, I, who ain't a rat catcher, I've got an even bigger one here. And I pulls one out from my bosom. And here's another, and another, and another, says I, till I had placed the whole ten on the table. That's the way I catch em, says I. They come of their own accord to me. He tried to handle the warmints, but the poor fellow was bit, and his hands was soon bleeding furiously, and I without a mark. A gentleman as knowed me said, This must be the Queen's rat catcher, and that spilt the fun. The poor fellow seemed regular done up, and said, I shall give up rat catching, you've beat me. Here I've been travelling with rats all my life, and I never see such a thing afore. When I've been in a mind for travelling, I've never sold less than ten shillings worth of my composition, and I've many a time sold five pounds worth. Ten shillings worth was the least I ever sold. During my younger career, if I'd had a backer, I might one week with another have made my clear three pounds a week, after paying all my expenses and feeding my horse and all. I challenge my composition and sell the art of rat destroying against any chemical rat destroyer in the world for any sum. I don't care what it is. Let anybody, either a medical or druggist manufacturer of composition, come and test with rats again me, and they'll pretty soon find it out. People pay for composition instead of employing the Queen's rat catcher, what kills the warmint and lays down his composition for nothing into the bargain likewise. I also destroy black beetles with a composition which I always keep with me again it's wanted. I often have to destroy the beetles in wine cellars which gnaw the paper off the bottles, such as is round the champagne and French wine bottles. I've killed lots of beetles, too, for bakers. I've also sterminated some thousands of beetles for linen drapers and pork sausage shops. There's two kinds of beetles, the hard shell and the soft shell beetle. The hard shell one is the worst, and that will gnaw cork, paper, and anything woolen. The soft shelled one will gnaw bread or food, and it also lays its eggs in the food, which is dreadful nasty. There's the house ant too, which there is some thousands of people as never saw. I exterminate them as well. There's a Mrs. B at the William the Fourth public house, Hampstead. She couldn't lay her child's clothes down without getting them full of ants. They've got a sting somewhere in feel like a horse flies, and is more annoying than dangerous. It's cockroaches that are found in houses. They're dreadful nasty things, and will bite, and they are equal to the Spanish flies for blistering. I've tried all insects on my flesh to see how they bite me. Cockroaches will undermine similar to the ant, and loosen the bricks the same as the cricket. It's astonishing how so small an insect as them will scrape away such a quantity of mortar as they do, which thing infests grates, floorings, and such like. The beetle is a most extraordinary thing, which will puzzle most people to exterminate, for they lay such a lot of eggs as I would never guarantee to do away with beetles, only to keep them clear, for if you kills the old ones, the eggs will revive, and young ones come out of the wainscoting and such like, and then your employers will say, Why, well, you were paid for exterminating, and yet here they are. One night in August, the night of a very heavy storm, which maybe you remember, sir, I was sent for by a medical gent as lived opposite the load of hay, Hampstead, whose two children had been attacked by rats while they were sleeping in their little cots. I traced the blood, which had left lines from their tails, through the openings in the lath and plaster which I followed to where my ferrets come out of, and they must have come up from the bottom of the house to the attics. The rats gnawed the hands and feet of the little children. The lady heard them crying and got out of her bed and called to the servant to know what the child was making such a noise for, when they struck a light and then they see the rats running away to their holes. Their little nightgowns was covered with blood, as if their throats had been cut. I asked the lady to give me one of the nightgowns to keep as a curiosity, for I considered it a phenomenon, and she gave it to me. But I never was so vexed in all my life as when I was told the next day that a maid had washed it. 
I went down the next morning and sterminated them rats. I found they was of the species of rat, which we term the blood rat, which is a dreadful spiteful feller, a snake-headed rat, and infests the dwellings. There may have been some dozens of them altogether, but it's so long ago I almost forget how many I took in that house. The gent behaved uncommon handsome and said, Mr. Black, I could never pay you for this. And ever afterwards, when I used to pass by that there house, the little dears, when they see me, used to call out to their mamma, Oh, here's Mr. Ratty, ma. They were very pretty little fine children, uncommon handsome, to be sure. I once went to Mr. Holland's in Edward Street, Regent's Park, a cowkeeper he was, where he was so infested that the cows could not lay down or eat their food, for the rats used to go into the manger and fight at them. Mr. Holland said to me, Black, what shall I give you to get rid of them rats? And I said to him, says I, Well, Mr. Hollands, you're a poor man, and I leave it to you. He's got awful rich since then. I went to work, and I actually took out three hundred rats from one hole in the wall, which I had to carry them in my mouth and hands, and under my arms, and in my bosom and pockets, to take them to the cage. I was bit dreadful by them, and suffered greatly by the bites, but nothing to lay up for, though very painful to the hands. To prevent the rats from getting out of the hole, I had to stop it up by putting my breast again it, and then they was jumping up again me and gnawing at my whisket. I should think I sterminated five hundred from them premises. Ah, I did wonders round there, and everybody was talking of my feats. I'll tell you about another cowkeeper's, which Mr. Hollands was so gratified with my skill what I had done, that he pays me handsome and generous, and gives me a recommendation to Mrs. Browns of Camden Town and there I sterminated above seven hundred rats, and I was a near being killed, for I was stooping down under the manger when a cow heard the rats squeak, and she butts at me and sends me up again the bull. The bull was very savage, and I fainted, but I was picked up and washed, and then I come to. Whilst doing that job at Mrs. Brown's, I had to lie down on the ground and push my naked arm into the hole till I could reach the rats as I'd driven up in the corner, and then pull them out with my hand. I was dreadful bit, for I was obliged to handle them anyhow. My flesh was cut to ribbons and dreadful lacerated. There was a man Mrs. Brown had got, of the name of John, and he wouldn't believe about the rats, and half thought I brought him with me, so I showed him how to catch rats. You see, rats have always got a main run, and from it go the branch runs on each side, like on a herringbone and at the end of the branch runs is the bolt holes for coming in and out at. I instantly stopped up all the bolt holes and worked the rats down to the end of the main run. Then I broke up the branch runs and stopped the rats getting back, and then, when I'd got them all together at the end of the main run, I put my arm down and lifted them up. I have had at times to put half my body into a hole and thrust down my arm, just like getting rabbits out of their burrows. Sometimes I have to go myself into the holes, for the rats make such big ones there's plenty of room. There was a Mrs. Perry in Albany Street that kept an oil and coke shop. She were infested with rats dreadful. Three of her shop boys had been sent away on suspicion of stealing fat, instead of which it was the rats. For between the walls and the vault I found a hundred and a half of fat stowed away. The rats was very savage and I should think there was two hundred of them. I made a good bit of money by that job, for Mrs. Perry gave the fat to me. I have had some good finds at times, rat hunting. I found under one floor in a gent's house a great quantity of table napkins and silver spoons and forks, which the rats had carried away for the grease on them. Shoes and boots gnawed to pieces, shifts, aprons, gowns, pieces of silk, and I don't know what not. Servants had been discharged, accused of stealing them their things. Of course, I had to give them up, but there they was. I was once induced to go to a mews in Tavistock Place near Russell Square, which was regular infested by rats. They had sent to a man before, and he couldn't do nothing with them, but I soon serenaded them. The rats there had worried a pair of beautiful chestnut horses by gnawing away their hoofs and nearly driving them mad, which I saw myself and there was all their teeth marks, for I could scarcely believe it myself till I see it. 
I found them near a cartload of common bricks under the floor and near the partition of the stable, which, when the men pulled the woodwork down, the coachman says he, Well, Retcatcher, if you'd been employed years ago, a deal more corn would have gone into the horses. This coachman gave me a recommendation to a muffin maker in Hanway Yard, and I went there and killed the rats. But a most singular thing took place there. My ferret got away and run through into a house in Oxford Street, kept by a linen draper, for the young men come to say that the rat catcher's ferret was in their shop and had bit one of their lady customers. I worked the ferret through three times to make sure of this, and each time my little dog told me it was true. You see, a well-trained dog will watch and stand and point to the ferret working underground, just as a painter does to game. And although he's above ground, yet he'll track the ferret through the runs underneath by the smell. If the ferret is lost, which I tell by the dog being uneasy, I say to the dog, Hi, lost! And then he instantly goes on scent and smells about in every direction, and I follows him, till he stands exactly over the spot where it may be, and then I have either to rise a stone or lift a board to get him out. I've ratted for years for Mr. Hodges of Hodges and Lomans in Regent Street, and he once said to me that he was infested dreadful with rats at the house, which he took for the children at Hampstead. So I went there and witnessed certainly the most curious circumstance, which puzzles me to this day. I had to lay on my belly half in the hole and pull out the rats, and on looking at them as I bring them up, I am astonished to find that nearly every one of them is blind and has a speck in the eye. I was never so much astonished in my life, for they was as a wall-eyed dog might be. I supposed it to be from lightning. I couldn't account for it no other ways, for at that time there was a very heavy lightning and floods up there, which maybe you might remember, sir. They was chiefly of the blood rat species, small snake-headed rats with a big fine tail. They was very savage with me, and I had them run all over me before I catched them. Rats are everywhere about London, both in rich and poor places. I've catched rats in 44 Portland Place, at a clergyman's house there. There was 200 and odd. They had undermined the oven so that they could neither bile nor bake. They had underpinioned the stables and let every stone down throughout the premises pretty well. I had to crawl under a big leaden cistern which the rats had underpinioned, and I expected it would come down upon me every minute. I had one little ferret kill thirty-two rats under one stone, and I lifted the dead ones up in the presence of the cook and the butler. He didn't behave well to me, the gent didn't, for I had to go to my lawyers afore I could get paid, and after the use of my skill. And I had to tell the lawyer I'd pawn my bed to stick to him and get my earnings. But after all, I had to take one-third less than my bill. This, thinks I, isn't the right thing for Portland Place. Rats will eat each other like rabbits, which I've watched them, and seen them turn the dead one's skins out like pussies, and eat the flesh off, beautiful clean. I've got cages of iron wire, which I made myself, which will hold 1,000 rats at a time, and I've had these cages piled up with rats, solid-like. No one would ever believe it, to look at a quantity of rats and see how they will fight and tear one another about. It's astonishing, so it is. I never found any rats smothered by putting them in a cage so full, but if you don't feed them every day, they'll fight and eat one another. They will, like cannibals. My general contracts with my customers by the year or month or job. There's some gents I've worked for these 15 years, such as Mr. Robson, the coach builder, Miverts Hotel, Showbridge, Mr. Lloyd's, the large tobacconist, the commercial life assurance, Lord Duncanon's, and I can't recollect how many more. My terms is from one guinea to five pounds per annum, according to the premises. Besides this, I have all the rats that I catch, and they sell for threepence each. But I've done my work too well, and wherever I went, I've cleared the rats right out, and so my customers have fell off. I have got the best testimonials of any man in London, and I could get a hatful more tomorrow. Ask anybody I've worked for, and they'll tell you about Jack Black. One night I had 200 rats in a cage placed in my sitting room, and a gent's dog 
happened to get at the cage and undid the door, snuffing about, and let them all loose. Directly I come in, I knew they was loose by the smell. I had to go on my knees and stomach under the beds and sofas and all over the house, and before twelve o'clock that night I had got them all back again into the cage and sold them after for a match. I was so fearful they'd get gnawing the children, having exterminated them in a house where children had been gnawed. I've turned my attention to everything connected with animals. I've got the best composition for curing the mange in a horse or a dog, which has regular astonished medical gents. I've also been bit by a mad dog, a black retriever dog, that died raving mad in a cellar afterwards. The only thing I did was I washed the wound with salt and water and used a turpentine poultice. Mrs. Black here interposed, exclaiming, Oh, dear me, the salt and water he's had to his flesh, it ought to be as hard as iron. I've seen him put lumps of salt into his wounds. Mr. Black then continued. I never had any uneasiness from that bite of a mad dog. Indeed, I never troubled myself about it, or even thought of it. I've caught some other things beside rats in my time. One night I saw a little South African cat going along the new road, I thought it was a curious species of rat and chased it and brought it home with me, but it proved to belong to Mr. Herring's menagerie in the new road, so I let him have it back again. Another time I met with two raccoons, which I found could handle me just as well as I could handle a rat, for they did bite and scratch awful. I put them in the cart and brought them home in a basket. I never found out to whom they belonged. I got them in Ratcliffe Highway and no doubt some sailors had brought them over and got drunk and let them loose. I tried them at killing rats, but they weren't no good at that. I've learned a monkey to kill rats, but he wouldn't do much, and only give them a good shaking when they bit him. After I found the raccoons no good, I trained a badger to kill rats, and he was superior to any dog, but very difficult in training to get him to kill, though he'll kill rabbits fast enough, or any other kind of game. For their rare poachers are badgers. I used to call her Polly. She killed in my own pit, for I used to oblige my friends that wouldn't believe it possible with the sight. She won several matches. The largest was in a hundred match. I also exterminate moles for Her Majesty, and the woods and forests, and I've exterminated some hundreds for different farmers in the country. It's a curious thing, but a mole will kill a rat and eat it afterwards and two moles will fight wonderful. They've got a mouth exactly like a shark, and teeth like saws. Ah, a wonderful saw mouth. They're a very sharp-biting little animal, and very painful. A rat is frightened of one, and don't like fighting them at all. I've bred the finest collection of pied rats which has ever been known in the world. I had above eleven hundred of them, all variegated rats, and of a different species and colour and all of them in the first instance bred from the Norwegian and the white rat, and afterwards crossed with another species. I have raised some of the largest tailed rats ever seen. I have sent them to all parts of the globe, and near every town in England. When I sold them off, three hundred of them went to France. I catch the first white rat I had at Hampstead, and the black ones at Messrs. Hodges and Lomans in Regent Street, and then I bred in. I have them fawn and white, black and white, brown and white, red and white, blue-black and white, black-white and red. People come from all parts of London to see them rats, and I supplied near all the happy families with them. Burke, who had the happy family showing about London, has had hundreds from me. They got very tame, and you could do anything with them. I've sold many to ladies for keeping in squirrel cages. Years ago, I sold them for five and ten shillings apiece, but towards the end of my reading them, I let them go for two and six. At a shop in Leicester Square, where Contello's hatching eggs machine was, I sold a sow and six young ones for ten shillings, which formerly I have had five pounds for, being so docile, like a sow sucking her pigs. End of section three. Section 4 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. 
The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 4. The Sewer Man. He is a broad-shouldered, strongly built man, with a stoop in his shoulders, and a rather dull cast of features, from living so much in the shores, note, sewers, end note. His eyes have assumed a peering kind of look that is quite rat-like in its furtiveness. He answered our questions with great good humour, but, in short, monosyllabic terms, peculiar to men who have little communion with their fellows. The parlour in which the man lives was literally swarming with children when we paid him a visit. They were not all belonging to him. Nor was it quite pleasant to find that the smell of the tea which had just been made was overpowered by the odour of the rats, which he keeps in the same room. The week's wash was hanging across the apartment, and gave rather a slovenly aspect to the room, not otherwise peculiar for its untidiness. Against the wall were pasted some children's characters, which his second son, who is at the coal-shed, has a taste for, and which, as the shoreman observed, is better than sweet stuff for him, at all events. A little terrier was jumping playfully about the room, a much more acceptable companion than the bulldog whose acquaintance we had been invited to make, in the same court, by the rat-killer. The furniture and appointments of the parlour were extremely humble, not to say meagre, in their character. After some trouble in getting sufficiently lucid answers, the following was a result. There are not so many rats about as there used to be, not a five hundredth part so many. I've seen long ago twenty or thirty in a row near where the slaughterhouses are and that like. I catch them all down the shores. I run after them and pick them up with my hand and I take my lantern with me. I have caught rats these six or seven years. When the money got to be lowered, I took to catching on them. One time I used to take a dog with me when I worked down St. John's Woodway. They fetches all prices, does rats. Some I get threepence a piece for, some tuppence, some tuppence halfpenny. Cordon who has em. I works on the shores, and our time to leave off is four. I comes home and gets my tea, and if there's sale for them, why I goes out and catches a few rats. When I goes out, I can catch a dozen, but years ago I could catch two or three dozen without going so far, and that shows there's not so many now about. I find some difficulty in catching on them. If they gets into the drain, you can't get them. Where the drains lay low to the shore, it's most difficult. But where the drain is about two feet and a half from the shore, you gets a better chance. Three or four dozen I used to catch, but I haven't catched any this last two or three weeks. In this hot weather, people don't like to be in a room where killing is going on. But in the winter time, a man will have his pint of beer and see a little sport that way. Three or four year ago, I did catch a good many. There was a sale for him. I could go and catch two dozen in three hours, and that sooner than I can do a dozen now. It's varmint as wants to be destroyed. Rats'll turn round when they find their cells beat, and sometimes fly at your hand. Sometimes I've got bit, not very badly though. To tell the truth, I don't like it. When they grip, they do hold so tight before they'll let go. I've been a shoreman these fifteen or sixteen year, ever since this flushing commenced. I was put on by the commissioners in Hatting Garding, but the commissioners is all done away with since government took to it. I'm employed by the parish now. Every parish has to do its own flushing. We cleanses away all the soil what's down below and keeps the shore as sweet as what we possibly can. Before I took to this life, I was what they call a navvy. I used to help to make the shores. And before that, I was in the country at farmer's work. Catching them rats ain't all profit, cause you have to keep em and feed em. I've got some here. If I was to get sixpence a piece for, why, it wouldn't pay me for their feed. I give them barley, generally, and bits of bread. There's a many about now catching who does nothing else and who goes down in the shores when they have no business there at all. They does well by rats when they've good call for em. They can go down two or three times a day and catch a dozen and a half a time. But they can't do much now. There's no killing going on. They take some to beer shops and sells them to the landlords who gets their own price for em if there's a pit. Time ago you couldn't get a rat under sixpence. 
but the tax on dogs has done away wonderful with rat killing london would swarm with rats if they hadn't been catched as they has been i can go along shores and only see one or two now sometimes see none times ago i've drove away twenty or thirty afore me round newport market i've seen a hundred together and now i go round there and perhaps won't catch one as for poisoning em under buildings that's wrong they're sure to lay there and rot and then they smell so no poisoning ain't no good especially where there's many on em i've sold jack black a good many he don't catch so many as he gets killed he's what they call rat catcher to her majesty when i goes rat catching i generally takes a bag with me a trap is too much to lug about some parts of the shores i can find my way about better than i can up above i could get in nigh here and come out at high park only the worst of it is you're always on the stoop i never hear talk of anybody losing their cells in the shores but a stranger might there's some what we calls gully hunters as goes about with a sieve and near the gratings find perhaps a few halfpence. years ago we used to find a little now and then but we may go about now and not find tuppence in a week i don't think any shoreman ever finds much but years ago in the city perhaps a robbery might be committed and then they might be afraid of being found out and chuck things down the drains i come from oxfordshire about four miles from henley Pontems. i haven't got now quite so many clods to tramp over nor so many hills to climb i gets two shilling a dozen if i sells the rats to a dealer but if i takes em to the pit myself i gets three shillings rats has come down lately there's more pits and they kills em cheaper they used to kill em at six shillings a dozen i've got five children these here are not all belonging to me their mother's gone out a nothing and my wife's got to mind em my oldest son is sixteen he's off for a sailor i had him on me for two years doing nothing he couldn't get a place and towards the last he didn't care about it he would go to sea so he went to the marine school and now he's in the east Inge service my second is at a coal shed he gets three shillings a week but lord what's that he eats more than that let alone clothes and he wears out such a lot of shoe leather there's a good deal of wear and tear i can tell yer in carrying out coals and such like the penny mouse trap maker this man lived in a small cottage at the back of bethnal green road and the little railed space in front of the humble dwelling was littered with sundry evidences of the inmate's ingenuity here was a mechanical carriage the crippled father had made to drive himself along and a large thaumatrope or disc of painted figures that seemed to move while revolving rapidly before the eye and this i afterwards learnt the ingenious cripple had made as a street exhibition for a poor man whom he was anxious to put in the way of doing something for himself the principal apartment in the little two-roomed house was blocked up with carpenters benches and long planks were resting against the wall while the walls themselves were partly covered with tools and patterns of the craft pursued and in one corner there were heaps of the penny mouse traps and penny money boxes that formed the main articles of manufacture in a little room adjoining this and about the size of a hen-house i found the cripple himself in bed but still sitting up with a small desk-like bench before him and engaged in the act of cutting and arranging the wires for the little wooden traps in which he dealt and as i sat by his bedside he told me the following story i am he said a white wood toy maker in a small way that is i make a variety of cheap articles nothing beyond a penny in sawed and planed pine wood i manufacture penny and halfpenny money boxes penny and halfpenny toy bellows penny carts penny garden rollers penny and halfpenny dolls tables and wash hand stands chiefly for baby houses penny dressers with drawers for the same purpose penny wheelbarrows and bedsteads penny crossbows and the mouse trap that i am about now i make all the things i have named for warehouses for what are called the cheap birmingham and sheffield houses i am paid the same price for whatever i make with the exception of the mouse trap for the principal part of the penny articles that i make i get seven shillings for twelve dozen that is sevenpence a dozen 
and for the halfpenny articles I get three shilling sixpence at the rate of threepence halfpenny a dozen. For the penny mouse traps, however, I am paid only one pound for thirty-six dozen, and that's a shilling less than I get for the same quantity of the other shilling articles. Whilst for the penny boxes, I'm paid only at the rate of a halfpenny each. You will please to look at that, sir," he said, handing me his account book with one of his employers for the last year. You will see there that what I am saying is perfectly correct, for there is the price put to every article, and it is but right that you should have proof that what I am telling you is the truth. I took of one master for penny mouse traps alone. You perceive, thirty-six pounds ten shillings from January to December, eighteen forty-nine, but that is not all gain. You understand. Out of that, I have to pay above one half for material. I think altogether my receipts of the different masters I worked for last year came to about a hundred and twenty pounds. I can't lay my hands on the bills just now. Yes, it's about a hundred and twenty pounds. I know for our income. That is, my clear gains is about one pound to one pound five shillings every week. So calculating more than one half what I take to go for the expense for material. That will bring it to just about to what I state. To earn the twenty-five shillings a week, you'll understand there are four of us engaged: myself, my wife, my daughter, and son. My daughter is eighteen, and my son eleven. That is my boy, sir. He's reading the family friend just now. It's a little work I take in for my girl for her future benefit. My girl is as fond of reading as I am, and always was. My boy goes to school every evening and twice on a Sunday. I am willing that they should find as much pleasure from reading as I have in my illness. I found books often lull my pain. Yes, I have indeed for many hours. For nine months I couldn't handle a tool, and my only comfort was the love of my family and my books. I can't afford them now, for I have no wish to incur any extraneous expense. While the weight of the labour lies on my family more than it does on myself, over and over again, when I have been in acute pain with my thigh, a scientific book or a work on history or a volume of travels would carry my thoughts far away, and I should be happy in all my misery, hardly conscious that I had a trouble, a care, or a pang to vex me. I always had love of solid works. For an hour's light reading, I have often turned to a work of imagination. Such as Milton's Paradise Lost and Shakespeare's plays, but I prefer science to poetry. I think every working man ought to be acquainted with general science. If he is a mechanic, let his station be ever so simple, he will be sure to find the benefit of it. It gives a man a greater insight into the world and creation, and it makes his labour a pleasure and a pride to him when he can work with his head as well as his hands. I think I have made altogether about one hundred and six gross of mouse traps for the master whose account I have given you, and as many more for other employers in the course of the last year. I calculate that I made more than thirty thousand mouse traps from January to December, eighteen forty-nine. There are three or four other people in London making penny mouse traps besides myself. I reckon they may make among them near upon half as many as I do. And that would give about forty-five or fifty thousand penny mouse traps made in London in the course of the year. I myself brought out the penny mouse trap in its improved shape and with the improved lever spring. I have no calculations as to the number of mice in the country or how soon we should have caught them if we go on at this rate. But I think my traps have to do with that. They are bought more for toys than for use, though they are good for mice as well as children. And though we have so many dozen mouse traps about the house, I can assure you we are more troubled with mice here than most people. The four of us here can make twenty-four dozen traps in the day, but that is all we can get through comfortable. For eighteen dozen, we get about ten shillings at the warehouse, and out of that, I reckon our clear gains are near upon four shillings, or a little less than one shilling a head. Take one with the other, we can earn about a penny an hour. And if it wasn't for me having been a tailor originally and applying some of my old tools to the business, we shouldn't get on so quick as we do. With my shears, I can cut twenty-four wires at a time, and with my thimble, I thread the wires through the holes in the sides. I make the springs, cut the wires, and put them in the traps. 
My daughter planes the wood and gouges out the sides and bottom, bores the wire holes and makes the door as well. My wife nails the frames ready for wiring and my son fixes the wires in their places when I have entered them. Then the wife springs them, after which the daughter puts in the doors and so completes them. I can't form an idea as to how many penny and halfpenny money boxes I made last year. I might have made altogether 8,000, or 5,000 halfpenny and 3,000 penny ones. I was originally brought up to the tailoring business, but my master failed and my sight kept growing weaker every year. So, as I found a good deal of trouble in getting employment at my own trade, I thought I would take to the bird cage making. I had been doing a little at it before, as a pastime. I was fond of birds and fonder still of mechanics, so I was always practising my hands at some craft or other in my overtime. I used to make dissected maps and puzzles, and so, when standing for employment, I managed to get through the slack of the year. I think it is solely due to my taste for mechanics and my love of reading scientific books that I am able to live so comfortably as I do in my affliction. After I took to bird cage making, I found the employment at it so casual that I could not support my family at it. This led my mind to toy making, for I found that cheap toys were articles of more general sale. Then I got my children and my wife to help me, and we managed to get along somehow. For, you see, they were learning the business, and I myself was not in much of a condition to teach them, being almost as inexperienced at the trade as they were. And besides that, we were continually changing the description of toy that we manufactured, so we had no time to perfect ourselves. One day, we were all at work at garden rollers. The next, perhaps, we should be upon little carts. Then, maybe, we should have to go to dolls' tables or wheelbarrows so that, with the continual changing the description of toy that we manufactured from one thing to another, we had a great difficulty in getting practised in anything. While we were all learning, you may imagine that, not being so quick then as we are now, we found a great difficulty in making a living at a penny toy business. Often we had merely dry bread for breakfast, tea and supper, but we ate it with a light heart, for I knew repining wouldn't mend it, and I always taught myself, and those about me, to bear our trials with fortitude. At last I got to work regularly at the mouse traps, and having less changing, we learnt to turn them out of hand quicker, and to make more money at the business. That was about four years ago, and then I was laid up with a strumous abscess in the thigh. This caused necrosis, or decay of the thigh bone, to take place, and it was necessary that I should be confined to my bed until such time as a new thigh bone was formed and the old decayed one had sloughed away. Before I lay up, I stood at the bench until I was ready to drop, for I had no one who could plane the boards for me, and what could I do? If I didn't keep up, I thought we should all starve. The pain was dreadful, and the anxiety of mind I suffered for my wife and children made it a thousand times worse. I couldn't bear the idea of going to the workhouse, and I kept on my feet until I couldn't stand no longer. My daughter was only sixteen then, and I saw no means of escape. It was at that time my office to prepare the boards for the family, and without that they could do nothing. Well, sir, I saw utter ruin and starvation before us. The doctor told me it would take four years before a new bone would be formed, and that I must lay up all the while. What was to become of us all in the meantime, I could not tell. Then it was that my daughter, seeing the pain I suffered, both in body and mind, came to me and told me not to grieve, for that she would do all the heavy work for me, and plane up the boards, and cut out the work as I had done. But I thought it impossible for her to get through such hard work, even for my sake. I knew she could do almost anything that she set her mind to, but I little dreamt that she would be able to compass that. However, with the instinct of her affection, I couldn't call it anything else, for she learnt at once what it had taken me months to acquire. She planed and shaped the boards as well as I myself could have done after years of practice. The first board she did was as cleanly done as she can do it now, and when you think of the difficulties she had to overcome, what a mere child she was, and that she had never handled a plane before, how she had the grain of the wood to find out, to learn the right handling of her tools, 
and a many little niceties of touch that workmen only can understand, it does seem to me as if some superior power had inspired her to aid me. I have often heard of birds building their nests of the most beautiful structure without ever having seen one built before, and my daughter's handiwork seemed to me exactly like that. It was a thing not learnt by practice, but done in an instant, without teaching or experience of any kind. She is the best creature I ever knew or ever heard tell of on earth. At least, so she has been to me all her life, I without a single exception. If it hadn't been for her devotion, I must have gone to the workhouse, and perhaps never been able to have got away from it, and had my children brought up as paupers. Where she got the strength to do it is as much a mystery to me as how she did it. Though she was but a mere child, so to speak, she did the work of a grown man, and I assure you the labour of working at the bench all day is heavy, even for the strongest workman. And my girl is not overstrong now. Indeed, she was always delicate, from a baby. Nevertheless, she went through the labour, and would stand to the bench the whole of the day, and with such cheerful good humour, too, that I cannot but see the hand of the Almighty in it all. I never knew her to complain of fatigue, or even go to her work without a smile on her face. Her only anxiety was to get done, and to afford me every comfort in my affliction that she could. For three years and two months now have I been confined to my bed, and for two years and a half of that time I have not left it, even to breathe the fresh open air. Almost all that period I have been suffering intense and continued pain from the formation of abscesses in my thigh previous to the sloughing away of the decayed bones. I have taken out of the sores at least two hundred pieces, some as small as needles and some not less than an inch and a half long, which required to be pulled out with tweezers from the wound. Often when I was getting a bit better and able to go about in the cart you see there outside with the gravel in it, I made that on this bed here, so as to be able to move about on it. The two front wheels I made myself, and the two back were old ones that I repaired here. I made the whole of the body, and my daughter planed up the boards for me. Well, often when I could just get along in that, have I gone about with a large piece of decayed bone projecting through my thigh, in hopes that the jolting would force it through the wound. The pain before the bone came away was often intense, especially when it had to work its way through the thick of the muscle. Night after night have I laid awake here. I didn't wish, of course, to distress the minds of my family any more than I could help. It would not have been fair. So I bore all with patience, and since I have been here, I have got through a great deal of work in my little way. In bed, as I sit with my little bench, I do my share of eight dozen of these penny traps a day. Last August, I made a thaumatrope for a young man that I had known since a lad of twelve years of age. He got off work and couldn't find anything to turn his hand to, so I advised him to get up an exhibition. Anything was better than starving. He had a wife and two children, and I can't bear to see anyone want, let alone the young ones. And so, cripple as I was, I set to work here in my bed and made him a large set of magic circles. I painted all the figures myself in this place, though I had never handled a brush before, and that has kept him in bread up to this time. I did it to cause him to exert himself, but now he has got a situation and is doing middling to what he has been. There's one thing, though. A little money, with care, will go farther than a great deal without it. I shall never be able to get about as I used, for, you see, the knee is set stiff and the thigh bone is arched with the hip, so that the one leg is three inches shorter than the other. The bone broke spontaneously, like a bit of rotten wood, the other day, while I was rubbing my hand down my thigh, and, in growing together again, it got out of straight. I am just able to stir about now with a crutch and stick. I can sometimes treat myself to a walk about the house and yard, but that is not often. And last Saturday night I did make a struggle to get out in the Bethnal Green Road, and there, as I was coming along, my stick tripped against a stone and I fell. If it hadn't been for my crutch throwing me forward, I might have fallen on my new bone and broken it again. But as it was, the crutch threw me forward and saved me. The doctor tells me my new bone would bear a blow, 
but I shouldn't like to try after all I have gone through. I shall not be about again till I get my carriage done, and that I intend to construct so as to drive it with one hand, by means of a new ratchet lever motion. The daughter of the toy-maker with whom I spoke afterwards, and who was rather good-looking, in the literal sense of the word, than beautiful, said that she could not describe how it was that she had learnt to plane and gouge the boards. It seemed to come to her all of a sudden, quite natural-like, she told me, though, she added, it was most likely her affection for her poor father that made her take to it so quick. I felt it deeply, she said, to see him take to his bed, and knew that I alone could save him from the workhouse. No, I never felt tired over the work, she continued, in answer to my questions, because I know that it is to make him comfortable. I should add that I was first taken to this man by the surgeon who attended him during his long suffering, and that gentleman not only fully corroborated all I heard from his ingenious and heroic patient, but spoke in the highest possible terms of both father and daughter. End of section 4section five of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry the destroyers of vermin part five flies these winged tormentors are not like most of our actors enemies calculated to excite disgust and nausea when we see or speak of them nor do they usually steal upon us during the silent hours of repose, though the gnat or mosquito must be here excepted. But are many of them very beautiful, and boldly make their attack upon us in open day, when we are best able to defend ourselves. The active fly, so frequently an unbidden guest at your table, note Muffet, page 56, end note, whose delicate palate selects your choicest viands, at one time extending his proboscis to the margin of a drop of wine, and then gaily flying to take a more solid repast from a pear or a peach, now gambling with his comrades in the air, now gracefully carrying his furled wings with his taper feet, was but the other day a disgusting grub, without wings, without legs, without eyes, wallowing, well pleased, in the midst of a mass of excrement. The common house fly, says Kirby, is, with us, sufficiently annoying at the close of summer, so as to have led the celebrated Italian, Hugo Foscolo, when residing here, to call it one of the three miseries of life. But we know nothing of it as a tormentor, compared with the inhabitants of southern Europe. I met, says Arthur Young, in his interesting travels through France, between Pradel and Touritz, mulberries and flies at the same time. By the term flies, I mean those myriads of them which form the most disagreeable circumstances of the southern climates. They are the first torments in Spain, Italy, and the olive district of France. It is not that they bite, sting, or hurt, but they buzz, tease, and worry. Your mouth, eyes, ears, and nose are full of them. They swarm on every eatable, fruit, sugar, everything is attacked by them in such myriads that if they are not incessantly driven away by a person who has nothing else to do, to eat a meal is impossible. They are, however, caught on prepared paper and other contrivances with so much ease and in such quantities that were it not for negligence, they could not abound in such incredible quantities. If I farmed in these countries, I should manure four or five acres every year with dead flies. I have been much surprised that the learned Mr. Harmer should think it odd to find, by writers who treated of southern climates, that driving away flies was of importance. Had he been with me in Spain and at Languedoc in July and August, he would have been very far from thinking there was anything odd in it. Young's Travels in France Volume 1, page 298. It is a remarkable and as yet unexplained fact that if nets of thread or string 
with meshes a full inch square be stretched over the open windows of a room in summer or autumn when flies are the greatest nuisance not a single one will venture to enter from without so that by this simple plan a house may be kept free from these pests while the adjoining ones which have not had nets applied to their windows will swarm with them in order however that the protection should be efficient it is necessary that the rooms to which it is applied should have the light enter by one side only for in those which have a through light the flies strange to say pass through the meshes without scruple for a fuller account of these singular facts the reader is referred to a paper by w spence in transactions of the entomological society of london volume one page one and also to one in the same work by the rev e stanley late lord bishop of norwich who having made some of the experiments suggested by mr spence found that by extending over the outside of his windows nets of a very fine pack thread with meshes one inch and a quarter to the square so fine and comparatively invisible that there was no apparent diminution either of light or the distant view he was enabled for the remainder of the summer and autumn to enjoy the fresh air with open windows without the annoyance he had previously experienced from the intrusion of flies often so troublesome that he was obliged on the hottest days to forego the luxury of admitting the air by even partially raising the sashes but no sooner he observes had i set my nets than i was relieved from my disagreeable visitors i could perceive and hear them hovering on the other side of my barriers but though they now and then settled on the meshes i do not recollect a single instance of one venturing to cross the boundary the number of house flies he adds might be greatly lessened in large towns if the stable dung in which their larvae are chiefly supposed to feed were kept in pits closed by trap-doors so that the females could not deposit their eggs in it at venice where no horses are kept it is said there are no house-flies a statement which i regret not having heard before being there that i might have inquired as to its truth kirby and spence's entomology volume one pages one hundred and two and one hundred and three this short account of flies would be incomplete without a description of their mode of proceeding when they regale themselves upon a piece of loaf sugar and an account of the apparatus with which the creator has furnished them in order to enable them to walk on bodies possessing smooth surfaces and in any position Quote, it is a remark which will be found to hold good both in animals and vegetables that no important motion or feeling can take place without the presence of moisture in man the part of the eye which is the seat of vision is always bedewed with moisture the skin is softened with a delicate oil the sensitive part of the ear is filled with a liquid but moisture is still more abundant in our organs of taste and smell than in any of the other senses in the case of taste moisture is supplied to our mouth and tongue from several reservoirs glands in their neighbourhood whence pipes are laid and run to the mouth the whole surface indeed of the mouth and tongue as well as the other internal parts of our body give out more or less moisture but besides this the mouth as we have just mentioned has a number of fountains expressly for its own use the largest of these fountains lies as far off as the ear on each side and is formed of a great number of round soft bodies about the size of garden peas from each of which a pipe goes out and all of these uniting together form a common channel on each side this runs across the cheek nearly in a line with the lap of the ear and the corner of the mouth and enters the mouth opposite to the second or third of the double teeth molaris by a hole into which a hog's bristle can be introduced there are besides several other pairs of fountains in different parts adjacent for a similar purpose we have been thus particular in our description in order to illustrate an analogous structure in insects for they also seem to be furnished with salivary fountains for moistening their organs of taste one of the circumstances that first awakened our curiosity with regard to insects was the manner in which a fly contrives to suck up through its narrow sucker 
hostellum, a bit of dry lump sugar, for the small crystals are not only unfitted to pass from their angularity, but adhere too firmly together to be separated by any force the insect can exert. Eager to solve the difficulty, for there could be no doubt of the flies sucking the dry sugar, we watched its proceedings with no little attention, but it was not till we fell upon the device of placing some sugar on the outside of a window while we looked through a magnifying glass on the inside that we had the satisfaction of repeatedly witnessing a fly let fall a drop of fluid upon the sugar in order to melt it, and thereby render it fit to be sucked up. On precisely the same principle that we moisten with saliva in the process of mastication, a mouthful of dry bread, to fit it for being swallowed, the action of the jaws, by a beautiful contrivance of providence, preparing the moisture along the channels at the time it is most wanted. Readers who may be disposed to think the circumstance of the fly thus moistening a bit of sugar fanciful may readily verify the fact themselves in the way we have described. At the time when we made this little experiment, we were not aware that several naturalists of high authority had actually discovered by dissection the vessels which supply the saliva in more than one species of insect. In the case of their drinking fluids, like water, Saliva is not wanted, and it may be remarked, when we drink cold water, it actually astringes and shuts up the openings of the salivary pipes. Hence it is that drinking does not quench thirst when the saliva is rendered viscid and scanty by heat, by fatigue, or by the use of stimulant food and liquor, and sometimes a draught of cold water by carrying off all the saliva from the mouth and at the same time astringing the orifices of the ducts, may actually produce thirst. Ices produce this effect on many persons. It is, no doubt, in consequence of their laborious exertions, as well as of the hot nature of their acid fluids producing similar effects, that ants are so fond of water. We have seen one quaff a drop of dew almost as large as its whole body, and when we present those in our glass formicaries with water, they seem quite insatiable in drinking it. End quote. Insect Miscellanies, page 38. Rennie, in his Insect Miscellanies, after describing the pedestrian contrivances with which various insects are furnished, says, quote, The most perfect contrivance of this kind, however, occurs in the domestic fly, Musca domestica, and its congeners as well as in several other insects. Few can have failed to remark that flies walk with the utmost ease along the ceiling of a room, and no less so upon a perpendicular looking glass. And though this were turned downwards, the flies would not fall off, but could maintain their position undisturbed with their backs hanging downwards. The conjectures devised by naturalists to account for this singular circumstance previous to the ascertaining of the actual facts, are not a little amusing. Some suppose, says the Abbé de la Pluche, that when the fly marches over any polished body, on which neither its claws nor its points can fasten, it sometimes compresses her sponge and causes it to evacuate a fluid, which fixes it in such a manner as prevents its falling, without diminishing the facility of its progress but it is much more probable that the sponges correspond with the fleshy balls which accompany the claws of dogs and cats, and that they enable the fly to proceed with a softer pace and contribute to the preservation of the claws, whose pointed extremities would soon be impaired without this prevention. Spectacle de la nature, or nature displayed, being discourses on such particulars of natural history as were thought most proper to excite the curiosity and form the minds of youth. Volume 1, page 116. Its ability to walk on glass, says S. Shaw, proceeds partly from some little ruggedness thereon, but chiefly from a tarnish or dirty smoking substance adhering to the surface, so that, though the sharp points on the sponges cannot penetrate the surface of the glass, it may easily catch hold of the tarnish. Nature Displayed, Volume 3, page 98, London, 1823. But, adds Rennie, 
it is singular that none of these fanciers ever took the trouble to ascertain the existence of either a gluten squeezed out by the fly or of the smoky tarnish on glass even the shrewd Riolmur could not give a satisfactory explanation of the circumstance the earliest correct notion on this curious subject was entertained by derham who in mentioning the provision made for insects that hang on smooth surfaces says i might here name divers flies and other insects who besides their sharp hooked nails have also skinny palms to their feet to enable them to stick to glass and other smooth bodies by means of the pressure of the atmosphere after the manner as i have seen boys carry heavy stones with only a wet piece of leather clapped on the top of the stone physical theology volume two page one hundred and ninety four note b eleventh edition the justly celebrated mr white of selborne apparently without the aid of microscopial investigation adopted derham's opinion adding the interesting illustration that in the decline of the year when the flies crowd to windows and become sluggish and torpid they are scarcely able to lift their legs which seem glued to the glass where many actually stick till they die whereas they are during warm weather so brisk and alert that they easily overcome the pressure of the atmosphere natural history of selborne volume two page two hundred and seventy four this singular mechanism however continues rennie is not peculiar to flies for some animals a hundred times as large can walk upon glass by the same means st pierre mentions quote, a very small lizard about a finger's length which climbs along the walls and even along glass in pursuit of flies and other insects End quote. voyage to the isle of france page seventy three and sir joseph banks noticed another lizard named the Gecki, Lacerta Gesha, Linnaeus, which could walk against gravity, and which made him desirous of having the subject thoroughly investigated. On mentioning it to Sir Everard Holm, he and Mr. Bower commenced a series of researches by which they proved incontrovertibly that in climbing upon glass and walking along the ceilings with the back downwards, a vacuum is produced by a particular apparatus in the feet, sufficient to cause atmospheric pressure upon the exterior surface the apparatus in the feet of the fly consists of two or three membranous suckers connected with the last joint of the foot by a narrow neck of a funnel shape immediately under the base of each jaw and movable in all directions these suckers are convex above and hollow below the edges being margined with minute serratures and the hollow portion covered with down in order to produce the vacuum and the pressure these membranes are separated and expanded and when the fly is about to lift its foot it brings them together and folds them up as it were between the two claws by means of a common microscope these interesting movements may be observed when a fly is confined in a wine glass End quote. philosophical transactions of the royal society for eighteen sixteen page three hundred and twenty five it must have attracted the attention of the most incurious to see during the summer swarms of flies crowding about the droppings of cattle so as almost to conceal the nuisance and presenting instead a display of their shining corslets and twinkling wings the object of all this busy bustle is to deposit their eggs where their progeny may find abundant food and the final cause is obviously both to remove the nuisance and to provide abundant food for birds and other animals which prey upon flies or their larvae the same remarks apply with no less force to the blowflies which deposit their eggs and in some cases their young upon carcasses the common house fly the female of which generally lays a hundred and forty four eggs belongs to the first division the natural food of its larvae being horse dung consequently it is always most abundant in houses in the vicinity of stables cucumber beds and so on to which when its numbers become annoying attention should be primarily directed rather than having recourse to fly waters rennie's insect miscellany page two hundred and sixty five besides the common house fly and the other genera of the dipterous order of insects there is another not unfrequent intruding visitor of the fly kind which we must not omit to mention 
commonly known as the blue bottle, Musca vomitoria, Linnaeus. The disgust with which these insects are generally viewed will perhaps be diminished when our readers are informed that they are destined to perform a very important part in the economy of nature, amongst a number of the insect tribe whose office it is to remove nuisances the most disgusting to the eye and the most offensive to the smell. The varieties of the blue bottle fly belong to the most useful. Quote, when the dead carcasses of animals begin to grow putrid, everyone knows what dreadful miasmata exhale from them and taint the air we breathe. But no sooner does life depart from the body of any creature, at least from any which, from its size, is likely to become a nuisance, than myriads of different sorts of insects attack it, and in various ways. First come the histers and pierce the skin. Next follow the flesh flies, covering it with millions of eggs, whence in a day or two proceed innumerable devourers. An idea of the dispatch made by these gourmands may be gained from the combined consideration of their numbers, veracity, and rapid development. The larvae of many flesh flies, as ready ascertained, will in 24 hours devour so much food and gnaw so quickly as to increase their weight 200-fold. In five days after being hatched, they arrive at their full growth and size, which is a remarkable instance of the care of Providence in fitting them for the part they are destined to act. For if a longer time was required for their growth, their food would not be a fit aliment for them, or they would be too long in removing the nuisance it is given them to dissipate. Thus we see there was some ground for Linnaeus's assertion under Musca vomitoria that three of these flies will devour a dead horse as quickly as would a lion. End quote. Kirby and Spence, Volume 1. The following extraordinary fact given by Kirby and Spence concerning the veracity of the larvae of the blowfly, or blue bottle, Musca vomitoria, is worthwhile appending. Quote, On Thursday, June 25th, died at Asbornby, Lincolnshire, John Page, a pauper belonging to Silk Willoughby, under circumstances truly singular. He being of a restless disposition and not choosing to stay in the parish workhouse, was in the habit of strolling about the neighbouring villages, subsisting on the pittance obtained from door to door. The support he usually received from the benevolent was bread and meat, and after satisfying the cravings of nature, it was his custom to deposit the surplus provision, particularly the meat, between his shirt and skin. Having a considerable portion of this provision in store, so deposited, he was taken rather unwell, and laid himself down in a field in the parish of Streddington, when, from the heat of the season at that time, the meat speedily became putrid, and was, of course, struck by the flies. These not only proceeded to devour the inanimate pieces of flesh, but also literally to prey upon the living substance. And when the wretched man was accidentally found by some of the inhabitants, he was so eaten by the maggots that his death seemed inevitable. After clearing away as well as they were able, these shocking vermin, those who found Page conveyed him to Aspornby, and a surgeon was immediately procured, who declared that his body was in such a state that dressing it must be little short of instantaneous death, and in fact the man did survive the operation but for a few hours. When first found, and again when examined by the surgeon, he presented a sight loathsome in the extreme. White maggots of enormous size were crawling in and upon his body, which they had most shockingly mangled, and the removal of the external ones served only to render the sight more horrid. Kirby adds, In passing through this parish last spring, I inquired of the male coachman whether he had heard this story, and he said the fact was well known. End quote. One species of fly infests our houses, Stomoxis calcitrans, which so nearly resembles the common house fly, Musca domestica, that the difference is not easily detected except by an entomologist. Indeed, the resemblance is so close as to have led to the vulgar error that the common house fly occasionally indulges itself by a feast upon our blood, 
after it has fed to satiety upon the delicacies which it picks from our tables it is even a greater torment than the housefly this little pest says kirby referring to the stomoxis i speak feelingly incessantly interrupts our studies and comfort in showery weather making us even stamp like the cattle by its attacks on our legs and if we drive it away ever so often returning again and again to the charge End quote. in canada they are infinitely worse i have sat down to write says lambert who though he calls it the housefly is evidently speaking of the stomoxis and have been obliged to throw away my pen in consequence of their irritating bite which has obliged me every moment to raise my hand to my eyes nose mouth and ears in constant succession when i could no longer write i began to read and was always obliged to keep one hand constantly on the move towards my head sometimes in the course of a few minutes i would take half a dozen of my tormentors from my lips between which i caught them just as they perched End quote. travels and so on volume one page one hundred and twenty six but of all the insect tormentors of man none are so loudly and universally complained of as the species of the genus culex linnaeus whether known by the name of gnats or mosquitoes it has been generally supposed by naturalists that the mosquitoes of america belong to the linnaean genus culex but humboldt asserts that the term mosquito signifying a little fly is applied there to a senicillium latre senicilia mygen and that the culices which are equally numerous and annoying are called sancudos which means long legs the former he says are what the french call moustique and the latter maranglan note from personal narrative e t volume five page ninety three humboldt's remark however refers only to south america mr westwood informs us that mosquito is certainly applied to a species of culex in the united states the inhabitants giving the name of black fly to a small senicillium pliny after aristotle distinguishes well between hymenoptera and diptera when he says the former have their sting in the tail and the latter in the mouth and that to the one this instrument is given as the instrument of vengeance and to the other of avidity but the instrument of avidity in the genus of which i am speaking is even more terrible than that of vengeance in most insects that are armed with it it instils into its wound a poison as appears from the consequent inflammation and tumour the principal use of which is to render the blood more fluid and fitter for suction this weapon which is more complex than the sting of hymenopterous insects consists of five pieces besides the exterior sheath some of which seem simply lancets while others are barbed like the spiculae of a bee's sting is at once calculated for piercing the flesh and forming a siphon adapted to imbibe the blood there are several species of this genus whose bite is severe but none is to be compared to the common gnat culex pipiens linnaeus if as has been generally affirmed it be synonymous with the mosquito though in all probability several species are confounded under both names in this country they are justly regarded as no trifling evil for they follow us to all our haunts intrude into our most secret retirements assail us in the city and in the country in our houses and in our fields in the sun and in the shade nay they pursue us to our pillows and keep us awake by the ceaseless hum of their rapid wings which according to the baron c de la tour are vibrated three thousand times per minute and their incessant endeavours to fix themselves upon our face or some uncovered part of our body whilst if in spite of them we fall asleep they awaken us by the acute pain which attends the insertion of their oral stings attacking with most avidity the softer sex and trying their temper by disfiguring their beauty in marshland in norfolk the inhabitants are said to be so annoyed by the gnats that the better sort of them as in many hot climates have recourse to a gauze covering for their beds to keep them off during the night
End of section 5。section 6 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, part 6. Catch em alive, sellers. I discovered a colony of catch em alive boys residing in Pheasant Court, Gray's Inn Lane. From the pleasing title given to this alley, one might almost be led to imagine it was a very delightful spot, though it is only necessary to look down the little brick and archway that marks its entrance and see the houses, dirty as the sides of a dustbin, and with the patched counterpanes and yellow sheets hanging from the windows to feel assured that it is one of the most squalid of the many wretched courts that branch out from Gray's Inn Lane. I found the lads playing at pitch and toss in the middle of the paved yard. They were all willing enough to give me their statements. Indeed, the only difficulty I had was in making my choice among the youths. Please, sir, I've been at it longer than him, cried one with teeth ribbed like celery. Please, sir, he ain't been out this year with the papers said another, who was hiding a handful of buttons behind his back. "'He's been at shoe-blacking, sir. I'm the only regular fly-boy,' shouted a third, eating a piece of bread as dirty as London snow. A big lad with a dirty face and hair like hemp was the first of the catch em alive boys who gave me his account of the trade. He was a swarthy-featured boy with a broad nose like a negro's, and on his temple was a big half-heeled scar which he accounted for by saying that he had been runned over by a cab, though judging from the blackness of one eye, it seemed to have been the result of some street fight. He said, quote, I'm an Irish boy, a near turn sixteen, and I've been selling fly papers for between eight and nine year. I must have begun to sell them when they first come out. Another boy first told me of them, and he's been selling them about three weeks before me. He used to buy them off a party as lives in a back room near Drury Lane, what buys paper and makes the catch em alive himself. When they first came out, they used to charge sixpence a dozen for em, but now they've got em to tuppence halfpenny. When I first took to selling them, there was a tidy lot of boys at the business, but not so many as now, for all the boys seem at it. In our court alone, I should think there was above twenty boys selling the things. At first, when there was a good time, we used to buy three or four gross together, but now we don't do more than half a gross. As we go along the streets, we call out different cries. Some of us says, fly papers, fly papers, catch them all alive. Others make a kind of song of it, singing out, fly paper, catch them all alive, the nasty flies, tormenting the baby's eyes. Who'd be fly blowed by all the nasty blue bottles, beetles and flies? People like to buy if a boy as sings out well, because it makes them laugh. I don't think I sell so many in town as I do in the borders of the country about Highbury, Croydon and Brentford. I've got some regular customers in town about the city prison and the Caledonian Road, and after I've served them and the town custom begins to fall off, then I goes to the country. We goes two of us together, and we takes about three gross. We keep on selling before us all the way, and we comes back the same road. Last year we sold very well in Croydon, and it was the best place for getting a price for them. They'd give a penny apiece for them there, for they didn't know nothing about them. I went off one day at ten o'clock, and didn't come home till two in the morning. I sold eighteen dozen out in that direction the other day, and got rid of them before I had got half way. But flies are very scarce at Croydon this year, and we haven't done so well. There ain't half as many flies this summer as last. Some people say the papers draws more flies than they catches, and that when one gets in, there's twenty others will come to see him. It's according to the weather as the flies is about. If we have a fine day, it fetches them out, but a cold day kills more than our papers. We sells the most papers to little cook shops and sweetmeat shops. We don't sell so many at private houses. The public houses is pretty good customers, cause the beer draws the flies. I sold nine dozen at one house, a school at Highgate the other day. I sold them two for three halfpence. That was a good hit. But then t'other days we loses. If we can make a halfpenny each, we thinks we does well. Those that sells their papers at three a penny buys them at St Giles's and pays only three halfpence a dozen for them. 
but they aren't half as big and good as those we pays tuppence halfpenny a dozen for. Barnet is a good place for fly papers. There's a good lot of flies down there. There used to be a man at Barnet as made them, but I can't say if you do now. There's another at Brentford, so it ain't much good going that way. In cold weather, the paper keeps pretty well, and will last for months with just a little warming at the fire, for they tears on opening when they are dry. You see, we always carry them with the sticky sides doubled up together, like a sheet of writing paper. In hot weather, if you keep them folded up, they lasts very well, but if you open them, they dry up. It's easy opening them in hot weather, for they comes apart as easy as peeling a orange. We generally carries the paper in a bundle on our arm, and we tie the paper as is loaded with flies round our cap, just to show the people the way to catch them. We get a loaded paper given to us at a shop. When the papers come out first, we used to do very well with fly papers, but now it's hard work to make our own money for them. Some days we used to make six shillings a day regular, but then we usn't to go out every day, but take a rest at home. If we do well one day, then we might stop idle another day, resting. You see, we had to do our twenty or thirty miles selling them to get that money, and then the next day we was tired. The selling of papers is gradual falling off. I could go out and sell twenty dozen onct, where I couldn't sell one now. I think I does a very grand day's work if I earns a shilling. Perhaps some days I may lose by them. You see, if it's a very hot day, the papers gets dusty, and beside, the stuff gets melted and oozes out, though that don't do much harm, cause we gets a bit of whitening and rubs them over. Four years ago we might make ten shillings a day at the papers, but now, taken from one end of the fly paper season to the other, which is about three months, I think we makes about one shilling a day out of papers, though even that ain't quite certain. I never goes out without getting rid of mine somehow or another, but then I am obliged to walk quick and look about me. When it's a bad time for selling the papers, such as a wet cowl day, then most of the fly paper boys goes out with brushes cleaning boots. Most of the boys is now out hopping. They goes regular every year after the season is give over for flies. The stuff as they puts on the paper is made out of boiled oil and turpentine and resin. It's seldom as a fly lives more than five minutes after it gets on the paper, and then it's as dead as a house. The blue bottles is tougher, but they don't last long, though they keeps on fizzing as if they was trying to make a hole in the paper. The stuff is only poisonous for flies, though I never heard of anybody as ever eat a fly paper. The second lad I chose from among the group of applicants was of a middle age, and although the noisiest when among his companions, had no sooner entered the room with me than his whole manner changed. He sat himself down, bent up like a monkey, and scarcely ever turned his eyes from me. He seemed as nervous as if in a witness box, and kept playing with his grubby fingers till he had almost made them white. He calls me Curly. I come from Ireland too. I'm about fourteen year, and have been in this line now, sir, about five year. I goes about the borders of the country. We general takes up the line about the beginning of June, that is, when we gets a good summer. When we gets a good close dull day like this, we does pretty well. But when we has first one day hot and then another rainy and cold, of course we don't get on so well. The most I sold was one day when I went to Uxbridge, and then I sold a gross and a half. I paid half a crown a gross for them. I was living with mother then, and she gave me the money to buy em, but I had to bring her back again all as I took. I always give her all I makes, except sixpence as I wants for my dinner, which is a kipple of penneth of bread and cheese and a pint of beer. I sold that gross and a half I spoke on at a halfpenny each, and I took nine shillings, so that I made five and sixpence. But then I had to leave London at three or four o'clock in the morning, and to stop out till twelve o'clock at night. I used to live out at Hammersmith then, and come up to St Giles every morning and buy the papers. I had to rise by half past two in the morning, and I'd get back again to Hammersmith by about six o'clock. I couldn't sell none on the road, cause the shops wasn't open. The flies is getting bad every summer. 
This year they ain't half so good as they was last year or the year before. I'm sure I don't know why there ain't so many, but they ain't so plentiful like. The best year was three year ago. I know that by the quantity as my customers bought off me, and in three days the papers was swarmed with flies. I've got regular customers where I calls two or three times a week to em. If I was to walk my rounds over, I could at the lowest sell from six to eight dozen at halfpenny each at once. If it was nice weather, like today, so that it wouldn't come wet on me, I should make ten shillings a week regular, but it depends on the weather. If I was to put my profits by, I'm sure I should find I make more than six shillings a week, and nearer eight. But the season is only for three months at most, and then we takes to boot cleaning. Near all the poor boys about here is fly paper sillin in the hot weather and boot cleaners at other times. Shops buy the most of us in London. In Barnet I sell sometimes as much as six or seven dozen to some of the grocers as buys to sell again, but I don't let them have them only when I can't get rid of them to t'other customers. Butchers is very fond of the papers to catch the blue bottles as gets in their meat, though there is a few butchers as have said to me, Oh, go away, they draws the flies more than they catches em. Clothes shops again is very fond of them. I can't tell why they is fond of em, but I suppose cause the flies spots the goods. There's lots of boys going sell and catch em alive o's from Golden Lane and Whitechapel and the Borough. There's lots too comes out of Grey's Inn Lane and St Giles's. Near every boy who has nothing to do goes out with fly papers. Perhaps it ain't that the flies is falled off that we don't sell so many papers now, but because there's so many boys at it. The most intelligent and the most gentle in his demeanour was a little boy who was scarcely tall enough to look on the table at which I was writing. If his face had been washed, he would have been a pretty looking lad, for despite the black marks made by his knuckles during his last fit of crying, he had large expressive eyes, and his features were round and plump, as though he were accustomed to more food than his companions. Whilst taking his statement, I was interrupted by the entrance of a woman whose fears had been aroused by the idea that I belonged to the ragged school and had come to look after the scholars. "'It's no good you're coming here for him. He's off hopping tomorrow with his mother, as has asked me to look after him, and it's only your saxpence he's wanting.' It was with great difficulty that I could get rid of this lady's company, and indeed so great appeared to be the fear in the court that the object of my visit was to prevent the young gentlemen from making their harvest trip into the country, that a murmuring crowd began to assemble round the house where I was, determined to oppose me by force, should I leave the premises accompanied by any of the youths. "'I've been longer at it than that last boy,' though I'm only getting on for thirteen, and he's older than I'm. Cause I'm little, and he's big, getting a man. But I can sell them quite as well as he can, and sometimes better, for I can holler out just as loud, and I've got regular places to go to. I was a very little fellow when I first went out with them, but I could sell them pretty well then, sometimes three or four dozen a day. I've got one place in a stable, where I can sell a dozen at a time to country people. I calls out in the streets, and I goes into the shops too, and calls out, Catch em alive, catch em alive, catch all the nasty black beetles, blue bottles and flies, catch em for teasing the baby's eyes. That's what most of us boys cries out. Some boys who is stupid only says, Catch em alive, but people don't buy so well from them. Up in St Giles's there is a lot of fly boys, but they're a bad set and will fling mud at gentlemen and some prigs the gentleman's pockets. Sometimes, if I sells more than a big boy, he'll get mad and hit me. He'll tell me to give him a halfpenny, and he won't touch me, and that if I don't, he'll kill me. Some of the boys takes an open fly paper and makes me look another way, and then they sticks the catch em alive on my face. The stuff won't come off without soap and hot water, and it goes black and looks like mud. One day, a boy had a broken fly paper, and I was taking a drink of water, and he come behind me and slapped it up in my face. A gentleman as saw him give him a crack with a stick, and me tuppence. 
It takes your breath away until a man comes and takes it off. It all stick to my hair, and I couldn't rack, note, comb, end note, right for some time. When we are selling papers, we have to walk a long way. Some boys go as far as Croydon and all about the country, but I don't go much further than Copenhagen Fields and straight down that way. I don't like going along with other boys. They take your customers away, for perhaps they'll sell them at three a penny to them and spoil the customers for you. I won't go with the big boy you saw, cause he's such a black yard. When he's in the country, he'll go up to a lady and say, Want a fly paper, ma'am? And if she says no, he'll perhaps job his head in her face, butt at her like. When there's no flies and the catch em alives is out, then I goes tumbling. I can turn a carton wheel over on one hand. I'm going tomorrow to the country, harvesting and hopping, for as we says, go out hopping, come in jumping. We start at three o'clock tomorrow, and we shall get about twelve o'clock at night at Dead Man's Barn. It was left for poor people to sleep in, and a man there was buried in a corner. The man had got six farms of hops, and if his son hadn't buried him there, he wouldn't have had none of the riches. The greatest number of flypapers I've sold in a day is about eight dozen. I never sells no more than that. I wish I could. People won't buy em now. When I'm at it, I makes, taking one day with another, about ten shilling a week. You see, if I sold eight dozen, I'd make four shillings. I sell them at a penny each, and two for three halfpence and three for tuppence. When they get stale, I sells them at three a penny. I always begin by asking a penny each, and perhaps they'll say, Give me two for three halfpence. I'll say, Can't, ma'am. And then they pulls out a purse full of money and gives a penny. The police is very kind to us and don't interfere with us. If they sees another boy hitting us, they'll take off their belts and hit him. Sometimes I've sold a catch him alive to a policeman. He'll fold it up and put it in his pocket to take home with him. Perhaps he's got a kid and the flies teases its eyes. Some ladies like to buy fly cages better than catch em alives, because sometimes when they're putting em up, they falls in their faces, and then they screams. The Fly Paper Maker In a small attic room, in a house near Drury Lane, I found the catch em alive manufacturer and his family busy at their trade. Directly I entered the house where I had been told he lodged, I knew that I had come to the right address, for the staircase smelt of turpentine, as if it had been newly painted, the odour growing more and more powerful as I ascended. The little room where the man and his family worked was as hot as an oven, for although it was in the heat of summer, still his occupation forced him to have a fire burning for the purpose of melting and keeping fluid the different ingredients he spread upon his papers. When I opened the door of his room, I was at first puzzled to know how I should enter the apartment, for the ceiling was completely hidden by the papers which had been hung up to dry from the many strings stretched across the place, so that it resembled a washerwoman's backyard, with some thousands of red pocket handkerchiefs suspended in the air. I could see the legs of the manufacturer walking about at the further end, but the other part of his body was hidden from me. On his crying, come in, I had to duck my head down and creep under the forest of paper strips rustling above us. The most curious characteristic of the apartment was the red colour with which everything was stained. The walls, floor and tables were all smeared with ochre, like the pockets of a drover. The papers that were drying were as red as the pages of a gold leaf book. This curious appearance was owing to part of the process of catch em alive making, consisting in first covering the paper with coloured size to prevent the sticky solution from soaking into it. The room was so poorly furnished that it was evident the trade was not a lucrative one. An old Dutch clock with a pendulum as long as a walking stick was the only thing in the dwelling which was not indispensable to the calling. The chimney piece, that test of well-to-do in the houses of the poorer classes, had not a single ornament upon it. The long board on which the family worked served likewise as the table for the family meals, 
and the food they ate had to be laid upon the red smeared surface there was but one chair and that the wife occupied and when the father or son wished to sit down a tub of size was drawn out with its trembling contents from under the work-table and on this they rested themselves we are called in the trade said the father fly-paper makers they used to put a nice name to the things once and call them egyptian fly-papers but now they use merely the word fly-papers or fly-destroyers or fly-catchers or catch em alive oh i never made any calculation about flies and how often they breeds you see it depends upon so many things how they're produced for instance if i was to put my papers on a dung heap i might catch some thousands and if i was to put a paper in an ice well i don't suppose i should catch one i know the flies produce some thousands each because if you look at a paper well studied over with flies you'll see that is if you look very carefully where each fly has blown as we call it there'll be some millions on a paper small grubs or little mites like for while struggling the fly shoots forth the blows and eventually these blows would turn into flies i have been at flycatcher making for the last nine years it's almost impossible to make any calculation as to the number of papers i make during the season and this is the season if it's fine weather then flies is plentiful and the lads who sell the papers in the streets keep me busy but if it's at all bad weather then they turn their attention to blacking boots it's quite a speculation my business is for all depends upon the lads coming to me to buy and there's no certainty beyond i every season expect that these lads who bought papers off me last year will come back and deal with me again first of all these lads will come for a dozen or a couple of dozen of papers and so it goes on till perhaps they are able to sell half a gross a day and then from that they will if the weather is fine get up to ten dozen or perhaps a gross but seldom or never over that in the very busiest and hottest time as is i have for about two or three weeks made as many as thirty-six gross of papers in a week we generally begins about the end of june or the beginning of july and then for five or six weeks we goes on very busy after that it dies out and people gets tired of laying out their money it's almost impossible to get at any calculation of the quantity i make you see today i haven't sold a gross and yesterday i didn't sell more than a gross and the last three days i haven't sold a single paper it's been so wet but last week i sold more than five gross a day it varies so oh yes i sell more than a hundred gross during the season you may say that for a month i make about five gross a day and that taking six days to the week and thirty days to the month makes a hundred and thirty gross and then for another month i do about three gross a day and that at the same calculation makes seventy eight gross or altogether one hundred and ninety eight gross or twenty eight thousand five hundred and twelve single papers and that is as near as i can tell you sometimes our season lasts more than two months you may reckon it from the latter end of june to the end of august or if the weather is very hot then we begins early in june and runs it into september the prime time is when the flies get heavy and stings that's when the papers sells most there's others in the business besides myself they lives up in st giles's and they sells em rather cheaper at one time the shopkeepers used to make the papers when they first commenced they was sold at tuppence and threepence and fourpence apiece but now they're down to three a penny in the streets or a halfpenny for a single one the boys when they've got back the money they paid me for their stock will sell what papers they have left at anything they'll fetch because the papers gets dusty and spiles with the dust i use the very best times paper for my catch em alives i gets them kept for me at stationers shops and libraries and such like i pays threepence a pound or twenty-eight shillings the hundredweight that's a long price but you must have good paper if you want to make a good article i could get paper at twopence a pound but then it's only the cheap sunday papers and they're too slight the morning papers are the best and will stand the pulling and opening the papers for we always fold the destroyers with the sticky sides together when finished the composition i use is very stiff 
If the paper is bad, they tear when you force them open for use. Some in the trade cut up their newspapers into twelve for the full sheet, but I cut mine up into only eight. The process is this. First of all, the paper is sized and coloured. We colour them by putting a little red lead into the size, because if the sticky side is not made apparent, the people won't buy them, because they might spoil the furniture by putting the composition side downwards. After sizing the papers, they are hung up to dry, and then the composition is laid on. This composition is a secret, and I'm obligated to keep it so, for of course all the boys who come here would be trying to make them, and not only would it injure me, but I'd warrant they'd injure themselves as well, by setting the house on fire. You may say that my composition is made from a mixture of resinous substances. Everything in making it depends upon using the proper proportions. There's some men who deal with me who know the substances to make the composition from, but because they haven't got the exact proportions of the quantities, they can't make it right. The great difficulty in making them is drying the papers after they are sized. Some days when it's fine, they'll dry as fast as you can hang them up almost, and other days they won't dry at all, in damp weather especially. There is some makers who sizes and colours their papers in the winter and then puts them to dry, and when the summer comes, then they has only to put on the composition. I'm a very quick hand in the trade, if you can call it one, for it only lasts three months at most, and is a very uncertain one too. Indeed, I don't know what you can style our business. It ain't a profession, and it ain't a trade. I suppose it's a calling. I'm a quick hand, I say, at spreading the composition, and I can, taking the day through, to about two gross an hour. That is, if the papers were sized ready for me. But as it is, having to size them first, I can't do more than three gross a day myself. But with my wife helping me, we can do such a thing as five gross a day. It's most important that the size should dry. Now those papers, note, producing some covered with a dead red coating of the size preparation, end note, have been done four days, and yet they're not dry, although to you they appear so, but I can tell that they feel tough and not crisp as they ought to. When the size is damp, it makes them adhere to one another when I am laying the stuff on, and it sweats through and makes them heavy, and then they tears when I opens them. When I'm working, I first size the entire sheet. We put it on the table, and then we have a big brush and plaster it over. Then I gives it to my wife, and she hangs it up on a line. We can hang up a gross at a time here, and then the room is pretty full, and must seem strange to anybody coming in, though to us it's ordinary enough. The man was about to exhibit to us his method of proceeding, when his attention was drawn off by a smell which the moving of the different pots had caused. "'How strong this size smells, Charlotte,' he said to his wife. "'It's the damp and heat of the room, does it?' the wife replied, and then the narrative went on. "'Before putting on the composition, I cut up the papers into slips as fast as possible. That don't take long.' "'We can cut them in first style,' interrupted the wife. "'I can cut up four gross an hour,' said a boy who was present." I don't think you could, Johnny, said the man. Two gross is nearer the mark to cut em evenly. It's only seventy sheets, remonstrated the lad, and that's only a little more than one a minute. A pile of entire newspapers was here brought out, and all of them coloured red on one side, like the leaves of the books in which gold leaf is kept. Judging from the trial at cutting which followed, we should conclude that the lad was correct in his calculation. When we put on the composition, continued the catch em alive maker, we has the cut slips piled up in a tall mound like, and then we have a big brush and dips it in the pot of stuff and rubs it in. We folds each catcher up as we does it, like a thin slice of bread and butter, and put it down. As I said before, at merely putting on the composition, I could do about two gross an hour. My price to the boys is twopence halfpenny a dozen, or two and sixpence a gross and out of that I don't get more than ninepence profit, for the paper, the resin, and the firing for melting the size and composition all takes off the profit. This season nearly all my customers have been boys. Last season I had a few men who dealt with me. The principal of those who buys of me is Irish. A boy will sometimes sell his papers for a halfpenny each, 
but the usual price is three a penny. Many of the blacking boys deal with me. If it's a fine day, it don't suit them at boot cleaning, and then they'll run out with my papers, and so they have two trades to their backs, one for fine and the other for wet weather. The first man as was the inventor of these fly papers kept a barber's shop in St Andrew's Street, Seven Dials, of the name of Greenwood or Greenfinch, I forget which. I expect he discovered it by accident, using varnish and stuff, for stale varnish has nearly the same effect as our composition. He made them and sold them at first at threepence and fourpence apiece, and then it got down to a penny. He sold the receipt to some other parties, and then it got out through their having to employ men to help him. I worked for a party as made them, and then I set to work making them for myself, and afterwards hawking them. They was a greater novelty then than they are now, and sold pretty well. The men in the streets who had nothing to do used to ask me where I bought them, and then I used to give them my own address, and they'd come and find me. End of section 6《セクション7》of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 7 Of Bugs and Fleas. A numerous family of a large order of insects is but too well known, both in gardens and houses, under the general name of Bugs. Note, semicidae, end note. Most, if not all, of the species being distinguished by an exceedingly disagreeable smell, particularly when pressed or bruised. The sucking instrument of these insects has been so admirably dissected and delineated by Monsieur Savigny in his Theory of the Mouth of Six-Legged, note, hexapod, end note, insects, footnote, Memoire sur les animaux sans vertèbres, Volume 1, page 36, and footnote, that we cannot do better than follow so excellent a guide. The sucker is contained in a sheath, and this sheath is composed of four pieces, which, according to Savigny's theory, represent an under lip much prolonged. The edges bend downwards and form a canal, receiving the four bristles, which he supposes to correspond with the two mandibles and the two lower jaws. It is probable that the two middle of these bristles act as piercers, while the other two, being curved at the extremity, though not at all times naturally so, assist in the process of suction. The plant bugs are all furnished with wings and membranous wing cases, many of them being of considerable size and decked in showy colours. These differ in all those points from their congener, the bed bug. Note, Cimex lectoralius, end note, which is small, without wings, and of a dull, uniform brown. The name is of Welsh origin, being derived from the same root as bugbear, and hence the passage in the Psalms, quote, Thou shalt not be afraid for the terror by night, end quote. Footnote, Psalm 91, verse 5, end footnote, is rendered in Matthew's Bible, quote, Thou shalt not need to be afraid of any bugs by night. End quote. In earlier times, this insect was looked upon with no little fear, no doubt because it was not so abundant as at present. In the year 1503, says Muffet, Dr. Penny was called in great haste to a little village called Mortlake, near the Thames, to visit two noblemen who were much frightened by the appearance of bug bites and were in fear of I know not what contagion. But when the matter was known, and the insects caught, he laughed them out of all fear. Footnote. Theatre of Insects. Page 270. End footnote. This fact, of course, disproves the statement of Southall that bugs were not known in England before 1670. Linnaeus was of opinion, however, that the bug was not originally a native of Europe, but had been imported from America. Be this as it may, it seems to thrive but too well in our climate, though it multiplies less in Britain than in the warmer regions of the continent, where it is also said to grow to a larger size and to bite more keenly. This insect, it is said, is never seen in Ireland. Footnote, J.R. End footnote. Reader's note. 
J.R. refers to works by or the person of John Ray, Fellow of the Royal Society, 1627 to 1705. End of reader's note. Commerce, says a learned entomologist, with many good things, has also introduced amongst us many great evils, of which noxious insects form no small part. And one of her worst presents was, doubtless, the disgusting animals called bugs. They seem, indeed, he adds, to have been productive of greater alarm at first than mischief, at least if we may judge from the change of name which took place upon their becoming common. Their original English name was chinche, or wall louse, and the term bug, which is a Celtic word, signifying a ghost or goblin, was applied to them after Ray's time, most probably because they were considered as terrors by night. Hence our English word bugbear. The word in this sense often occurs in Shakespeare, Winter's Tale, Act 3, Scenes 2 and 3, Henry the Sixth, Act 5, Scene 2, Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 2. See Duce's Illustrations of Shakespeare, Volume 1, page 329. Even in our own island, these obtrusive insects often banish sleep. The night, says Goldsmith in his animated nature, is usually the season when the wretched have rest from their labour, but this seems the only season when the bug issues from its retreats to make its depredations. By day it lurks like a robber in the most secret parts of the bed, takes the advantage of every chink and cranny to make a secure lodgment, and contrives its habitation with so much art that it is no easy matter to discover its retreat. It seems to avoid the light with great cunning, and even if candles be kept burning, this formidable insect will not issue from its hiding place. But when darkness promises security, it then issues from every corner of the bed, drops from the tester, crawls from behind the arras, and travels with great assiduity to the unhappy patient, who vainly wishes for rest. It is generally vain to destroy one only, as there are hundreds more to revenge their companion's fate, so that the person who thus is subject to be bitten, some individuals are exempt, remains the whole night like a sentinel upon duty, rather watching the approach of fresh invaders than inviting the pleasing approaches of sleep. Footnote. Goldsmith's Animated Nature, Volume 4, page 198. End footnote. Muffet assures us that against these enemies of our rest in the night, our merciful God hath furnished us with remedies, which we may fetch out of old and new writers, either to drive them away or kill them. Footnote. Theatre of Insects. End footnote. The following is given as the best poison for bugs by Mr. Brand of the Royal Institution. Reduce an ounce of corrosive sublimate, note, perchloride of mercury, end note, and one ounce of white arsenic to a fine powder. Mix with it one ounce of muriate of ammonia in powder, two ounces each of oil of turpentine and yellow wax, and eight ounces of olive oil. Put all these into a pipkin placed in a pan of boiling water, and when the wax is melted, stir the whole till cold in a mortar. Footnote. Materia Medica. Index. End footnote. A strong solution of corrosive sublimate, indeed, applied as a wash, is a most efficacious bug poison. Though most people dislike this insect, others have been known to regard it with protecting care. One gentleman would never suffer the bugs to be disturbed in his house, or his bedsteads removed, till, in the end, they swarmed to an incredible degree, crawling up even the walls of his drawing-room, and after his death millions were found in his bed and chamber furniture. Footnote. Nicholson's Journal, Volume 17, page 40. End footnote. In the Banyan Hospital, at Surat, the overseers are said frequently to hire beggars from the streets at a stipulated sum to pass the night among bugs and other vermin on the express condition of suffering them to enjoy their feast without molestation. Footnote. Forbes Oriental Memoirs, Volume 1. End footnote. The bedbug is not the only one of its congeners which preys upon man. 
St. Pierre mentions a bug found in the Mauritius, the bite of which is more venomous than the sting of a scorpion, being succeeded by a swelling as big as the egg of a pigeon, which continues for four or five days. Footnote. Voyage to the Isle of France. End footnote. Ray tells us that his friend Willoughby had suffered severe temporary pain in the same way from a water bug. Note. Notonecta glauca, Linnaeus. End note. Footnote. History of Insects, page 58. End footnote. The winged insects of the order to which the bedbug belongs often inflict very painful wounds, and it is even stated upon good authority that an insect of the order commonly known in the West Indies by the name of the wheel bug can communicate an electric shock to the person whose flesh it touches. The late Major General Davis, R.A., note, well known as a most accurate observer of nature and an indefatigable collector of her treasures, as well as a most admirable painter of them, end note. Having taken up this animal and placed it upon his hand, assures us that it gave him, with its legs, a considerable shock, as if from an electric jar, which he felt as high as his shoulders, and then dropping the creature, he observed six marks upon his hand where the six feet had stood. Bugs are very voracious and seem to bite most furiously in the autumn, as if determined to feast themselves before they retire to their winter quarters. There is another pernicious bed insect, the flea, note, Pulex irritans, Linnaeus, end note, which, being without wings, some of our readers may suppose to be nearly allied to the bed bug though it does not belong even to the same order, but to a new one, note, Aphaniptera, Kirby, end note, established on the principle that the wings are obsolescent or inconspicuous. Fleas, it may be worth remarking, are not all of one species, those which infest animals and birds, differing in many particulars from the common bed flea, note, Pulex irritans, end note, as many as twelve distinct sorts of fleas have been found in Britain alone. Footnote. Insect Transformations, page 393. End footnote. The most annoying species, however, is fortunately not indigenous, being a native of the tropical latitudes, and variously named in the West Indies, Chigo, Jigger, Nigua, Tungua, and Peak. Note. Pulex penetrans, Linnaeus. End note. According to Stedman, quote, This is a kind of small sand flea which gets in between the skin and the flesh without being felt, and generally under the nails of the toes, where, while it feeds, it keeps growing till it becomes the size of a pea, causing no further pain than a disagreeable itching. In process of time, its operation appears in the form of a small bladder in which are deposited thousands of eggs or nits and which, if it breaks, produce so many young chigos, which in course of time create running ulcers, often a very dangerous consequence to the patient. So much so, indeed, that I knew a soldier, the soles of whose feet were obliged to be cut away before he could recover. And some men have lost their limbs by amputation, nay, even their lives, by having neglected in time to root out these abominable vermin. End quote. Walton mentions that a Capuchin friar, in order to study the history of the Chigo, permitted a colony of them to establish themselves in his feet. But before he could accomplish his object, his feet mortified and had to be amputated. Footnote. Walton's Hispaniola. End footnote. No wonder that Cardan calls the insect a very shrewd plague. Footnote. Subtilia, volume 9. End footnote. Several extraordinary feats of strength have been recorded of fleas by various authors. Footnote. Insect Transformations, page 180. End footnote. And we shall here give our own testimony to a similar fact. At the fair of Charlton in Kent, 1830, we saw a man exhibit three fleas harnessed to a carriage in the form of an omnibus, at least 50 times their own bulk, which they pulled along with great ease. Another pair drew a chariot. The exhibitor showed the whole, first through a magnifying glass, and then to the naked eye, so that we were satisfied there was no deception. From the fleas being of large size, they were evidently all females. Footnote. Introduction, Volume 1, 
page 102, J.R. End footnote. It is rarely, however, that we meet with fleas in the way of amusement, unless we are of the singular humour of the old lady mentioned by Kirby and Spence, who had a liking to them, because, said she, I think they are the prettiest little merry things in the world. I never saw a dull flea in all my life. When Ray and Willoughby were travelling, they found, quote, at Venice and Augsburg, fleas for sale, and at a small price too, decorated with steel or silver collars round their necks. When fleas are kept in a box amongst wool or cloth, in a warm place, and fed once a day, they will live a long time. When these insects begin to suck, they erect themselves almost perpendicularly, thrusting their sucker, which originates in the middle of the forehead, into the skin. The itching is not felt immediately, but a little afterwards. As soon as they are full of blood, they begin to void a portion of it, and thus, if permitted, they will continue for many hours sucking and voiding. After the first itching, no uneasiness is subsequently felt. Willoughby had a flea that lived for three months, sucking in this manner the blood of his hand. It was at length killed by the cold of winter. End quote. Footnote. J. R. End footnote. According to Muffet's account of the sucker of the flea, quote, the point of his nib is somewhat hard, that he may make it enter the better, and it must necessarily be hollow, that he may suck out the blood and carry it in. End quote. Footnote. Theatre of Insects, page 1102. End footnote. Modern authors, particularly Strauss and Kirby, show that Roussel was mistaken in supposing this sucker to consist of two pieces, as it is really made up of seven. First, there is a pair of triangular instruments, somewhat resembling the beak of a bird, inserted on each side of the mouth, under the parts which are generally regarded as the antennae. Next, a pair of long, sharp piercers, note, scalpula, Kirby, end note, which emerge from the head below the preceding instruments, whilst a pair of feelers, note, palpi, end note, consisting of four joints, is attached to these near their base. In fine, there is a long slender tongue, like a bristle, in the middle of these several pieces. Muffet says, quote, the lesser, leaner, and younger the fleas are, the sharper they bite, the fat ones being more inclined to tickle and play. They molest men that are sleeping, he adds, and trouble wounded and sick persons, from whom they escape by skipping. For as soon as they find they are arraigned to die, and feel the finger coming, on a sudden they are gone, and leap here and there, and so escape the danger. But so soon as day breaks, they forsake the bed. They then creep into the rough blankets, or hide themselves in rushes and dust, lying in ambush for pigeons, hens, and other birds also for men and dogs, moles and mice, and vex such as pass by. Our hunters report that foxes are full of them, and they tell a pretty story how they get quit of them. The fox, say they, gathers some handfuls of wool from thorns and briars, and wrapping it up, holds it fast in his mouth. Then he goes by degrees into a cold river, and dips himself down by little and little, when he finds that all the fleas are crept so high as his head for fear of drowning, and ultimately for shelter crept into the wool, he barks and spits out the wool, full of fleas, and thus, very frolically, being delivered from their molestations, he swims to land. End quote. Footnote. Theatre of Insects, page 1102. End footnote. This is a little more doubtful even than the story told of Christina, Queen of Sweden, who is reported to have fired at the fleas that troubled her with a piece of artillery, still exhibited in the Royal Arsenal at Stockholm. Footnote, Linnaeus, Lachesis Lapan, Volume 2, page 32, note, end footnote. Nor are fleas confined to the old continent, for Lewis and Clark found them exceedingly harassing on the banks of the Missouri where it is said the native Indians are sometimes compelled to shift their quarters to escape their annoyance. They are not acquainted, it would therefore seem, with the device of the shepherds of Hungary, who grease their clothes with hog's lard to deter the fleas. Footnote Travels, 
End footnote. Nor with the old English preventative, quote, While wormwood hath seed, get a handful or twain, to save against march, to make fleas refrain. Where chamber is swept, and wormwood is strown, ne'er flea for his life dare abide to be known. End quote. Footnote. Tusser, points of good husbandry. End footnote. Linnaeus was in error in stating that the domestic cat, note, Felis maniculatus, timink, end note, is not infested with fleas, for on kittens in particular they abound as numerously as upon dogs. Footnote, J.R. End footnote. Her Majesty's Bug Destroyer the vending of bug poison in the London streets is seldom followed as a regular source of living. We have met with persons who remember to have seen men selling penny packets of vermin poison, but to find out the vendors themselves was next to an impossibility. The men seem merely to take to the business as a living when all other sources have failed. All, however, agree in acknowledging that there is such a street trade but that the living it affords is so precarious that few men stop at it longer than two or three weeks. Perhaps the most eminent firm of the bug destroyers in London is that of Messrs. Tiffin and Son, but they have pursued their calling in the streets, and rejoice in the title of Bug Destroyers to Her Majesty and the Royal Family. Mr. Tiffin, the senior partner in this house, most kindly obliged me with the following statement. It may be as well to say that Mr. Tiffin appears to have paid much attention to the subject of bugs, and has studied with much earnestness the natural history of this vermin. We can trace our business back, he said, as far as 1695, when one of our ancestors first turned his attention to the destruction of bugs. He was a lady staymaker. Men used to make them in those days, though as far as that is concerned, it was a man that made my mother's dresses. This ancestor found some bugs in his house, a young colony of them, that had introduced themselves without his permission, and he didn't like their company, so he tried to turn them out of doors again, I have heard it said, in various ways. It is in history, and it has been handed down in my own family as well, that bugs were first introduced into England after the fire of London, in the timber that was brought for rebuilding the city thirty years after the fire and it was about that time that my ancestor first discovered the colony of bugs in his house. I can't say whether he studied the subject of bug destroying, or whether he found out his stuff by accident, but he certainly did invent a compound which completely destroyed the bugs, and having been so successful in his own house, he named it to some of his customers who were similarly plagued, and that was the commencement of the present connection, which has continued up to this time. At the time of the illumination for the piece, I thought I must have something over my shop that would be both suitable for the event and to my business. So I had a transparency done and stretched on a big frame and lit up by gas, on which was written, May the destroyers of peace be destroyed by us, Tiffin and Son, bug destroyers to Her Majesty. Our business was formerly carried on in the Strand, where both my father and myself were born. In fact, I may say I was born to the bug business. I remember my father as well as possible. Indeed, I worked with him for ten or eleven years. He used, when I was a boy, to go out to his work killing bugs at his customers' houses with a sword by his side and a cocked hat and bag wig on his head. In fact, dressed up like a regular dandy. I remember my grandmother, too, when she was in the business, going to the different houses and seating herself in a chair and telling the men what they were to do, to clean the furniture and wash the woodwork. I have customers in our books for whom our house has worked these 150 years. That is, my father and self have worked for them and their fathers. We do the work by contract, examining the house every year. It's a precaution to keep the place comfortable. You see, servants are apt to bring bugs in their boxes, and though there may be only two or three bugs, perhaps, hidden in the woodwork and the clothes, yet they soon breed if left alone. We generally go in the spring before the bugs lay their eggs, or if that time passes, it ought to be done before June, before their eggs are hatched, though it's never too late to get rid of a nuisance. I mostly find the bugs in the bedsteads. 
but if they are left unmolested they get numerous and climb to the tops of the rooms and about the corners of the ceilings they colonize anywhere they can though they are very high-minded and prefer lofty places where iron bedsteads are used the bugs are more in the rooms and that's why such things are bad they don't keep a bug away from the person sleeping bugs will come if they're thirty yards off i knew a case where a bug who used to come every night about thirty or forty feet it was an immense large room from a corner of the room to visit an old lady there was only one bug and he'd been there for a long time i was sent for to find him out it took me a long time to catch him in that instance i had to examine every part of the room and when i got him i gave him an extra nip to serve him out the reason why i was so bothered was the bug had hidden itself near the window the last place i should have thought of looking for him for a bug never by choice faces the light but when i came to inquire about it i found that this old lady never rose till three o'clock in the day and the window curtains were always drawn so that there was no light like lord yes i am often sent for to catch a single bug i've had to go many many miles even one hundred or two hundred into the country and perhaps catch only half a dozen bugs after all but then that's all that are there so it answers our employer's purpose as well as if they were swarming i work for the upper classes only that is for carriage company and such like approaching it you know i have noblemen's names the first in england on my books my work is more method and i may call it a scientific treating of the bugs rather than wholesale murder we don't care about the thousands it's the last bug we look for whilst your carpenters and upholsters leave as many behind them perhaps as they manage to catch the bite of the bug is very curious they bite all persons the same but the difference of effect lays in the constitution of the parties i have never noticed that a different kind of skin makes any difference in being bitten whether the skin is moist or dry it don't matter wherever bugs are the person sleeping in the bed is sure to be fed on whether they are marked or not and as a proof when nobody has slept in the bed for some time the bugs become quite flat and on the contrary when the bed is always occupied they are round as a ladybird the flat bug is more ravenous though even he will allow you time to go to sleep before he begins with you or at least until he thinks you ought to be asleep when they find all quiet not even a light in the room will prevent their biting but they are seldom or ever found under the bedclothes they like a clear ground to get off and generally bite round the edges of the nightcap or the nightdress when they are found in the bed it's because the parties have been tossing about and have curled the sheets round the bugs the finest and the fattest bugs i ever saw were those i found in a black man's bed he was the favourite servant of an indian general he didn't want his bed done by me he didn't want it touched his bed was full of them no beehive was ever fuller the walls and all were the same there wasn't a patch that wasn't crammed with them he must have taken them all over the house wherever he went i've known persons to be laid up for months through bug bites there was a very handsome fair young lady i knew once and she was much bitten about the arms and neck and face so that her eyes were so swelled up she couldn't see the spots rose up like blisters the same as if stung with a nettle only on a very large scale the bites were very much inflamed and after a time they had the appearance of boils some people fancy and it is historically recorded that the bug smells because it has no vent but that is fabulous for they have a vent it is not the human blood neither that makes them smell because a young bug who has never touched a drop will smell they breathe i believe through their sides but i can't answer for that though it's not through the head they haven't got a mouth but they insert into the skin the point of a tube which is quite as fine as a hair through which they draw up the blood i have many a time put a bug on the back of my hand to see how they bite though i never felt the bite but once and then i suppose the bug had pitched upon a very tender part for it was a sharp prick something like that of a leech bite i once had a case of lice killing for my process will answer as well for them as for bugs though it's a thing i should never follow by choice 
Lice seem to harbour pretty much the same as bugs do. I found them in the furniture. It was a nurse that brought them into the house, though she was as nice and clean a looking woman as ever I saw. I should almost imagine the lice must have been in her, for they say there is a disease of that kind, and if the ticks breed in sheep, why should not lice breed in us? For we're but live matter too. I didn't like myself at all for two or three days after that lice-killing job, I can assure you. It's the only case of the kind I ever had, and I can promise you it shall be the last. I was once at work on the Princess Charlotte's own bedstead. I was in the room, and she asked me if I had found anything, and I told her no. But just at that minute I did happen to catch one, and upon that she sprang up on the bed and put her hand on my shoulder to look at it. She had been tormented by the creature, because I was ordered to come directly, and that was the only one I found. When the princess saw it, she said, Oh, the nasty thing! That's what tormented me last night! Don't let him escape! I think he looked all the better for having tasted royal blood. I also profess to kill beetles, though you can never destroy them so effectually as you can bugs, for you see beetles run from one house to another, and you can never perfectly get rid of them. You can only keep them under. Beetles will scrape their way and make their road round a fireplace. But how they manage to go from one house to another, I can't say, but they do. I never had patience enough to try and kill fleas by my process. It would be too much of a chivy to please me. I never heard of any but one man who seriously went to work selling bug poison in the streets. I was told by some persons that he was selling a first-rate thing, and I spent several days to find him out. But after all, his secret proved to be nothing at all. It was train oil, linseed and hempseed, crushed up altogether, and the bugs were to eat it till they burst. After all, secrets for bug poisons ain't worth much, for all depends upon the application of them. For instance, it is often the case that I am sent for to find out one bug in a room large enough for a school. I discovered it when the creature had been three or four months there, as I could tell by his having changed his jacket so often, for bugs shed their skins, you know. No, there was no reason that he should have bred. It might have been a single gentleman or an old maid. A married couple of bugs will lay from forty to fifty eggs at one laying. The eggs are oval and are each as large as the thirty-second part of an inch, and when together are in the shape of a caraway comfit and of a bluish white colour. They'll lay this quantity of eggs three times in a season. The young ones are hatched direct from the egg, and, like young partridges, will often carry the broken eggs about with them, clinging to their back. They get their four quarters out, and then they run about before the other legs are completely cleared. As soon as the bugs are born, they are of a cream colour and will take to blood directly. Indeed, if they don't get it in two or three days, they die. But after one feed, they will live a considerable time without a second meal. I have known old bugs to be frozen over in a horse pond when the furniture has been thrown in the water, and there they have remained for a good three weeks. Still, after they have got a little bit warm in the sun's rays, they have returned to life again. I have myself kept bugs for five years and a half without food, and a housekeeper at Lord H's informed me that an old bedstead that I was then moving from a storeroom was taken down forty-five years ago and had not been used since, but the bugs in it were still numerous, though as thin as living skeletons. They couldn't have lived upon the sap of the wood, it being worm-eaten and dry as a bone. A bug will live for a number of years, and we find that when bugs are put away in old furniture without food, they don't increase in number, so that, according to my belief, the bugs I just mentioned must have existed forty-five years. Besides, they were large ones and very dark-coloured, which is another proof of age. It is a dangerous time for bugs when they are shedding their skins, which they do about four times in the course of a year. Then they throw off their hard shell and have a soft coat, so that the least touch will kill them, whereas at other times they will take a strong pressure. I have plenty of bug skins, which I keep by me as curiosities, of all sizes and colours, and sometimes I have found the young bugs collected inside the old ones' skins for warmth, as if they had put on their father's greatcoat. 
There are white bugs, albinos you may call them, freaks of nature like. End of section 7 Section 8 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Destroyers of Vermin, Part 8. Black Beetles. Cockroaches are even more voracious than crickets. A small species, note, Blata laponica, Linnaeus, end note, occasionally met with about London, is said to swarm numerously in the huts of the Laplanders, and will sometimes, in conjunction with a carrion beetle, note Sylpha laponica Linnaeus, end note, devour, we are told, in a single day, their whole store of dried fish. In London, and many other parts of the country, cockroaches, originally introduced from abroad, have multiplied so prodigiously as to be a great nuisance. They are often so numerous in kitchens and lower rooms in the metropolis as literally to cover the floor and render it impossible for them to move except over each other's bodies. This indeed only happens after dark, for they are strictly night insects, and the instant a candle is intruded upon the assembly, they rush towards their hiding places so that in a few seconds not one of the countless multitude is to be seen. In consequence of their numbers, independently of their carnivorous propensities, they are driven to eat anything that comes in their way, and besides devouring every species of kitchen stuff, they gnaw clothes, leather and books. They likewise pollute everything they crawl over with an unpleasant, nauseous smell. These black beetles, however, as they are commonly called, are harmless when compared with the foreign species, the giant cockroach, note Blata gigantea, end note, which is not content with devouring the stores of the larder, but will attack human bodies, and even gnaw the extremities of the dead and dying. Note Drury's Illustrations of Natural History, Volume 3, Preface, end note. Cockroaches, at least the kind that is most abundant in Britain, hate the light and never come forth from their hiding places till the lights are removed or extinguished. Note the Blata germanica, however, which abounds in some houses, is bolder, making its appearance in the day and running up the walls and over the tables to the great annoyance of the inhabitants. End note. In the London houses, especially on the ground floor, they are most abundant and consume everything they can find. Flour, bread, meat, clothes and even shoes. As soon as light, natural or artificial, appears, they all scamper off as fast as they can and vanish in an instant. These pests are not indigenous to this country and perhaps nowhere in Europe, but are one of the evils which commerce has imported. In Captain Cook's last voyage, the ships, while at Hushain, were infested with incredible numbers of these creatures, which it was found impossible by any means to destroy. Every kind of food, when exposed only for a few minutes, was covered with them, and pierced so full of holes that it resembled a honeycomb. They were so fond of ink that they ate out the writing on labels. Captain Cook's cockroaches were of two kinds, the Blata orientalis and Germanica. Note Encyclopedia Britannica. End note. The following fact we give from Mr. Douglas's World of Insects. Quote, Everybody has heard of a haunted house. Nearly every house in and about London is haunted. Let the doubters, if they have the courage, go stealthily down to the kitchen at midnight armed with a light and whatever other weapon they like, and they will see that beings of which Tam O'Shanter never dreamed, whose presence at daylight was only a myth, have here a local habitation and a name. Scared from their nocturnal revels, the creatures run and scamper in all directions, 
until in a short time the stage is clear and as in some legend of diablerie nothing remains but a most peculiar odour these were no spirits had nothing even of the fairy about them but were veritable cockroaches or black beetles as they are more commonly but erroneously termed for they are not beetles at all they have prodigious powers of increase and are a corresponding nuisance kill as many as you will except perhaps by poison and you cannot extirpate them the cry is still they come one of the best ways to be rid of them is to keep a hedgehog to which creature they are a favourite food and his nocturnal habits make him awake to theirs i have known cats eat cockroaches but they do not thrive upon them end quote. one article of their food would hardly have been suspected says mr newman in a note communicated to the entomological society at the meeting in february eighteen fifty five there is nothing new under the sun so says the proverb i believed until a few days back that i possessed the knowledge of a fact in the dietary economy of the cockroach of which entomologists were not cognizant but i find myself forestalled the fact is as old as the hills it is that the cockroach seeks with diligence and devours with great gusto the common bed-bug i will not mention names but i am so confident of the veracity of the narrator that i willingly take the entire responsibility of the following narrative poverty makes one acquainted with strange bedfellows and my informant bears willing testimony to the truth of the adage he had not been prosperous and had sought shelter in a london boarding-house every night he saw cockroaches ascending his bed curtains every morning he complained to his very respectable landlady and invariably received the comforting assurance that there was not a black beetle in the house still he pursued his nocturnal investigations and he not only saw cockroaches running along the tester of the bed but to his great astonishment he positively observed one of them seize a bug and he therefore concluded and not without some show of reason that the cockroach ascended the curtains with this especial object and that the more odoriferous insect is a favourite food of the major one the following extract from mr webster's narrative of foster's voyage corroborates this recent observation and illustrates the proverb which i have taken as my text Quote, cockroaches those nuisances of ships are plentiful at st helena and yet bad as they are they are more endurable than bugs previous to our arrival here in the chanticleer we had suffered great inconvenience from the latter but the cockroaches no sooner made their appearance than the bugs entirely disappeared the fact is the cockroach preys upon them and leaves no sign or vestige of where they have been so far the latter is a most valuable insect End quote. so great is the annoyance and discomfort arising from these insects in cockney households that the author of a paper in the daily news discusses the best means of effecting their extirpation the writer of the article referred to avows his conviction that the ingenious individual who shall devise the means of effectually ridding our houses of these insect pests will deserve to be ranked amongst the benefactors of mankind the writer details the various expedients resorted to hedgehogs cucumber peel red wafers phosphoric paste glazed basins or pie dishes filled with beer or a syrup of beer and sugar with bits of wood set up from the floor to the edge for the creatures to run up by and then be precipitated into the fatal lake but believes that none of these methods are fundamental enough for the evil which so far as he is yet aware can only be effectually cured by heating our houses by steam beetle destroyers a firm which has been established in london seven years 
and which manufactures exclusively poison known to the trade as the phosphor paste for the destruction of black beetles cockroaches rats mice and so on were kind enough to give me the following information Quote, we have now sold this vermin poison for seven years but we have never had an application for our composition from any street seller we have seen a year or two since a man about london who used to sell beetle wafers but as we knew that kind of article to be entirely useless we were not surprised to find that he did not succeed in making a living we have not heard of him for some time and have no doubt he is dead or has taken up some other line of employment it is a strange fact perhaps but we do not know anything or scarcely anything as to the kind of people and tradesmen who purchase our poison to speak the truth we do not like to make too many inquiries of our customers sometimes when they have used more than their customary quantity we have asked casually how it was and to what kind of business people they disposed of it and we have always been met with an evasive sort of answer you see tradesmen don't like to divulge too much for it must be a poor kind of profession or calling that there are no secrets in and again they fancy we want to know what description of trades use the most of our composition so that we might supply them direct from ourselves from this cause we have made it a rule not to inquire curiously into the matters of our customers we are quite content to dispose of the quantity we do for we employ six travellers to call on chemists and oilmen for the town trade and four for the country the other day an elderly lady from high street camden town called upon us she stated that she was overrun with black beetles and wished to buy some of our paste from ourselves for she said she always found things better if you purchased them of the maker as you were sure to get them stronger and by that means avoided the adulteration of the shopkeepers but as we have said we would not supply a single box to any one not wishing to give our agents any cause for complaint we were obliged to refuse to sell to the old lady we don't care to say how many boxes we sell in the year but we can tell you sir that we sell more for beetle poisoning in the summer than in the winter as a matter of course when we find that a particular district uses almost an equal quantity all the year round we make sure that that is a rat district for where there is not the heat of summer to breed beetles it must follow that the people wish to get rid of rats brixton hackney balls pond and lower road islington are the places that use most of our paste those districts lying low and being consequently damp camden town though it is in a high situation is very much infested with beetles it is a clay soil you understand which retains moisture and will not allow it to filter through like gravel this is why in some very low districts where the houses are built on gravel we sell scarcely any of our paste as the farmers say a good fruit year is a good fly year so we say a good dull wet summer is a good beetle summer and this has been a very fertile year and we only hope it will be as good next year we don't believe in rat destroyers they profess to kill with weasels and a lot of things and sometimes even say they can charm them away captains of vessels when they arrive in the docks will employ these people and as we say they generally use our composition but as long as their vessels are cleared of the vermin they don't care to know how it is done a man who drives about in a cart and does a great business in this way we have reason to believe uses a great quantity of our phosphor paste he comes from somewhere down the east end or whitechapel way our prices are too high for the street sellers your street seller can only afford to sell an article made by a person in but a very little better position than himself even our small boxes cost at the trade price two shillings a dozen and when sold will only produce three shillings so you can imagine the profit is not enough for the itinerant vendor bakers don't use much of our paste for they seem to think it no use to destroy the vermin 
beetles and bakers' shops generally go together. End quote. Crickets. The house cricket may perhaps be deemed a still more annoying insect than the common cockroach, adding an incessant noise to its ravages. Though it may not be unpleasant to hear for a short time the cricket chirrup in the hearth, so constant a din every evening must greatly interrupt comfort and conversation. These garrulous animals, which live in a kind of artificial torrid zone, are very thirsty souls and are frequently found drowned in pans of water, milk, broth and the like. Whatever is moist, even stockings or linen hung out to dry, is to them a bonne bouche. They will eat the skimmings of pots, yeast, crumbs of bread and even salt or anything within their reach. Sometimes they are so abundant in houses as to become absolute pests flying into the candles and even into people's faces. Note Kirby and Spence's Entomology, Volume 1, pages 206 and 207. End note. The house cricket, note, Acheta domestica, end note, is well known for its habit of picking out the mortar of ovens and fireplaces, where it not only enjoys warmth, but can procure abundance of food. It is usually supposed that it feeds on bread, Monsieur Latre says it only eats insects, and it certainly thrives well in houses infested by the cockroach, but we have also known it eat and destroy lamb's wool stockings and other woolen stuffs hung near a fire to dry. Although the food of crickets consists chiefly of vegetable substances, they exhibit a propensity to carnivorous habits. The house cricket thrives best in the vicinity of a baker's oven where there are plenty of breadcrumbs. Muffet marvels at its extreme likeness inasmuch as there is not, quote, found in the belly any superfluity at all, although it feed on the moisture of flesh and fat of broth, to which either poured out or reserved, it runs in the night. Yet although it feed on bread, yet is the belly always lank and void of superfluity, end quote. Note, Theatre of Insects, page 96. End note. White of Selborne again says, quote, As one would suppose, from the burning atmosphere which they inhabit, they are a thirsty race, and show a great propensity for liquids, being frequently found dead in pans of water, milk, broth, or the like. Whatever is moist, they are fond of and therefore they often gnaw holes in wet woolen stockings and aprons that are hung to the fire. These crickets are not only very thirsty, but very voracious, for they will eat the scummings of pots, yeast, bread, and kitchen offal, or sweepings of almost every description. End quote. Note. Natural History of Selborne. End note. The cricket is evidently not fond of hard labour, but prefers those places where the mortar is already loosened, or at least is new, soft, and easily scooped out, and in this way it will dig covert channels from room to room. In summer, crickets often make excursions from the house to the neighbouring fields and dwell in the crevices of rubbish, or the cracks made in the ground by dry weather, where they chirp as merrily as in the snuggest chimney corner. Whether they ever dig retreats in such circumstances we have not ascertained, though it is not improbable they may do so for the purpose of making nests. Those, says Mr. Guff of Manchester, who have attended to the manners of the hearth cricket, know that it passes the hottest part of the summer in sunny situations, concealed in the crevices of walls and heaps of rubbish. It quits its summer abode about the end of August, and fixes its residence by the fireside of kitchens or cottages where it multiplies its species and is as merry at Christmas as other insects in the dog days. Thus do the comforts of a warm hearth afford the cricket a safe refuge, not from death, but from temporary torpidity, though it can support this for a long time when deprived by accident of artificial warmth. I came to a knowledge of this fact continues Mr. Guff, by planting a colony of these insects in a kitchen where a constant fire was kept through the summer, but which is discontinued from November till June, 
with the exception of a day once in six or eight weeks. The crickets were brought from a distance and let go in this room in the beginning of September 1806. Here they increased considerably in the course of two months, but were not heard or seen after the fire was removed. Their disappearance led me to conclude that the cold had killed them, but in this I was mistaken, for a brisk fire being kept up for a whole day in the winter, the warmth of it invited my colony from their hiding place, but not before the evening, after which they continued to skip about and chirp the greater part of the following day, when they again disappeared, being compelled by the returning cold to take refuge in their former retreats. They left the chimney corner on the 25th of May, 1807, after a fit of very hot weather, and revisited their winter residence on the 31st of August. Here they spent the summer merely, and at present, note January 1808, end note, lie torpid in the crevices of the chimney, with the exception of those days on which they are recalled to a temporary existence by the comforts of the fire, end quote. Note, Reeve, Essay on the Torpidity of Animals, page 84, end note. Monsieur Bory de Saint-Vincent tells us that the Spaniards are so fond of crickets that they keep them in cages like singing birds. Note, Dictionnaire classique d'histoire naturelle grillon. Rennie's Insect Architecture, 4th edition, page 242, end note. Associated as is the chirping song of the cricket family of insects with the snug chimney corner or the sunshine of summer, it affords a pleasure which certainly does not arise from the intrinsic quality of its music. Sounds, says White, do not always give us pleasure according to their sweetness and melody, nor do harsh sounds always displease. Thus the shrilling of the field cricket, note, acheta campestris, End note. Though sharp and stridulous, yet marvellously delights some hearers, filling their minds with a train of summer ideas of everything that is rural, verdurous, and joyous. Note. Natural History of Selborne, Volume 2, page 73. End note. Quote. Sounds inharmonious in themselves and harsh, yet heard in scenes where peace forever reigns, and only there please highly for their sake. End quote. Cooper, Task, Book 1. This circumstance, no doubt, causes the Spaniards to keep them in cages, as we do singing birds. White tells us that, if supplied with moistened leaves, they will sing as merrily and loud in a paper cage as in the fields. But he did not succeed in planting a colony of them in the terrace of his garden, though he bored holes for them in the turf, to save them the labour of digging. The hearth cricket, again, though we hear it occasionally in the hedge banks in summer, prefers the warmth of an oven or a good fire, and thence, residing as it were always in the torrid zone, is ever alert and merry, a good Christmas fire being to it what the heat of the dog days is to others. Though crickets are frequently heard by day, yet their natural time of motion is only in the night, as soon as darkness prevails, the chirping increases, whilst the hearth crickets come running forth, and are often to be seen in great numbers, from the size of a flea to that of their full stature. Like the field cricket, the hearth crickets are sometimes kept for their music, and the learned Scaliger took so great a fancy to their song that he was accustomed to keep them in a box in his study. It is reported that in some parts of Africa they are kept and fed in a kind of iron oven and sold to the natives who like their chirp and think it is a good soporific. Note, Muffet, Theatre of Insects, page 136. End note. Milton, too, chose for his contemplative pleasures a spot where crickets resorted. Quote, where glowing embers through the room teach light to counterfeit a gloom, far from all resort of mirth, see the cricket on the hearth. End quote. Note. Il penseroso. End note. Rennie, in his Insect Miscellanies, says, quote, We have been as unsuccessful in transplanting the hearth cricket as White was with the field crickets. 
In two different houses we have repeatedly introduced crickets, but could not prevail on them to stay. One of our trials, indeed, was made in summer with insects brought from a garden wall, and it is probable they thought the kitchen fireside too hot at that season. End quote. Note, page 82. End note. The so-called chirp of the cricket is a vulgar error. The instrument, for so it may be styled, upon which the male cricket plays, note, the female is mute, end note, consists of strong nervures or rough strings in the wing cases, by the friction of which, against each other, a sound is produced and communicated to the membranes stretched between them, in the same manner as the vibrations caused by the friction of the finger upon the tambourine are diffused over its surface. It is erroneously stated in a popular work that, quote, the organ is a membrane which, in contracting, by means of a muscle and tendon placed under the wings of the insect, folds down somewhat like a fan, end quote, and this being, quote, always dry, yields by its motion a sharp piercing sound, end quote. Note, Bingley, Animal Biography, Volume 4, 6th edition. Rennie's Insect Miscellanies, page 62. End note. End of section 8. Section 9 of London Labour and the London Poor, volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Our Street Folk. 1. Street Exhibitors Punch The performer of Punch that I saw was a short, dark, pleasant-looking man, dressed in a very greasy and very shiny green shooting jacket. This was fastened together by one button in front, all the other buttonholes having been burst through. Protruding from his bosom, a corner of the Pandean pipes was just visible, and as he told me the story of his adventures, he kept playing with the band of his very limp and very rusty old beaver hat. He had formerly been a gentleman's servant and was especially civil in his manners. He came to me with his hair tidily brushed for the occasion, but apologised for his appearance on entering the room. He was very communicative and took great delight in talking like punch with his call in his mouth while some young children were in the room and who, hearing the well-known sound of Punch's voice, looked all about for the figure. Not seeing the show, they fancied the man had the figure in his pocket, and that the sounds came from it. The change from Punch's voice to the man's natural tone was managed without an effort, and instantaneously. It had a very peculiar effect. "'I am the proprietor of a Punch's show,' he said. I goes about with it myself and performs inside the frame behind the green baize. I have a partner what plays the music, the pipes and drum, him as you seed with me. I have been five and twenty year now at the business. I wish I'd never seen it, though it's been a money-making business. Indeed, the best of all the street exhibitions, I may say. I'm fifty years old. I took to it for money gains. That was what I done it for. I formerly lived in service, was a footman in a gentleman's family. When I first took to it, I could make two and three pounds a day. I could so. You see, the way in which I took first to the business was this here. There was a party used to come and cheer for us at my master's house, and her son, having a exhibition of his own, and being in want of a partner, axed me if so be I'd go out, which was a thing that I degraded at the time. He gave me information as to what the money-taking was, and it seemed to me that good that it would pay me better nor service. I had twenty pounds a year in my place, and my board and lodging, and two suits of clothes, but the young man told me as how I could make a pound a day at the punch and duty business, after a little practice. I took a deal of persuasion, though, before I'd join him. It was beneath my dignity to fall from a footman to a showman. But, you see, the French gentleman, as I lived with, he were a merchant in the city and had fourteen clerks working for him, went back to his own country to reside and left me with a written character. But that was no use to me, though I'd find recommendations at the back of it, no one would look at it. 
so I was five months out of employment, knocking about, living first on my wages and then on my clothes, till all was gone but the few rags on my back. So I began to think that the punch and duty business was better than starving, after all. Yes, I should think anything was better than that, though it's a business that, after you've once took to, you never can get out of. People fancies you know too much and won't have nothing to say to you. If I got a situation at a tradesman's, why, the boys would be sure to recognise me behind the counter and begin a shouting into the shop. They must shout, you know. Oh, there's Punch and Judy. There's Punch a-sarving out the customers. Ah, it's a great annoyance being a public character, I can assure you, sir. Go where you will, it's Punchy, Punchy. As for the boys, they'll never leave me alone till I die, I know. And I suppose in my old age I shall have to take to the parish broom. All our forefathers died in the workhouse. I don't know a Punchy's showman that hasn't. One of my partners was buried by the workhouse. And even old Pike, the most noted showman as ever was, died in the workhouse. Pike and Porcini. Porcini was the first original street punch, and Pike was his apprentice. Their names is handed down to posterity among the noblemen and footmen of the land. They both died in the workhouse, and in course I shall do the same. Something else might turn up, to be sure. We can't say what this luck of the world is. I'm obliged to strive very hard. Very hard indeed, sir, now, to get a living, and then not to get it after all, at times, compelled to go short, often. Punch, you know, sir, is a dramatic performance in two hats. It's a play, you may say. I don't think it can be called a tragedy, exactly. A drama is what we names it. There is tragic parts, and comic and sentimental parts, too. Some families where I performs will have it most sentimental, in the original style. Them families is generally sentimental theirselves. Others is all for the comic, and then I has to kick up all the games I can. To the sentimental folk, I am obliged to perform wary steady and wary slow, and leave out all comic words in business. They won't have no ghost, no coffin, and no devil, and that's what I call spiling the performance entirely. It's the march of intellect what's a doing all this, it is, sir. But I was a-going to tell you about my first joining the business. Well, you see, after a good deal of persuading, and being drew to it, I may say, I consented to go out with the young man as I were a-speaking about. He was to give me twelve shillings a week, and my keep, for two years certain, till I could get my own show things together, and for that I was to carry the show and go round and collect. Collecting, you know, sounds better than begging. The pronunciation's better like. Sometimes the people says, when they sees us a-coming round, Oh, here they comes a-begging. But it can't be begging, you know, when you're a-exerting yourselves. I couldn't play the drum and pipes, so the young man used to do that himself, to call the people together before he got into the show. I used to stand outside and patter to the figures. The first time that ever I went out with Punch was in the beginning of August 1825. I did all I could to avoid being seen. My dignity was hurt at being obligated to take to the streets for a living. At first I fought shy and used to feel queer somehow, you don't know how like, whenever the people used to look at me. I remember very well the first street as ever I performed in. It was off Gray's Inn, one of them quiet genteel streets, and when the mob began to gather round, I felt all overish and I turned my head to the frame instead of the people. We hadn't had no rehearsals aforehand, and I did the patter quite promiscuous. There was not much talk, to be sure, required then, and what little there was consisted merely in calling out the names of the figures as they came up, and these my master prompted me with from inside the frame. But little as there was for me to do, I know I never could have done it if it hadn't been for the spirits, the false spirits, you see, Note, a little drop of gin, end note, as my master gave me in the morning. The first time as ever I made my appearance in public, I collected as much as eight shillings, and my master said, after the performance was over, you'll do. You see, I was partly in livery, and looked a little bit decent-like. After this was over, I kept on going out with my master for two years, as I had agreed, 
and at the end of that time i had saved enough to start a show of my own i bought the show of old persini the man as first brought punch into the streets of england to be sure there was a woman over here with it before then her name was i can't think of it just now but she never performed in the streets so we consider persini as our real forefather it isn't much more nor seventy years since persini he was a wary old man when he died and blind showed the exhibition in the streets of london i've heard tell that old persini used to take very often as much as ten pounds a day and he used to sit down to his fowls and wine and the very best of everything like the first gentleman in the land indeed he made enough money at the business to be quite a tip-top gentleman that he did but he never took care of a halfpenny he got he was that independent that if he was wanted to perform sir he'd come at his time not yourn at last he reduced himself to want and died in st giles's workhouse ah poor fellow he oughtn't to have been allowed to die where he did after amusing the public for so many years every one in london knowed him lords dukes princes squires and wagabonds all used to stop to laugh at his performance and a funny clever old fellow he was he was past performing when i bought my show of him and very poor he was living in a coal-yard drury lane and had scarcely a bit of food to eat he had spent all he had got in drink and in treating friends ay any one no matter who he didn't study the world nor himself neither as fast as the money came it went and when it was gone why he'd go to work and get more his show was a very inferior one though it were the first nothing at all like them about now nothing near as good if you only had four sticks then it was quite enough to make plenty of money out of so long as it was punch i gave him thirty-five shillings for the stand figures and all i bought it cheap you see for it was thrown on one side and was of no use to any one but such as myself there was twelve figures and the other apparatus such as the gallows ladder horse bell and stuffed dog the characters was punch judy child beadle scaramouche nobody jack ketch the grand seigneur the doctor the devil there was no ghost used then mary andrew and the blind man these last two characters are quite done with now the heads of the characters was all carved in wood and dressed in the proper costume of the country there was at that time and is now a real carver for the punch business he was dear but very good and excellent his punchy's head was the best as i ever seed the nose and chin used to meet quite close together a set of new figures dressed and all would come to about fifteen pounds each head costs five shillings for the bare carving alone and every figure that we has takes at least a yard of cloth to dress him besides ornaments and things that comes very expensive a good show at the present time will cost three pounds odd for the stand alone that's including bays the frontispiece the back scene the cottage and the letter cloth or what is called the drop scene at the theatres in the old ancient style the back scene used to pull up and change into a jail scene but that's all altered now we've got more upon the comic business now and tries to do more with toby than with the prison scene the prison is what we calls the sentimental style formerly toby was only a stuffed figure it was pike who first hit upon introducing a live dog and a great hit it were it made a grand alteration in the exhibition for now the performance is called punch and toby as well there is one punch about the streets at present that tries it on with three dogs but that ain't much of a go too much of a good thing i calls it punch as i said before is a drama in two hats we don't drop the scene at the end of the first the drum and pipes strikes up instead the first act we consider to end with punch being taken to prison for the murder of his wife and child the great difficulty in performing punch consists in the speaking which is done by a call or whistle in the mouth such as this here note he then produced the call from his waistcoat pocket it was a small flat instrument made of two curved pieces of metal about the size of a knee buckle bound together with black thread between these was a plate of some substance apparently silk which he said was a secret 
The call, he told me, was tuned to a musical instrument and took a considerable time to learn. He afterwards took from his pocket two of the small metallic plates unbound. He said the composition they were made of was also one of the secrets of the profession. They were not tin nor zinc because both of them metals were poisons in the mouth and injurious to the constitution. End note. These calls, he continued, we often sell to gentlemen for a sovereign apiece and for that we give them a receipt how to use them. They ain't whistles but calls or unknown tongues as we sometimes name them because with them in the mouth we can pronounce each word as plain as any parson. We have two or three kinds, one for out of doors, one for indoors, one for speaking and for singing, and another for selling. I've sold many a one to gentlemen going along, so I generally keeps a hextra one with me. Porcini brought the calls into this country with him from Italy, and we who are now in the profession have all learned how to make and use them, either from him or those as he had taught them to. I learned the use of mine from Porcini himself. My master, whom I went out with at first, would never teach me, and was very particular in keeping it all secret from me. Persini taught me the call at the time I bought his show of him. I was six months in perfecting myself in the use of it. I kept practising away night and morning with it, until I got it quite perfect. It was no use trying at home, because it sounds quite different in the hope and hair. Often when I've made them at home, I'm obliged to take the calls to pieces after trying them out in the streets. They've been made upon too weak a scale. When I was practising, I used to go into the parks and fields and out of the way places, so as to get to know how to use it in the hope and hair. Now I'm reckoned one of the best speakers in the whole profession. When I made my first appearance as a regular performer of punch on my own account, I did feel uncommon nervous, to be sure. Though I knowed the people couldn't see me behind the bays, still I felt as if all the eyes of the country were upon me. It was as much as ever I could do to get the words out and keep the figures from shaking. When I struck up the first song, my voice trembled so as I thought I never should be able to get to the end of the first act. I soon, however, got over that there, and at present I would play before the whole bench of bishops as cool as a cucumber. We always have a partner now to play the drum and pipes and collect the money. This, however, is only a recent dodge. In older times we used to go about with a trumpet, that was Porcini's ancient style, but now that's stopped. Only Her Majesty's males may blow trumpets in the streets at present. The first person who went out with me was my wife. She used to stand outside and keep the boys from peeping through the bays, whilst I was performing behind it. And she used to collect the money afterwards as well. I carried the show and trumpet, and she the box. She's been dead these five years now. Take one week with another, all through the year, I should say I made then five pounds regular. I have taken as much as two pounds ten shillings in one day in the streets, and I used to think it a bad day's business at that time if I took only one pound. You can see Punch has been good work, a money-making business, and beat all mechanics right out. If I could take as much as I did when I first began, what must my forefathers have done? when the business was five times as good as ever it were in my time. Why, I leaves you to judge what old Porcini and Pike must have made. Twenty years ago, I have often and often got seven shillings and eight shillings for one exhibition in the streets. Two shillings and three shillings I used to think low to get at one collection, and many times I'd perform eight or ten times in a day. We didn't care much about work then, for we could get money fast enough. But now I often show twenty times in the day and get scarcely a bare living at it after all. That shows the times, you know, sir, what times was and is now. After performing in the streets of a day, we used to attend private parties in the evening and get sometimes as much as two pounds for the exhibition. This used to be at the juvenile parties of the nobility and the performance lasted about an hour and a half. For a short performance of half an hour at a gentleman's house, we never had less than one pound. A performance outside the house was two shillings and sixpence, but we often got as much as ten shillings for it. 
I have performed afore almost all the nobility. Lord Blank was particular partial to us, and one of our greatest patronisers. At the time of the police bill, I met him in Cheltenham on my travels, and he told me as he had saved Punch's neck once more, and it's through him principally that we are allowed to exhibit in the streets. Punch is exempt from the police act. If you read the act throughout, you won't find Punch mentioned in it. But all I've been telling you is about the business as it was. What it is, is a very different concern. A good day for us now seldom gets beyond five shillings, and that's between myself and my partner, who plays the drum and pipes. Often we are out all day and get a mere nothing. Many days we have been out and taken nothing at all. That's very common when we dwells upon hoarders. By dwelling on hoarders, I means looking out for gentlemen what wants us to play in front of their houses. When we strike up in the Hopin Street, we take upon a haverage, only threepence a show. In course we may do more, but that's about the sum, take one street performance with another. Them kind of performances is what we calls short showing. We gets the halfpence and hooks it. A long pitch is the name we gives to performances that lasts about half an hour or more. Them long pitches we confine solely to street corners in public thoroughfares, and then we take about a shilling upon a haverage, and more if it's to be got. We never turns away nothing. Boys, look up your fardens, says the outside man. It ain't half over yet. We'll show it all through. The short shows we do only in private by streets, and of them we can get through about twenty in the day. That's as much as we can tackle. Ten in the morning and ten in the afternoon. Of the long pitches we can only do eight in the day. We start on our rounds at nine in the morning and remain out till dark at night. We gets a snack at the publics on our road. The best hours for punch are in the morning from nine till ten, because then the children are at home. After that, you know, they goes out with the maids for a walk. From twelve till three is good again, and then from six till nine. That's because the children are mostly at home at them hours. We make much more by hoarders for performance outside the gentlemen's houses than we do by performing in public in the Hopin streets. Monday is the best day for street business. Friday is no day at all, because then the poor people has spent all their money. If we was to pitch on a Friday, we shouldn't take a halfpenny in the streets. So we in general on that day goes round for hoarders. Wednesday, Thursday and Friday is the best days for us with hoarders at gentlemen's houses. We do much better in the spring than at any other time in the year, excepting holiday time, at midsummer and Christmas. That's what we call punches season. We do most at evening parties in the holiday time. And if there's a pin to choose between them, I should say Christmas holidays was the best. For attending evening parties now, we generally get one pound and our refreshments, as much more as they like to give us. But the business gets slacker and slacker every season. Where I went to ten parties twenty years ago, I don't go to two now. People isn't getting tired of our performances, but stingier, that's it. Everybody looks at their money now afore they parts with it, and gentlefolks haggles and cheapens us down to shillings and sixpences, as if they was guineas in the holden time. Our business is very much like hackney coachwork. We do best in wet weather. It looks like rain this evening, and I'm uncommon glad on it, to be sure. You see, the wet keeps the children indoors all day, and then they want something to quiet them a bit and the mothers and fathers, to pacify the dears, gives us a hoarder to perform. It mustn't rain cats and dogs, that's as bad as no rain at all. What we likes is a regular, good, steady, scotch mist, for then we takes double what we takes on other days. In summer we does little or nothing, the children are out all day enjoying themselves in the parks. The best pitch of all in London is Leicester Square, there's all sorts of classes, you see, passing there. Then comes Regent Street. The corner of Burlington Street is uncommon good, and there's a good public in there besides. Bond Street ain't no good now. Oxford Street up by Old Cavendish Street, or Oxford Market, or Wells Street, are all favourite pitches for punch. 
We don't do much in the city. People has their heads all full of business there, and them as is greedy after the money ain't no friend of Punch's. Tottenham Court Road, the New Road, and all the environs of London is pretty good. Hampstead, though, ain't no good. They've got too poor there. I'd sooner not go at all than to Hampstead. Belgrave Square and all about that part is uncommon good. But when there's many chapels, Punch won't do at all. I did once, though, strike up opposition to a street preacher what was a holding forth in the new road, and did uncommon well. All his flock, as he called them, left him, and come over to look at me. Punch and preaching is two different creeds, opposition parties, I may say. We, in generally, walks from twelve to twenty mile every day, and carries the show, which weighs a good half hundred, at the least. After great exertion, our voice very often fails us, for speaking all day through the call is very tiring, especially when we are chirruping up so as to bring the children to the vendors. The boys is the greatest nuisances we has to contend with. Wherever we goes, we are sure of plenty of boys for a hindrance. But they've got no money, bother em, and they'll follow us for miles, so that we're often compelled to go miles to avoid them. Many parts is swarming with boys, such as Whitechapel, Spitalfields. That's the worst place for boys I ever come near. They're like flies in summer there, only much more thicker. I never shows my face within miles of them parts. Chelsea, again, has an uncommon lot of boys, and wherever we know the children swarm, there's the spots we makes a point of avoiding. Why, the boys is such a obstruction to our performance that often we are obliged to drop the curtain for em. They'll throw one another's caps into the frame while I'm inside on it. And do what we will, we can't keep em from poking their fingers through the bays and making holes to peep through. Then they will keep tapping the drum. But the worst of all is, the most of em ain't got a farthing to bless themselves with, and they will shove into the best places. Soldiers again we don't like, they've got no money. No, not even so much as pockets, sir. Nusses ain't no good. Even if the mothers of the dear little children has given em a penny to spend, why, the nusses takes it from em and keeps it for ribbons. Sometimes we can coax a penny out of the children, but the nusses knows too much to be gammoned by us. Indeed, servants in general don't do the thing what's right to us. Some is good to us, but the most of em will have poundage out of what we get. About sixpence out of every half-crown is what the footman takes from us. We in generally goes into the country in the summer time for two or three months. Watering places is very good in July and August. Punch mostly goes down to the seaside with the quality. Brighton, though, ain't no account. The pavilion's done up with, and therefore Punch has discontinued his visits. We don't put up at the trampers' houses in our travels, but in generally inns is where we stays, because we considers ourselves to be above the other showmen and mendicants. At one lodging house as I stopped at once in Warwick, there was as many as fifty staying there, what got their living by street performances. The greater part were Italian boys and girls. There are altogether as many as sixteen Punch and Judy frames in England. Eight of these is at work in London, and the other eight in the country. And to each of these frames there are two men. We are all acquainted with one another, are all sociable together, and know where each other is and what they are doing on. When one comes home, another goes out. That's the way we proceed through life. It wouldn't do for two to go to the same place. If two of us happen to meet at one town, we join and shift partners and share the money. One goes one way and one another, and we meet at night and reckon up over a sociable pint or a glass. We shift partners so as each may know how much the other has taken. It's the common practice for the man what performs punch to share with the one what plays the drum and pipes. Each has half what is collected. But if the partner can't play the drum and pipes, and only carries the frame and collects, then his share is but a third of what is taken, till he learns how to perform himself.
the street performers of london lives mostly in little rooms of their own he has generally wives and one or two children who are brought up to the business some lives about the westminster road and st george's east a great many are in lock's fields they are all the old school that way then some or rather the principal part of the showmen are to be found about lisson grove in this neighbourhood there is a house of call where they all assembles in the evening there are very few in brick lane spitalfields now that is mostly deserted by showmen the west end is the great resort of all for it's there the money lays and there the showmen abound we all know one another and can tell in what part of the country the others are we have intelligence by letters from all parts there's a punch i knows on now is either in the isle of man or on his way to it end of section nine Section 10 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 2. Punch, Part 2. Punch Talk. Bona parlare means language, name of patter. Uite mangiare, no food. Uite lente, no bed. Uete bivare, no drink. I've uete mangiare and uete bivare. And what's worse, uete lente. This is better than the coster's talk, because that ain't no slang at all. And this is a broken Italian, and much higher than the coster's lingo. We know what o'clock it is besides. Scene with two punchmen. How are you getting on? I might say to another punchman. Ultra cattiva, he'd say. If I was doing a little, I'd say, Bonner, let us have a shanta bivari, pot of beer. If we has a good pitch, we never tell one another, for business is business. If they know we've a bonner pitch, they'll oppose, which makes it bad. Co and co is our term for partner, or questa questa as well. Ultra cattiva, no bona. Slamaris, figures, frames, scenes, properties. Slum, call or unknown tongue. Ultra cativa slum, not a good call. Tambora, drum, that's Italian. Pipares, pipes. Questo homa, avarding the slum. Scaparit, orderly. There's someone a looking at the slum. Be off quickly. Fielia is a child. Homa is a man. Donna, a female. Charfering Homa, talking man, policeman. Policemen can't interfere with us, we are sanctioned. Punch is exempt out of the police act. Some's very good men, and some of them are tyrants. But generally speaking, they're all very kind to us, and allows us every privilege. That's a flattery, you know, because you'd better not meddle with them. Civility always gains its esteem. The man here took a large clasp knife out of his breeches pocket. This here knife is part of Punch's tools or materials, of great utility, for it cannot be done without. The knife serves for a hammer to draw nails and drive them in again, and is very handy on a country road to cut a beef steak. Not a mistake. Well, you cannot cut a mistake, can you? And is a real poor man's friend to a certainty. This here is the needle that completes our tools. Note, takes out a needle from inside his waistcoat collar. End note. And is used to sew up our cativa stumps. That is, Punch's breeches and Judy's petticoats and his master's old clothes when they're in holes. I likes to have everything tidy and respectable, not knowing where I'm going to perform to, for every day is a new day that we never see afore and shall never see again. We do not know the produce of this world, being luxuriant, that's moral, being humane, kind and generous to all our society of life. We men's our cativa and slums when they gets teary. If you was to show that to some of our line, they'd be horrified 
They can't talk so affluent, you know, in all kinds of black slums. Under the Hajaris, and we're no care, Vardaras Questa. Questa is a shirt, pronunciation for Questra Homa. Once too, when I was scarpering with my culling in the monkey, I went to Mandari the Katila slums in a churchyard, and sat down under the tombs to stitch him up a bit, thinking no one would varder us there. But Mr. Cruikshank took us off there as we was a-sitting. I know I'm the same party, cause Joe seen the print, you know, and drawed quite natural, as now in print, with the slumaries a-laying about on all the tombstones round us. THE PUNCHMAN AT THE THEATRE I often used when a youth to be very fond of plays and romances, and frequently went to theatres to learn knowledge, of which I think there is a great deal of knowledge to be learnt from those places. That gives the theatres a touch, helps them on a bit. I was very partial and fond of seeing Romo and Juliet, Othello, and the Knights of St. John, and the pretty gal of Peerless Pool, Macbeth and the Three Dancing Witches, Don Gurvarney pleased me best of all, though. What took me uncommon were the funeral processions of Juliet. It affects the heart and brings us to our natural feelings. I took my ghost from Romo and Juliet. The ghost comes from the grave, and it's beautiful. I used to like Keane, the principal performer. Oh, admirable, most admirable he were, and especially in Othello, for then he was like my Jim Crow here and was always a great friend and supporter of his old friend, Punch. Othello murders his wife, you know, like Punch does. Othello kills her, cause the green-eyed monster has got into his art, and he being so extremely fond on her. But Punch kills hisn by accident, though he did not intend to do it, for the act of Parliament against husbands beating wives was not known in his time. A most excellent law that there, for it causes husbands and wives to be kind and natural one with the other, all through the society of life. Judy irritates her husband Punch, for to strike the fatal blow, which at the same time, fifth no intention to commit it, not knowing at the same time, being rather out of his mind, what he was about. I hope this here will be a good example both to men and wives, always to be kind and obliging to each other and that will help them through the mainder with peace and happiness, and will rest in peace with all mankind. That's moral. It must be well worded, you know. That's my beauty. Mr. Punch's Refreshment Always Mr. Punch, when he performs to any nobleman's juvenile parties, he requires a little refreshment and spirits before commencing, because the performance will go far superior. But where teetotalers is, he plays very mournful, and they don't have the best parts of the dramatical performance, cause Pump Vatter gives a person no heart to exhibit his performance, where if any spirits is given to him, he would be sure to give the best of satisfaction. I likes where I goes to perform for the gentleman, to ring the bell, and say to the butler to bring this here party up whatever he chooses. But Punch is always moderate, he likes one eye wetted, then the t'other after. But he likes the best, not particular to brandy, for fear of his nose of fading, and afeard of his losing the colour. All theatrical people, and even the great Edmund Keen, used to take a drop before commencing performance, and Punch must do the same, for it enlivens his spirits, cheers his heart up, and enables him to give the best of satisfaction imaginable. The History of Punch There are hopperas and romances. A romance is far different to a hoppera, you know, for one is interesting and the other is dull and void of apprehension. The romance is the interesting one, and of the two I likes it the best. But let every one speak as they find, that's moral. Jack Shepherd, you know, is a romance, and a fine one. But Punch is a hoppera, a hoproar we calls it, and the most pleasing and most interesting of all as was ever produced. Punch never was beat and never will, being the oldest performance for many hundred years, and now handed down to prosperity. There's a fine moral in it too. The history or origination of Punch, never put yourself out of your way for me, I'm one of the happiest men in existence and gives no trouble, 
is taken from Italy and brought over to England by Porcini, and exhibited in the streets of London for the first time from sixty to seventy years ago, though he was not the first man who exhibited, for there was a female here before him, but not to perform at all in public. Name unknown, but handed down to prosperity. She brought the figures and frame over with her, but never showed them, keeping it an unknown secret. Porcini came from Italy and landed in England and exhibited his performance in the streets of London and realised an immense sum of money. Porcini always carried a rum bottle in his pocket, cause Punch is a rum fellow, you see, and he's very fond of rum, and drank out of this unbeknown behind the bays afore he went into the frame so that it should lay in his power to give the audience a most excellent performance. He was a man as gave the greatest satisfaction, and he was the first man that brought a street organ into England from Italy. His name is handed down to prosperity among all classes of society in life. At first, the performance was quite different then to what it is now. It was all sentimental then, and very touching to the feelings, and full of good morals. The first part was only made up of the killing of his wife and babby, and the second with the execution of the hangman and killing of the devil. That was the original drama of Punch, handed down to prosperity for 800 years. The killing of the devil makes it one of the most moral plays as is, for it stops Satan's career of life, and then we can all do as we likes afterwards. Porcini lived like the first nobleman in the land and realised an immense deal of money during his lifetime. We all considered him to be our forefather. He was a very old man when he died. I've heard tell he used to take very often as much as ten pounds a day, and now it's come down to little more than ten pence. And he used to sit down to his fowls and wine and the very best of luxuriousness, like the first nobleman in the world such as a bottle of wine, and etc. At last he reduced himself to want, and died in the workhouse. Ah, poor fellow, he didn't ought to have been let die where he did. But misfortunes will happen to all, that's moral. Everyone in London knowed him, lords, dukes, squires, princes, and wagabonds. All used to stop and laugh at his pleasing and very interesting performance. And a funny old fellow he was, and so fond of his snuff. His name is writ in the annals of history, and handed down as long as grass grows and water runs. For when grass ceases to grow, you know, and water ceases to run, this world will be no utility. That's moral. Pike, the second noted street performer of Punch, was Persini's apprentice, and he succeeded him after his career. He is handed down as a most clever exhibitor of punch and showman, cause he used to go about the country with wagons too. He exhibited the performance for many years and at last came to decay and died in the workhouse. He was the first inventor of the live dog called Toby and a great invention it was, being a great undertaking of a new and excellent addition to Punch's performance. That's well worded. We must place the words in a superior manner to please the public. Then if, as you see, all our forefathers went to decay and died in the workhouse, what prospect have we to look forward to before us, at the present time, but to share the same fate, unless we meet with sufficient encouragement in this life? But hoping it will not be so, knowing that there is a new generation and a new exhibition, we hope the public at large will help and assist, and help us to keep our head above water, so that we shall never float down the River Thames, to be picked up, carried in a shell, coroner's inquest held, taken to the workhouse, popped into the pit hole. And there's an end to another poor old punch. That's moral. A footman is far superior to a showman, cause a showman is held to be of low degrade, and are thought as such, and so circumstantiated as to be looked upon as a mendicant. But still we are not, for collecting ain't begging, it's only soliciting. Cause Parsons, you know, I gives them a rub here, preaches a sermon, and collects at the doors. So I puts myself on the same footing as they. That's moral, and it's optional, you know. If I takes a hat round, they has a plate, 
and they get sovereigns where we has only browns. But we are thankful for all, and always look for encouragement, and hopes kind support from all classes of society in life. Punch has two kinds of performances, short shows and long ones, according to Denari. Short shows are for Cativa Denari, and long pitches for the Bona Denari. At the short shows we get the Haypence and Steps It, Scafari as we say, and at the long pitches we keeps it up for half an hour or an hour maybe, not particular, if the Browns tumble in well, for we never leave off while there's a major soldi, that's a halfpenny, or even a quarterine, that's a farden, to be made. The long pitches we fixes at the principal street corners of London. We never turn away nothing. Boys, look up your fardens, says the outside man. It ain't half over yet, and we'll show it all through. Punch is like the income tax gatherer, takes all we can get, and never turns away nothing. That is our moral. Punch is like the rest of the world. He has got bad morals, but very few of them. The showman inside the frame says, while he's a-working the figures, Cully, how are you a-getting on? Very inferior indeed, I'm sorry to say, master. The company, though very respectable, seems to have no pence among em. What quanta denari have you chaffered, I say? Soldi major quarterine, that means three halfpence, three fardens. That is all I have accumulated amongst this most respectable and numerous company. Never mind, master, the showman will go on. Try the generosity of the public once again. Well, I think it's of very little utility to collect round again, for I've met with that poor encouragement. Never mind, master, show away. I'll go round again and chance my luck. The ladies and gentlemen have not seen sufficient, I think. Well, master, I've got tres major, that is, three halfpence, more, and now it's all over this time. Boys, go home and say your prayers, we says, and steps it. Such scenes of life we see, no person would hardly credit what we go through. We travel often, yuete manjare, note, no food, end note. And oftentimes we are in fluence, according as luck runs. We now principally dwells on orders at noblemen's houses. The suburbs of London pays us far better than the busy town of London. When we are dwelling on orders, we goes along the streets, chirruping. Rutu erovi, oe, oe, oerovi. That means, any more wanted? That's the pronunciation of the call in the old Italian style. Trove turu, 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 turui. That we does when we are dwelling for orders mostly at noblemen's houses. It brings the juveniles to the window and causes the greatest of attractions to the children of noblemen's families, both rich and poor, lords, dukes, earls and squires and gentlefolks. Call hunting, that's another term for dwelling on orders, pays better than pitching. But orders is very casual, and pitching is a certainty. We are sure of a brown or two in the streets, and noblemen's work don't come often. We must have it authentic, for we travels many days and don't succeed in getting one. At other times we are more fluent, but when both combine together, it's merely a living, after all said and done, by great exertion and hard perseverance and acidity. For the business gets slacker and slacker every year, and I expect at last it will come to the dogs, not Toby, because he is dead and gone. People isn't getting tired with our performances. They're more delighted than ever, but they're stingier. Everybody looks twice at their money afore they parts with it. That's a rub at the mean ones, and they wants it uncommon bad. And then sometimes the blinds is all drawed down on account of the sun, and that cooks our goose. Or it's too hot for people to stop and varder, that means see. In the cold days when we pitch, people stops a few minutes, drops their browns, and goes away about their business to make room for more. The spring of the year is the best of the four seasons for us. A sailor, and alas, half seas over, we like best of all. He will tip his mag, 
we always insure a few pence and sometimes a shilling of them we are fond of sweeps too they're a sure brown if they've got one and they'll give before many a gentleman but what we can't abide no how is the shabby genteel them ultra cativa and no mistake for they'll stand with their mouths wide open like a nutcracker and is never satisfied and is too grand even to laugh it's too much trouble to carry halfpence, and they've never no change or else they'd give us some in fact they've no money at all they wants it all for and so on mr punch's figures this is punch this his wife judy they never was married not for this eight hundred years in the original drama it is a drama in two acts is punch there was a miss polly and she was punch's mistress and dressed in silks and satins judy catches punch with her and that there causes all the disturbance ah it's a beautiful history there's a deal of morals with it and there's a large volume wrote about it it's to be got now this here is judy their only child she's three years old come to-morrow and heir to all his estate which is only a saucepan without a handle well then i brings out the beadle punch's nose is the hornament to his face it's a great value and the hump on his back is never to be got rid on being born with him and never to be done without punch was silly and out of his mind which is in the drama and the cause of his throwing his child out of winder which he did judy went out and left him to nurse the child and the child gets so terrible cross he gets out of patience and tries to sing a song to it and ends by chucking it into the street punch is cunning and up to all kinds of antics if he ain't out of his mind artful like my opinion of punch is he's very eccentric with good and bad morals attached very good he was in regard to benevolence because you see in the olden style there was a blind man and he used to come and ax charity of him and punch used to pity him and give him a trifle you know this is in the olden style from persini you know the carving on his face is a great art and there's only one man as does it regular his nose and chin by meeting together we thinks the great beauty oh he's admirable he was very fond of hisself when he was alive his name was punchinello and we calls him punch that's partly for short and partly on account of the boys for they calls it punch in hell -o. oh there's punch in hell they'd say and gentle folks don't like to hear them words punch has very small legs and small arms it's quite out of portion on course but still it's nature for folks with big bellies generally has thin pins of their own his dress has never been altered the use of his high hat is to show his half foolish head and the other parts is after the best olden fashion judy you see is very ugly she represents punch cause you see if the two comes together it generally happens that they're summat alike and you see it's because his wife were so ugly that he had a mistress you see a head like that there wouldn't please most people the mistress polly dances with punch just like a lady in a drawing-room there ain't no grievance between him and judy on account of miss polly as she's called that's the olden style of all cause judy don't know nothing about it miss polly was left out because it wasn't exactly moral opinions has changed we ain't better i fancy such things goes on but people don't like to let it be seen now that's the difference judy's dress you see is far different bless you than miss polly's judy's you see is bed furniture stuff and polly's all silk and satin yes that's the way of the world the wife comes off second best the baby's like his father he's his pet all over and the pride of his heart wouldn't take all the world for it you know though he does throw him out of the window he's got his father's nose and is his daddy all over from the top of his head to the tip of his toe he never was weaned punch you know is so red through drink he'd look nothing if his nose were not deep scarlet punch used to drink hard one time and so he does now if he can get it 
his babby is read all the same to correspond. This is the beadle of the parish, which tries to quell all disturbances, but finds it impossible to do it. The beadle has got a very reddish nose. He is a very severe, harsh man, but Punch conquers him. You see, he's dressed in the olden style, a brown coat with gold lace and cocked hat and all. He has to take Punch up for killing his wife and babby, but Punch beats the beadle, for every time he comes up, he knocks him down. This next one is the merry clown, what tries his rig with Punch up and down. That's a rhyme, you see. This is the merry clown that tries his tricks all round. This here's the new style, for we dwells more on the comical now. In the olden time we used to have a scaramouche with a chalk head. He used to torment Punch and dodge him about, till at last Punch used to give him a crack on the head and smash it all to pieces, and then cry out, Oh dear, oh dear, I didn't go to do it. It was an accident done on purpose. But now we do with Clown and the Sausages. Scaramouche never talked, only did the bally business, dumb motions. But the Clown speaks theatrical, comic business and sentimental. Punch being silly and out of his mind, the Clown persuades Punch that he wants something to eat. The Clown gets into the public house to try what he can steal. He pokes his head out of the window and says, Here you are, here you are and then he asks Punch to give him a helping hand, and so makes Punch steal the sausages. They are the very best pork wadding sausages, made six years ago and warranted fresh, and will keep forever. This here's the poker, about which the clown says, Would you like something hot? Punch says, Yes. And then the clown burns Punch's nose, and sits down on it himself and burns his breeches. Oh, it's a jolly lark when I shows it. Clown says to Punch, don't make a noise, you'll wake the landlord up. The landlord, you see, pretends to be asleep. Clown says, you mustn't holler. No, says Punch, I won't. And still he hollers all the louder. This is Jim Crow. You see, he's got a chain, but he's lost his watch. He let it fall on Fish Street Hill the other day and broke it all to pieces. He's a nigger. He says, me like everybody. Not every, but every, cause that's nigger. Instead of Jim Crow, we used formerly to show the Grand Turk of Sinoa, called Shalabala. Sinoa is nowhere, for he's only a substance, you know. I can't find Sinoa, although I've tried, and thinks it's at the bottom of the sea, where the black fish lays. Jim Crow sprung from rice, from America. He brought it over here. Then, you see, being a novelty, all classes of society is pleased. Everybody liked to hear Jim Crow sung, and so we had to do it. The people used to stand round, and I used to take some good money with it too, sir, on Hay Hill. Everybody's funny nowadays, and they like comic business. They won't listen to anything sensible or sentimental, but they want foolishness. The bigger fool gets the most money. Many people says... What a fool you must look! At that I put my head back. Come on, I shan't. I shall stop a little longer. This is the ghost that appears to Punch for destroying his wife and child. She's the ghost of the two together, or else by rights there ought to be a little ghost as well, but we should have such a lot to carry about. But Punch, being surprised at the ghost, falls into hysterics, represented as such. Punch is really terrified, for he trembles like a haspen leaf, cause he never killed his wife. He's got no eyes and no teeth, and can't see out of his mouth, or cannot, rather. Them can't words ain't grammatical. When Punch sees the ghost, he lays down and kicks the bucket, and represents he's dead. The ghost is very effective, when it comes up very solemn and mournful like in Romo and Juliet. I took it from that, you know. There's a ghost in that when she comes out of the grave. Punch sits down on his seat and sings his merry song of olden times and don't see the ghost till he gets a tap on the cheek and then he thinks it's somebody else. Instead of that, when he turns round, he's most terrible alarmed, putting his arms up and out. The drum goes very shaky when the ghost comes up. 
a little bit of the dead march in Saul, or home sweet home, anything like that, slow. We none on us likes to be hurried to the grave. I now takes up the doctor. This is the doctor that cures all sick mates, and says, Taste of my drugs before you die. You'll say they are well made. The doctor always wears a white ermine wig. Rabbit skin wouldn't do. We can't go so common as that. It's most costly, cause it was made for him. After the ghost has appeared, Punch falls down, and calls loudly for the doctor, and offers fifty thousand pounds for one. Then the doctor feels his pulse and says, Very unfortunate misfortune. I have forgot my spectacles, cause I never had none. I can see all through it. The man's not dead. The doctor gives Punch physic. That's stick licorice, what he subscribes for him. But Punch don't like it though it's a capital subscription for a cure for the headache. I dare say, Mr. Mayhew, sir, you thinks me a very funny fellow. Punch tries to pay the doctor back with his own physic, but he misses him every time. Doctors don't like to take their own stuff anyhow. This is the publican, as Punch steals the sausages from. He used to be the Grand Turk of Sanoa, or Shalabala, afore the fashion changed. For a new world always wants new things. The people are like babies. They must have a fresh toy, you know. And every day is a new day that we never see it before. There's a moral for you. It'll make a beautiful book when you comes to have the morals explained. You see, you might still fancy Punch was the Grand Turk, for he's got his moustaches still. But they're getting so fashionable that even the publicans wear them, so it don't matter. This tall figure is the hangman and finisher of the law, as does the business in the twinkling of a bedpost. He's like the income tax gatherer. He takes all in and lets none out, for a guilty conscience needs no accusing. Punch being condemned to suffer by the laws of his country makes a mistake for once in his life, and always did, and always will, keep a doing it. Therefore, by cunningness and artfulness, Punch persuades Jack Ketch to show him the way, which he very willingly doeth, to slip his head into the noose, when Punch takes the opportunity to pull the rope after he has shown him the way, and is exempt for once more, and quite free. Now, this is the coffin, and this is the pall. Punch is in a great way, after he's hung the man, for assistance, when he calls his favourite friend, Joey Grimaldi, the clown, to aid and assist him, because he's afeard that he'll be taken for the crime what he's committed. Then the body is placed in the coffin, but as the undertaker ain't made it long enough, they'll have to double him up. The undertaker requests permission to get it altered. You see, it's a royal coffin, with gold and silver and copper nails, with no plates and scarlet cloth, cause that's royalty. The undertakers forgot the lid of the coffin, you see. We don't use lids, cause it makes them lighter to carry. This is the pall that covers him over, to keep the flies from biting him. We call it St. Paul's. Don't you see? Paul's and Paul's is the same word, with an S to it. It's comic. That'd make a beautiful play, that would. Then we take out the figures, as I am doing now, from the box, and they exaunt with a dance. Here's somebody a-coming, make haste, the clown says, and then they exaunt, you know, or go off. This here is the scaramouche that dances without a head, and yet has got a head that'll reach from here to St. Paul's, but it's scarcely ever to be seen, cause his father was my mother, don't you see? Punch says that it's a beautiful figure. I've only made it lately. Instead of him, we used to have a nobody. The figure is to be worked with four heads. That's to say, one coming out of each arm, one from the body, and one from the neck. Note, he touches each part as he speaks. End note. Scaramouche is old-fashioned, newly revived. He comes up for a finish, you know. This figure's all for dancing, the same as the ghost is, and don't say nothing. Punch, being surprised to see such a thing, don't know what to make on it. 
he bolts away for you see note whispering and putting up two hands first and then using the other as if working scaramouche end note i want my two hands to work him after punch goes away the figure dances to amuse the public then he exaunts and punch comes up again for to finish the remainder part of his performance he sings as if he'd forgot all that's gone before and wishes only to amuse the public at large that's to show his silliness and simplicity he sings comic or sentimental such as god save the queen that's sentimental or getting upstairs and playing on the fiddle or dusty bob or rory o'more with the chill off them's all comic but the queen's sentimental this here is satan we might say the devil but that ain't right and gentlefolk don't like such words he is now commonly called spring-heeled jack or the russian bear that's since the war you see he's chained up forever for if you read it says somewhere in the scripture that he's bound down for two thousand years i used to read it myself once and the figure shows you that he's chained up never to be let loose no more he comes up at the last and shows himself to punch but it ain't continued long you know the figure being too frightful for people to see without being frightened unless we are on comic business and showing him as spring-heeled jack or the russian bear for then we keeps him up a long time punch kills him puts him on the top of his stick and cries hooray the devil's dead and we can all do as we like good-bye farewell and it's all over but the curtain don't come down cause we haven't got none this here's the bell stop a minute i forgot this is punch's comic music commonly called a pianer sixty not pianer forty cause punch wants something out of the common way and it plays fifty tunes all at once this is the bell which he uses to rattle in the publican's ears when he's asleep and wakes his children all up after the nuss has put him to bed all this is to show his foolishness and simplicity for it's one of his foolish tricks and frolics for to amuse himself but he's a chap as won't stand much nonsense from other people because his morals are true just right and sound although he does kill his wife and baby knock down the beadle jack ketch and the grand seignior and puts an end to the very devil himself end of section ten section eleven of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part three punch part three description of frame and proscenium ladies and gents the man says outside the show afore striking up i'm now going to exhibit a performance worthy of your notice and far superior to anything you ever had a opportunity of witnessing of before i am a-doing it now sir as if i was addressing a company of ladies and gentlemen he added by way of parenthesis this is the original performance of punch ladies and gents and it will always gain esteem i am going to introduce a performance worthy of your notice which is the dramatical performance of the original and old established performance of punch experienced many year i merely call your attention ladies and gents to the novel attraction which i am now going to introduce to you i only merely place this happy ratus up to inform you what i am about to perform to you the performance will continue for upwards of one hour, provising as we meet with sufficient encouragement. That's business, you know, Master. Just to give him to understand that we want a little assistance afore we begins. It will surpass anything you've had the opportunity of witnessing of before in all the annuals of history i hope ladies and gents i am not talking too grammatical for some of you that there is the address sir 
he continued, what I always gives to the audience outside before I begins to perform, just to let the respectable company know that I am a-working for to get my living by honest industry. Those ladies and gents, he then went on, as if addressing an imaginary crowd, what are a-standing round a-looking at the performance will, I hope, be as willing to give as they is to see. There's many a lady and gent now at the present moment standing around me, perhaps, whose hearts might be good, though not in their power. This is Punchy's patter, you know, outside, and when you has to say all that yourself, you wants the affluency of a Methodist parson to do the talk, I can tell you. Now, boys, look up your hapence. Who's got a farden or a hapenny? And I'll be the first brown towards it. I ain't particular if it's a half crown. Now, my lads, feel in your pocket and see if you've got an odd copper. Here's one. And who'll be the next to make it even? We means to show it all through. Provising we meets with sufficient encouragement. I always sticks to them words, sufficient encouragement. You'll have the pleasure of seeing spring Heel Jack, or the Russian Bear, and the comical scene with Joy the Clown, and the frying pan of sausages. That's a kind of gaggery. I'll now just explain to you, sir, the different parts of the frame. This here's the letter cloth, which shows you all what we performs. Sometimes we has wrote on it, the Dominion of Fancy, or Punch's Opera. That fills up a letter cloth. And Punch is a fancy for every person you know, whoever may fancy it. I stands inside here on this footboard, and if there's anyone up at the windows in the street, I puts my foot long ways, so as to keep my knob out of sight. This here is the stage front, or proceedings, note proscenium, end note and is painted over with flags and banners, or any different things. Sometimes there's George and the Dragging, and the Royal Queen's Arms. We can have them up when we like, cause we are sanctioned, and I've played afore the Royal Princes. But anything for freshness. People's tired of looking at the Royal Arms, and want something new to cause attraction, and so on. This here's the playboard, where sits Punch. The scenes behind are representing a garden scene, and the side scenes is a house and a cottage, therefore the exeunts, you know, just for convenience. The back scene draws up and shows the prison, with the windows all cut out, and the bars showing, the same as there is to a jail. Though I never was in one in my life, and I'll take good care I never shall be. Our speaking instrument is an unknown secret, cause it's an unknown tongue that's known to none except those in our own profession. It's a instrument like this which I has in my hand, and it's tuned to music. We has two or three kinds, one for outdoors, one for indoors, one for speaking, one for singing, and one that's good for nothing except selling on the cheap. They ain't whistles but calls or unknown tongues, and with them in the mouth we can pronounce each word as plain as a parson, and with as much affluency. The great difficulty in performing punch consists in speaking with this call in the mouth, cause it's produced from the lungs. It's all done from there, and is a great strain and requires suction, and that's brandy and water, or summit to moisten the whistle with. We're bound not to drink water by our profession, when we can get anything stronger. It weakens the nerves, but we always like to keep in the bounds of propriety, respectability, and decency. I drinks my beer with my call in my mouth and never takes it out, cause it exposes it and the boys, hang em, is so inquisitive. They runs after us and looks up in our face to see how we speaks, but we drives em away with civility. Punch is a dramatical performance, sir, in two acts, patronised by the nobility and gentry at large. We don't drop the scene at the end of the first act, the drum and pipe strikes up instead. The first act we consider to end with Punch being took to prison for the murder of his wife and baby. You can pick out a good many Punch performers without getting one so well versed as I am in it. They in general make such a muffing concern of it. 
a drama or dramatical performance, we calls it, of the original performance of Punch. It ain't a tragedy. It's both comic and sentimental, in which way we think proper to perform it. There's comic parts, as with The Clown and Jim Crow, etc. That's including a deal more, you know. It's a pretty play, Punches, when performed well, and one of the greatest novelties in the world, and most ancient, handed down too for many hundred years. The prison scene and the baby is what we calls the sentimental touches. Some folks where I performs will have it most sentimental in the original style. Them families is generally sentimental themselves. To these sentimental folks, I'm obliged to perform very steady and very slow. They won't have no ghost, no coffin and no devil. And that's what I call spiling the performance entirely. Ha <laughs> ha, he added with a deep sigh. It's the march of intellect that's a-doing all this, it is, sir. Other folks is all for the comic, especially the street people. And then we has to dwell on the bell scene and the nursing the baby and the frying pan and the sausages and Jim Crow. A few years ago, Toby was all the go. Formerly, the dog was only a stuffed figure and it was Mr. Pike what first hit upon introducing a live animal and a great hit it were. It made a surprising alteration in the exhibition for till lately the performance was called Punch and Toby as well. We used to go about the streets with three dogs, and that was admirable, and it did uncommon well as a new novelty at first. But we can't get three dogs to do it now. The mother of them dogs, you see, was a singer, and had two pups what was singers too. Toby was wanted to sing and smoke a pipe as well, shake hands as well as seize Punch by the nose. When Toby was quiet, you see, sir, it was the timidation of Punch's stick, for directly he put it down, he flew at him knowing at the same time that Punch was not his master. Punch commences with a song. He does Rooturui and sings The Lass of Gowrie down below. And then he comes up saying, Oh, yes, I'm coming. How do you do, ladies and gents? Ladies always first. And then he bows many times. I'm so happy to see you, he says. You're most obedient, most humble and dutiful servant, Mr. Punch. You see, I can talk as affluent as can be with the call in my mouth. Hooey! I wish you all well, Tommy! Then Punch says to the drum and pipes man, as he puts his hand out, How do you do, master? Play up! Play up a hornpipe! I'm a most excellent dancer! And then Punch dances. Then you see him a-dancing the hornpipe, and after that, Punch says to the pipes, Master, I shall call my wife up and have a dance. So he sings out, Judy, Judy, my pretty creature, come upstairs, my darling, I want to speak to you. And he knocks on the playboard, Judy, here she comes, bless her little heart. Enter Judy. Punch. What a sweet creature! What a handsome nose and chin! He pats her on the face very gently. Judy, slapping him. Keep quiet, do! Punch. Don't be cross, my dear, but give me a kiss! Judy. Oh, to be sure, my love. They kiss. Punch. Bless your sweet lips! Hugging her. This is melting moments! I'm very fond of my wife! We must have a dance! Judy. Agreed! They both dance. Punch. Get out of the way! You don't dance well enough for me! He hits her on the nose. Go and fetch the baby! And mind and take care of it! And not hurt it! Judy exons. Judy returning back with baby. Take care of the baby while I go and cook the dumplings. Punch, striking Judy with his right hand. Get out of the way! I'll take care of the baby! Judy exults. Punch sits down and sings to the baby. Hush my baby up on the treetop Where the wind blows the cradle will rock Where the bell breaks the cradle will fall There comes the baby and cradle and all Baby cries. Punch shaking it. What a cross boy! 
he lays it down on the playboard and rolls it backwards and forwards to rock it to sleep and sings again Punch continues rocking the child. It still cries, and he takes it up in his arms, saying, What a cross child! I can't bear cross children! Then he vehemently shakes it, and knocks its head up against the side of the proceedings several times, representing to kill it, and he then throws it out of the window. Enter Judy. Judy, where's the baby? Punch, in a lemon-colly tone, Lamentation of Judy for the loss of her dear child. She goes into asterisks, and then excites, and fetches a cudgel, and commences beating Punch over the head. Punch. Don't be cross, my dear. I didn't go to do it. Judy. I'll pay her for throwing the child out of the window. She keeps on giving him knocks off the head, but Punch snatches the stick away and commences an attack upon his wife, and beats her severely. Judy, I'll go to the constable and have you locked up. Punch, go to the devil! I don't care where you go! Get out of the way! Judy exults, and Punch then sings, Cherry Ripe, or Cheer Boys Cheer. All before is sentimental. Now this here's comic. Punch goes through his rututurui, and then the beetle comes up. Beetle. Hi, hello, my boy. Punch. Hello, my boy. He gives him a wipe over the head with his stick, which knocks him down, but he gets up again. Beetle. Do you know, sir, that I've a special order in my pocket to take you up? Punch. I know I have a special order to knock you down. He knocks him down with simplicity, but not with brutality for the juvenile branches don't like to see severity practised. Beetle, coming up again. Do you know, my boy, that I've an order to take you up? Punch. I know I've an order, I tell you, to knock you down. He sticks him. Punch is a tyrant to the beetle, you know, and if he was took up, he wouldn't go through his rambles, so in course he isn't. Beetle. I've a warrant for you, my boy. Punch, striking him. The beetle's a determined man, you know, and resolved to go to the ends of justice as far as possible in his power by special authority, so a quarrel ensues between them. Beetle. You are a blackguard! Punch. So are you! The beetle hits Punch on the nose and takes the law in his own hands. Punch takes it up momentary, strikes the beetle, and a fight ensues. The beetle, faint and exhausted, gets up once more. Then he strikes Punch over the nose, which is returned pro and con. Beetle. That's a good un. Punch. That's a better. Beetle. That's a topper. He hits him jolly hard. Punch with his cudgel. That's a whooper. He knocks him out of his senses and the beetle exunts. Enter Merry Clown. Punch sings getting upstairs in quick time while the clown is coming up. Clown dances round Punch in all directions, and Punch, with his cudgel, is determined to catch him if possible. Clown. No, bon, no, allez tout de suite, monsieur. Look at the sharp. Make haste. Catch him alive. Here we are. How are you? Good morning. Don't you wish you may get it? Ah, coward. Strike a white man. Clown keeps bobbing up and down and Punch trying to hit all the time, till Punch is exhausted nearly. The clown, you see, sir, is the best friend to Punch. He carries him through all his tricks, and he's a great favourite of Punch's. He's too cunning for him, though, and knows too much for him, so they both shake hands and make it up. Clown. Now it's all fair, ain't it, Punch? Punch. Yes. Clown. Now I can begin again. You see, sir, 
the clown gets over punch altogether by his artful ways and then he begins the same tricks over again that is if we want a long performance if not we cuts it off at the other pint but i'm telling you the real original style sir clown good you can't catch me punch gives him one whack of the head and clown exons or goes off enter jim crow jim sings buffalo gals while coming up and on entering punch hits him a whack of the nose backhanded and almost breaks it jim what for you do that me nigger me like the white man him did break my nose punch humbly beg your pardon i did not go to help it for as it had been done you know it wasn't likely he could help it after he'd done it he couldn't take it away from him again could he jim me beg you the pardon for you see sir he thinks he's offended punch never mind punch come and sit down and we'll have a song jim crow prepares to sing punch bravo jimmy sing away my boy give us a stunner while you're at it jim sings i'm an owner on the fiddle down in the old virginny and i plays it scientific like master paganini punch tapping him on the head bravo well done jimmy give us another bit of a song jim yes me will sings again oh lovely rosa sambo come don't you hear the banjo tum 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 jim hits punch with his head over the nose as if butting at him while he repeats tum 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 punch offended beats him with the stick and sings lovely rosa sambo come don't you hear the banjo tum 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 jim rising oh me what for you strike a nigger holding up his leg me will poke your eye out ready shoot bang fire shoves his leg into punch's eye punch he's poked my eye out i'll look out for him for the future jim crow excites or exonts exont we call it in our profession sir that's going away you know he's done his part you know and ain't to appear again judy has died through punch's ill usage after going for the beadle for if she'd done so before she couldn't have fetched the constable you know certainly not the beholders only believe her to be dead though for she comes to life again afterwards because if she was dead it would do away with punch's wife altogether for punch is dotingly fond of her though it's only his fun after all said and done the ghost you see is only a representation as a timidation to soften his bad morals so that he shouldn't do the like again the ghost to be sure shows that she's really dead for a time but it's not in the imitation for if it was judy's ghost the figure would be made like her the babby's lost altogether it's killed it is supposed to be destroyed entirely but taken care of for the next time when called upon to perform as if it were in the next world you know that's moral enter ghost punch sings meanwhile home sweet home this is original the ghost represents the ghost of judy because he's killed his wife don't you see the ghost making her appearance but punch don't know it at the moment still he sits down tired and sings in the corner of the frame the song of home sweet home while the spirit appears to him punch turns round sees the ghost and is most terribly intimidated he begins to shiver and shake in great fear bringing his guilty conscience to his mind of what he's been guilty of doing and at last he falls down in a fit of frenzy kicking screeching hollering and shouting fifty thousand pounds for a doctor then he turns on his side and draws himself double with the scrumatics in his gills ghost excites enter doctor punch is represented to be dead this is the dying speech of punch doctor dear me bless my heart here have i been running as fast as ever i could walk and very near tumbled over a straw i heard somebody call most lustily for a doctor dear me looking at punch in all directions and examining his body 
This is my particular friend, Mr. Punch. Poor man, how pale he looks. I'll feel his pulse. Count his pulse. One, two, fourteen, nine, eleven. Hi, Punch, Punch, are you dead? Are you dead? Are you dead? Punch, hitting him with his right hand over the nose and knocking him back. Yes! Doctor, rubbing his nose with his hand. I never heard a dead man speak before. Punch, you are not dead. Punch, oh yes I am. Doctor, how long have you been dead? Punch, about six weeks. Doctor, oh you're not dead, you're only poorly. I must fetch you a little reviving medicine, such as some stick licorice and balsam and extract of shillelagh. Punch, rising. Make haste! He gives the doctor a wipe on the nose. Make haste and fetch it! Doctor, excellence. Punch. The doctor going to get me some physic. I'm very fond of brandy and water and rum punch. I want my physic. The doctor never brought me no physic at all. I wasn't ill. It was only my fun. Doctor reappears with the physic stick and he whacks Punch over the head, no harder than he is able, and cries, There's physic, 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 pills, balsam, stick licorice. Punch, rising and rubbing his head against the wing. Yes, it is stick licorice. Ah, it's a pretty play, sir, when it's showed well, that it is. It's delightful to read the morals. I am very fond of reading the morals, I am. Punch, taking the stick from the doctor. Now I'll give you physic! 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 He strikes at the doctor, but misses him every time. The doctor don't like his own stuff! Punch, presenting his stick, gun fashion, at doctor's head. I'll shoot you! One, two, three! Doctor, closing with Punch. Come to jail along with me! He saves his own life by closing with Punch. He's a desperate character, is Punch, though he means no harm, you know. A struggle ensues, and the doctor calls for help, Punch being too powerful for him. Doctor, come to jail. You shall repent for all your past misdeeds. Help! Assistance! Help! In the Queen's name! He's acting as a constable, the doctor is, though he's no business to do it, but he's acting in self-defence. He didn't know Punch, but he'd heard of his transactions, and when he came to examine him, he found it was the man. The doctor is a very sedate kind of person, and wishes to do good to all classes of the community at large, especially with his physic, which he gives gratis for nothing at all. The physic is called headache cologne, or a sure cure for the headache. Re-enter Beedle, Punch and the doctor still struggling together. Beedle, closing with them. Hi, hi, this is him. Behold, the head of a traitor. Come along, come to jail. Punch, a kicking. I will not go. Beedle, shouting. More help, more help, more help, help, help. Come along to jail, come along, come along. More help, more help. Oh, it's a good lark just here, sir, but tremendous hard work for there's so many figures to work, and all struggling too, and you have to work them all at once. This is comic, this is. Beedle. More help! Be quick! Be quick! Re-enter Jim Crow. Jim Crow. Come de long! Come de long! Come de long! Me nigger, and you beat a me! Excellent all. Punch still singing out. I'll not go! End of first act. Change of scene for second act. Scene draws up and discovers the exterior of a prison, with Punch peeping through the bars and singing a merry song of the merry bells of England, all of the olden time. That's an olden song, you know. It's old ancient, and it's a moral. A moral song, you know, to show that Punch is repenting, but pleased, and yet don't care nothing at all about it, for he's frolicsome, and on the height of his frolic and amusement to all the juveniles, old and young, rich and poor. We must put all classes together. 
Enter hangman Jack Ketch, or Mr. Grabble. That's Jack Ketch's name, you know. He takes all when they gets in his clutches. We mustn't blame him, for he must do his duty, for the sheriff's is so close to him. Preparation commences for the execution of Punch. Punch is still looking through the bars of Newgate. The last scene as I had was Temple Bar scene. It was a prison once, you know. That's the old ancient, you know. But I never let the others see it, cause it shouldn't become too public. But I think Newgate is better in the new edition. Though the prison is suspended, it being rather too terrific for the beholder. It was the old ancient style. The sentence is passed upon him, but by whom not known. He's not tried by one person, cause nobody can't. Jack Ketch. Now, Mr. Punch, you are going to be executed by the British and foreign laws of this and other countries, and you are to be hung up by the neck until you are dead, dead, dead. Punch. What? Am I to die three times? Jack. No, no, you're only to die once. Punch. How is that? You said I was to be hung up by the neck till I was dead, dead, dead. You can't die three times. Jack. Oh, no, only once. Punch. Why, you said dead, dead, dead. Jack. Yes, and when you are dead, 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 you will be quite dead. Punch. Oh, I never knew that before. Jack. Now prepare yourself for execution. Punch. What for? Jack. For killing your wife throwing your poor dear little innocent baby out of the window and striking the beetle unmercifully over the head with a mopstick. Come on. Excellent hangman behind scene and re-enter leading Punch slowly forth to the foot of the gallows. Punch comes most willingly, having no sense. Jack. Now, my boy, here is the corfin, here is the gibbet, and here is the pall. Punch. There's the coffee shop, there's giblets, and there's balls jack get out young foolish now then place your head in here punch what up here jack no a little lower down there's quick business in this you know this is comic a little comic business this is punch dodging the noose what here jack no no in there showing the noose again punch this way jack no, a little more this way, in there. Punch falls down and pretends he's dead. Jack, get up, you're not dead. Punch, oh yes I am. Jack, but I say no. Punch, please sir. Bowing to the hangman. Here he's an hypocrite, he wants to exempt himself. Do you show me the way, for I never was hung before, and I don't know the way. Please, sir, to show me the way, and I'll feel extremely obliged to you, and return you my most sincere thanks. Now that's well worded, sir. It's well put together. That's my beauty, that is. I am obliged to study my language, and not have anything vulgar whatsoever, all in simplicity, so that the young children may not be taught anything wrong. There aren't nothing to be learnt from it because of its simplicity. Jack. Very well, as you're so kind and condescending, I will certainly oblige you by showing you the way. Here, my boy, now place your head in here, like this. Hangman putting his head in noose. This is the right and the proper way. Now you see the rope is placed under my chin. I'll take my head out and I will place yours in. That's a rhyme. And when your head is in the rope, you must turn round to the ladies and gentlemen and say, Goodbye, fare you well. Very slowly then, a stop between each of the words, for that's not driving the people out of the world in quick haste without giving him time for repentance. That's another moral, you see. Oh, I like all the morals to it. Punch, quickly pulling the rope. Goodbye, fare you well. Hangs the hangman. What a hypocrite he is again, you see, for directly he's done it, he says, Now I'm free again, for frolic and fun, calls Joey the clown his old friend,
because they're both full of tricks and antics. Joey! Here's a man hung himself! That's his hypocrisy again, you see, for he tries to get exempt after he's done it himself. Enter Clown in quick haste, bobbing up against the gallows. Clown. Dear me, I've run against a milk post. Why, dear Mr. Punch, you've hung a man. Do take him down. How came you to do it? Punch. He got one through, and I hung him up to dry. Clown. Dear me, why, you've hung him up till he's dried quite dead. Punch. Poor fellow, then he won't catch cold with the wet. Let's put him in this snuff box. Pointing to Coffin. Joey takes the figure down and gives it to Punch to hold, so as the body do not run away, and then proceeds to remove the gallows. In doing so, he by accident hits Punch on the nose. Punch. Mind what you are about. For Punch is game, you know, right through to the backbone. Clown. Make haste, Punch. Here's somebody a-coming. They hustle his legs and feet in, but they can't get his head in, the undertaker not having made the coffin large enough. Punch. We'd better double him up, place the pole on, and take the man to the brave. Not the grave, but the brave, cause he's been a brave man in his time, maybe. Sings the song of Bobbing Around while with the coffin he bobs Joey on the head and exeunt. Re-enter Punch. Punch. That was a jolly lark, wasn't it? Sings. I'd be a butterfly, born in a flower, making apple dumplings without any flower. All this wit must have been born in me, or nearly so, but I got a good lot of it from Persini and Pike, and gleanings, you know. Punch disappears and re-enters with Bell. Punch. This is my piano sixty. It plays fifty tunes all at one time. Goes to the landlord of the public house, painted on the side scene or cottage, represented as a tavern or hotel. The children of the publican are all abed. Punch plays up a tune and solicits for money. Landlord wakes up in a passion through the terrible noise pokes his head out of window and tells him to go away. There's a little window and a little door to this side scene. If they was to play it all through, as you are writing, it had open Drury Lane Theatre. Punch. Go away! Yes, play away! Oh, you means o'er the hills and far away! He misunderstands him, willfully, the hypocrite. Punch keeps on ringing his bell violently. Publican, in a violent passion, opens the door and pushes him away, saying, Be off with you! Punch. I will not! Hits him over the head with the bell. You're no judge of music! Plays away. Publican exalts to fetch Cudgel to pay him out. Punch no sooner sees Cudgel than he exalts, taking his musical instrument with him. It's far superior to anything of the kind you did ever see, except seldom. You know it's silver, and that's what we says, seldom. Silver, you know, is seldom, because it's seldom you sees it. Publican comes out of his house with his cudgel to catch old Punch on the grand hop. Must have a little comic. Punch returns again with his bell, while Publican is hiding secretly for to catch him. Publican pretends, as he stands in a corner, to be fast asleep, but keeps his eyes wide awake all the while, and says... If he comes up here, I'll be one upon his tibby. Punch comes out from behind the opposite side and rings his bell violently. Publican makes a blow at him with his cudgel and misses, saying, How dare you intrude upon my premises with that nasty, noisy bell? Punch, while Publican is watching at this side scene, appears over at the other with a heartful dodge, and again rings his bell loudly, and again the Publican misses him. And while Publican is watching at this side scene, Punch re-enters and draws up to him very slowly and rests his piano sixty on the board while he slowly advances to him and gives him a whack on the head with his fist. Punch then disappears, leaving his bell behind and the landlord in possession of his music. Landlord collaring the bell. Smuggings! Possession is nine points of the law, 
so this bell is mine. Guarding over it with a stick. Smuggings, this is mine, and when he comes up to take this bell away, I shall have him. Smuggings, it's mine. Punch re-enters very slowly behind the publican as he is watching the bell, and snatching up the bell, cries out, That's mine! and exons with it. Publican, Dear me! Never mind, I look after him, I shall catch him some day or other. Hits his nose up against the post as he is going away. That's comic. Oh, my nose! Never mind, I'll have him again some time. Excite, publican. Clown re-enters with Punch. Clown. Oh, Punch, how are you? Punch. I'm very glad to see you. Oh, Joey, my friend, how do you do? Clown. Here, Punch, are you a mind for a lark? Peeping in at the cottage window, represented as a public house. Are you hungry, Punch? Would you like something to eat? Punch. Yes. Clown. What would you like? Punch. Not peculiar. Not particular, he means, you know. That's a slip word. Clown. I'll go up into the landlord and see if he's got anything to eat. Exeunt into cottage and poking his head out of the window. Here, Punch. Here's the landlord fast asleep in the kitchen cellar. Here's a lot of sausages hanging up here. Joey's a thieving, don't you see? He's a-robbing the landlord now. Would you like some for supper, eh, Punch? Punch. Yes, to be sure. Clown. Don't make a noise. You'll wake the landlord. Punch, whispering as loud as he can bawl through the window. Hand him out here. Punch pulls them out of the window. Clown. What are we to fry them in? I'll go and see if I can find a frying pan. Exeunt from window and reappears with frying pan, which he hands out of window for Punch to cook sausages in, and then disappears for a moment, after which he returns and says, with his head out of window, Would you like something hot, Punch? Punch. Yes, to be sure. Punch is up to everything. He's a helping him to rob the publican. One's as much in the mud as the other is in the mire. Clown, thrusting a red-hot poker out of window. Here, lay hold. Here's a lark. Make haste. Here's the landlord a-coming. Rubs Punch with it over the nose. Punch. Oh, my nose! That is a hot un Takes poker. Clown, re-enters and calls in at window. Landlord! Here's a fellow stole your sausages and frying pan. Wakes up landlord and exunts. Landlord appears at window. Here's somebody been in my house and actually stole my sausages, frying pan and red hot poker. Clown exunts when he has blamed it all to Punch. Joey stole him and Punch took him. And the receiver is always worse than the thief. For if there was never no receivers, there wouldn't never be no thieves. Landlord seizing the sausages in Punch's hand, says, How did you get these here? Punch. Joey stole them, and I took them. Landlord. Then you're both jolly thieves, and I must have my property. A scuffle ensues. Punch hollers out. Joey! Joey! Here's the landlord is stealing the sausages! So you see, Punch wants to make the landlord a thief, so as to exempt himself. He's a hypocrite there again, you see again. All through the piece, he's the masterpiece. Oh, a most clever man is Punch, and such a hypocrite. Punch, seizing the frying pan, which has been on the playboard, knocks it on the publican's head, when, there being a false bottom to it, the head goes through it, and the sausages gets about the publican's neck, and Punch pulls at the pan and the sausages with vehemence, till the landlord is exhausted and exonts with his own property back again. So there is no harm done, only merely for the lark, to return to those people what belongs to him. What you take away from a person, always give to them again. Re-enter Clown. Clown. Well, Mr. Punch, I shall wish you a pleasant good morning. Punch hits him with his cudgel. Good morning to you, Joey. Excellent, Joey. 
Punch sits down by the side of the poker, and Scaramouche appears without a head. Punch looks and beholds, and he's frightened, and exents with the poker. Scaramouche does a comic dance, with his long neck shooting up and down with the actions of his body, after which he exents. Punch re-enters again with the poker, and places it beside of him, and takes his cudgel in his hand for protection, while he is singing the national anthem of God save the Queen and all the royal family. Satan then appears as a dream, and it is all a dream after all, and dressed up as the Russian bear, leave politics alone as much as you can, for Punch belongs to nobody. Punch has a dreadful struggle with Satan, who seizes the red-hot poker and wants to take Punch away, for all his past misdeeds and frolic and fun, to the bottomless pit. By struggling with Satan, Punch overpowers him, and he drops the poker, and Punch kills him with his cudgel and shouts, Bravo! Hooray! Satan is dead! He cries, We must have a good conclusion. We can now all do as we like! That's the moral, you see. in France, but far different to the English punch. They're exhibiting their figures in a different way by performing them with sticks, the same as Scaramouche has done. They has a performing punch situated at the boulevards in Paris, where he has a certain piece of ground allotted for him, with seats attached, being his own freehold property. The passers-by, if they wish to see the performance, they take their seat with the juveniles, sits down, and he performs to them for what they think proper to give him. I never was over in France, but I've heard talk of him a deal from foreigners, who has given us inflammation about it, which they was so kind to do. They show us the difference between English and French, you know. End of section 11「Section 12 of London Labour and the London Poor, Volume 3, by Henry Mayhew. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Gillian Hendry. Street Exhibitors, Part 4. The Fantuccini Man. Everyone who has resided for any time in London must have noticed in the streets a large, roomy show upon wheels about four times as capacious as those used for the performances of Punch and Judy. The proprietor of one of these perambulating exhibitions was a person of some fifty-six years of age, with a sprightly, half-military manner, but he is seldom seen by the public, on account of his habit of passing the greater part of the day concealed within his theatre, for the purpose of managing the figures. When he paid me a visit, his peculiar erect bearing struck me as he entered. He walked without bending his knees, stamped with his heels, and often rubbed his hands together as if washing them with an invisible soap. He wore his hair with the curls arranged in a brutus a la George IV, and his chin was forced up into the air by a high black stock, as though he wished to increase his stature. He wore a frock coat, buttoned at waist, and open on his expanded chest, so as to show off the entire length of his shirt front. I could not help asking him if he had ever served in the army. He, however, objected to gratify my curiosity on that point, though it was impossible from his reply not to infer that he had been in Her Majesty's service. There was a mystery about his origin and parentage, which he desired should remain undisturbed. His relations were all of them so respectable, he said, that he did not wish to disgrace them by any revelations he might make, thus implying that he considered his present occupation a downfall in life. I followed it as my propensity, 
he proceeded, and though I have run through three fortunes, I follow it still. I never knew the value of money, and when I have it in my pocket, I cannot keep it there. I have spent forty-five pounds in three days. He seemed to be not a little fond of exhibiting his dolls, and considered himself to be the only person living who knew anything of the art. He said orders were sent to him from all parts of the country to make the figures, and indeed some of them were so intricate that he alone had the secret of their construction. He hardly seemed to like the marionettes, and evidently looked upon them as an interference with the real original character of the exhibition. The only explanation he could give of the difference between the marionettes and the Fantagini was that the one had a French title and referred to dolls in modern costume, whilst the other was an Italian word and applied to dolls in fancy dresses. He gave me the following interesting statement. The Fantuccini, he said, is the proper title of the exhibition of dancing dolls, though it has lately been changed to that of the marionettes, owing to the exhibition under that name at the Adelaide Gallery. That exhibition at the Adelaide Gallery was very good in its way, but it was nothing to be compared to the exhibition that was once given at the Argyle Rooms in Regent Street. That's the old place that was burned down. It was called Le Petit Théâtre Mathieu, and in my opinion, it was the best one that ever came into London, because they was well managed. They did little pieces, heavy and light. They did Shakespeare's tragedies and farces, and singing as well. Indeed, it was the real stage, only with dolls for actors and parties to speak for em and work their arms and legs behind the scenes. I've known one of these parties take three parts. Look at that for clever work. First he did an old man, then an old woman, and afterwards the young man. I assisted at that performance, and I should say it was full twenty years ago, to the best of my recollection. After the marionettes were moved to the Western Institution, Leicester Square, I assisted at them also. It was a passable exhibition, but nothing out of the way. The figures were only modelled, not carved, as they ought to be. I was only engaged to exhibit one figure, a sailor of my own making. It was a capital one, and stood as high as a table. They wanted it for the piece called The Manager in Distress, where one of the performers is a sailor. Mine would dance a hornpipe and whip its hat off in a minute. When I had finished performing it, I took good care to whip it into a bag, so that they should not see how I arranged the strings, for they was very backwards in their knowledge. When we worked the figures, it was very difficult, because you had to be up so high, like on the top of the ceiling, and to keep looking down all the time to manage the strings. There was a platform arranged, with a place to rest against, the first to introduce the Fantuccini into London, that is, into London streets, mind you, going about, was Gray, a Scotsman. He was a very clever fellow, very good, and there was nothing but what was good that belonged to it. Scenery, dresses, theatre, and all. He had a frame then, no longer than the punch frame now, only he had a labouring man to carry it for him and he took with him a box no larger than a haberdasher's box, which contained the figures, for they were not more than nine inches high. Now, my figures are two feet high, though they don't look it, but my theatre is ten feet high by six foot wide, and the opening is four feet high. This grey was engaged at all the theatres to exhibit his figures at the masquerades, Nothing went down but Mr. Gray, and he put poor Punch up altogether. When he performed at the theatres, he used to do it as a wind-up to the entertainment after the dancing was over, and they would clear the stage on purpose for him, and then let down a scene with an opening in it the size of his theatre. 
on these occasions his figures were longer about two feet and very perfect there was juggling and slack and tight rope dancing and punches and everything and the performance was never less than one hour and then it was done as quick as lightning every morning and no feet longer than two or three minutes it didn't do to have silly persons there this gray performed at vauxhall when bish the lottery man in cornhill had it and he went down wonderful he also performed before george the fourth i've heard say that he got ten pounds a week when he performed at vauxhall for they snatched him out of the streets and wouldn't let him play there it's impossible to say what he made in the streets for he was a scotchman and uncommon close if he took a hatful he'd say i've only got a few but he did so well he could sport his diamond rings on his fingers first rate splendid gray was the first to exhibit gratis in the streets of london but he was not the first to work fantoccini figures they had always been exhibited at theatres before that old porcini knowed nothing about them it was out of his business altogether for he was punch and nothing more gray killed porcini and his punch regular shut him up a man of the name of flockton from birmingham was to the best of my knowledge the first that ever had a fantoccini exhibition in england but he was only for theatres at this time i had been playing in the orchestra with some travelling comedians and mr seawood the master used among other things to exhibit the dancing figures he had a proscenium fitted up so that he could open a twenty-foot theatre almost large enough for living persons he had the splendidest figures ever introduced into this country he was an artist as well splendid scene and transparent painter indeed he's worked for some of the first noblemen in cheltenham doing up their drawing-rooms his figures worked their eyes and mouths by mechanism according to what they had to say they looked and moved their eyes and mouths according and females if they was singing heaved their bosoms like christians the same as life he had a turk who did the tight-rope without anybody being seen he always performed different pieces and had a regular wardrobe with him beautiful dresses and he'd dress em up to their parts and then paint their faces up with distemper which dries in an hour somebody came and told me that gray was in london performing in the streets and that's what brought me out i had helped mr seawood to manage the figures and i knew something about them they told me gray had a frame and i said well it's a bit of genius and is a fortune the only figures they told me he had and it was true was a sailor and a turk and a clown and what we calls a polander that's a man that tosses the pole i left seawood directly and i went to my father and got some money and began instantly making my frame and figures mine was about sixteen inches high and i had five of them i began very strong my fifth figure was a juggler i was the second that ever came out in the streets of london it was at the time that george the fourth went to scotland and gray went after him to try his luck following the royal family as the king went out of london i came in i first of all put up at peckham just to lay to a bit and look about me i'll tell you the reason i had no one to play and i couldn't manage the figures and do the music as well consequently i had to seek after some one to do the pandean pipes i didn't like to make my first performance in london without music at last i met a party that used to play the pipes at vauxhall i met him one day and he says what are you up to now so i told him i had the fantoccini figures he was a beautiful pipe player and i've never heard any one like him before or since he wouldn't believe i had the figures they was such a novelty i told him where i was staying and he and his partner came over to see me and i performed the figures and then we went on shares he had worked for gray and he knew all his houses where he used to perform and i knew nothing about these things 
when great came back he found me performing before one of his houses in harley street where he always had five shillings they was a tremendous success wonderful if we had a call at a house our general price was two and sixpence and the performance was for a good one twenty minutes then there was the crowd for the collection but they was principally halfpence and we didn't care about them much though we have taken four shillings we never pitched only to houses only stopping when we had an order and we hadn't occasion to walk far for as soon as the tune was heard up would come the servants to tell us to come i have had three at me at once i have known myself to be in devonshire place when i was performing there to be there for three hours and upwards going from house to house i could tell you how much we took a day it was after taking expenses from four to five pounds a day besides there was a labourer to whom we paid a guinea a week to carry a frame and he had his keep into the bargain where punch took a shilling we've taken a pound i recollect going down with the show to brighton and they actually announced our arrival in the papers saying that among other public amusements they had the fantoccini figures from london that's a fact that was in the paper we did well in brighton we have i can assure you taken eighteen shillings and sixpence in half an hour corner pitching as we call it that is at the corner of a street where there is a lot of people passing we had such success that the magistrates sent the head constable round with us to clear away the mob if we performed before any gentleman's place there was this constable to keep the place clear a nasty busy fellow he was too all the time we was at brighton we made twenty pounds a week clear for we then took only shillings and sixpences and there was no fourpenny pieces or threepenny bits in them times we had gentlemen come up many a time and offer to buy the whole concern clear what an idea wasn't it but we didn't want to sell it they couldn't have given us our price the crowd was always a great annoyance to us they'd follow us for miles and the moment we pitched up they'd come and gather about and almost choke us what was their halfpence to us when we was taking our half crowns actually in london we walked three and four miles to get rid of the mob but bless you we couldn't get rid of them for they was like flies after honey we used to do a great business with evening parties at christmas we have had to go three and four times in the same evening to different parties we never had less than a guinea and i have had as much as five pounds but the usual price was two pounds ten shillings and all refreshments found you i had the honour of performing before the queen when she was princess victoria it was at gloucester house park lane and we was engaged by the royal household a nice berth i had of it for it was in may and they put us on the landing of the drawing-room where the folding doors opened and there was some place close by where hot air was admitted to warm the apartments and what with the heat of the weather and this year ventilation with the heat coming up the grating places and my anxiety performing before a princess i was near baked and the perspiration quite run off me for i was packed up above standing up and hidden to manage the figures there was the maids of honour coming down the stairs like so many nuns dressed all in white and the princess was standing on a sofa with the duke of kent behind her she was apparently very much amused like others who had seen them i can't recollect what we was paid but it was very handsome and so forth i have also performed before the baroness rothschilds next the duke of wellington's and likewise the baron himself in grosvenor place and sir watkin w wynne and half the nobility in england we've been in the very first of drawing-rooms i shall never forget being at sir watkin wynne's for we was very handsomely treated and had the best of everything it was in st james's square and the best of mansions it was a juvenile party night and there was a juggler and a punch and judy 
and our Fantuccini. One of the footmen comes up and says he, Would any of you men like a jelly? I told him I didn't care for none, but the punch and duty man says, My missus is very partial to them. So the footman asks, How will you carry it home? I suggested he should put it in his hat, and the foolish fellow, half silly with horns of ale, actually did, and wrapped it up in his pocket handkerchief. There was a large tumbler full. By and by he cries, Lord, how I sweat! And there was the stuff running down his hair, like so much size. We did laugh, I can assure you. Fantuccini has fallen off now. It's quite different to what it was. I don't think the people's tired of it, but it ain't such a novelty. I could stop up a whole street if I liked, so that nothing could get along. And that shows the people ain't tired of it. I think it's the people that gave the half-crowns are tired of it, but those with the halfpence are as fond of it as ever. As times go, the performance is worth two pounds a week to me, and if it wasn't, I couldn't afford to stop with it, for I'm very clever on the violin, and I could earn more than thirty shillings a week playing in bands. We still attend evening parties, only it isn't to princesses, but gentry. We depend more upon evening parties. It isn't street work, only if we didn't go round, they'd think I was dead. We go to more than thirty parties a year. We always play according to price, whether it's fifteen shillings or ten shillings or a guinea. We don't get many five guinea orders now. The last one was six months ago, to go twenty-eight miles into Kent to a gentleman's house. When we go to parties, we take with us a handsome, portable, fold-up frame. The front is beautiful, and by a first-rate artist. The gentleman who done it is at the head of the carriage department at a railway, and there's the Royal Arms, all in gold, and it stands above ten feet high, and has wings and all, so that the music and everything is invisible. It shuts up like a portfolio. The figures are first-rate ones, and every one dressed according to the country, whatever it may be she is supposed to represent. They are in the best of material, with satin and lace, and all that's good. When we perform in the streets, we generally go through this programme. We begins with a female hornpipe dancer. Then there is a set of quadrilles by some marionette figures, four females and no gentlemen. If we did the men, we should want assistance, for four is as much as I can hold at once. It would require two men, and the street won't pay for it. After this, we introduces a representation of Mr. Grimaldi, the clown, who does tumbling and posturing, and a comic dance and so forth, such as trying to catch a butterfly. Then comes the enchanted Turk. He comes on in the costume of a Turk and he throws off his right and left arm, and then his legs, and they each change into different figures, the arms and legs into two boys and girls, a clergyman the head, and an old lady the body. That figure was my own invention, and I could, if I like, turn him into a dozen. Indeed, I've got one at home which turns into a parson in the pulpit, and a clerk under him, and a lot of little charity children with a form to sit down upon. They are all carved figures, every one of them, and my own make. The next performance is the old lady, and her arms drop off and turn into two figures, and the body becomes a complete balloon and car in a minute, and not a flat thing, but round. And the figures get into the car and up they go. Then there's the tightrope dance, and next, the Indian juggler, Ramo Sami, a representation, who chucks the balls about under his feet and under his arms, and catches them on the back of his head, the same as Ramo Sami did. Then there's the sailor's hornpipe, Italian scaramouche. He's the old style. This one has a long neck, and it shoots up to the top of the theatre. This is the original trick, and a very good one. Then comes the polander, who balances a pole and two chairs, and stands on his head and jumps over his pole. 
He dresses like a Spaniard and in the old style. It takes a quarter of an hour to do that figure well and make him do all his tricks. Then comes the skeletons. They're a regular first class, of course. This one also was my invention, and I was the first to make them, and I'm the only one that can make them. They are made of a particular kind of wood. I'm a first-rate carver, and can make my three guineas any day for a skull. Indeed, I've sold many to dentists to put in their windows. It's very difficult to carve this figure, and takes a deal of time. It takes two full months to make these skeletons. I've been offered ten pounds ten shillings for a pair, if I'd make them correct, according to the human frame. Those I make for exhibiting in the streets, I charge two pounds each for. They're good, and all the joints is correct, and you may put them into what attitudes you like, and they walk like a human being. These figures in my show come up through a trap-door, and perform attitudes, and shiver, and lie down, and do imitations of the pictures. It's a tragic sort of concern, and many ladies won't have them at evening parties, because it frightens the children. Then there's Judy Callaghan, and that livens up after the skeletons. Then six figures jump out of her pockets, and she knocks them about. It's a sort of comic business. Then the next is a countryman who can't get his donkey to go, and it kicks at him and throws him off, and all manner of comic antics, after Billy Button's style. Then I do the skeleton that falls to pieces, and then becomes whole again. Then there's another out-of-the-way comic figure that falls to pieces similar to the skeleton. He catches hold of his head and chucks it from one hand to the other. We call him the nondescript. We wind up with a scene in Tom and Jerry. The curtain winds up, and there's a watchman prowling the streets, and some of those larking gentlemen comes on and pitch into him. He looks round, and he can't see anybody. Presently another comes in and gives him another knock, and then there's a scuffle, and off they go over the watch box, and down comes the scene. That makes the juveniles laugh, and finishes up the whole performance merry-like. I forgot one figure now. I knowed there was another, and that's the Scotchman who dances the Highland Fling. He's before the watchman. He's in the regular national costume, everything correct and everything, and the music plays according to the performance. It's a beautiful figure when well handled, and the dresses cost something, I can tell you. All the joints are countersunk, then figures that shows above the knee. There's no joints to be seen, all works hidden like, something like Madame Vestris in Don Juan. All my figures have got shoes and stockings on. They have indeed. If it wasn't my work, they'd cost a deal of money. One of them is more expensive than all those in Punch and Judy put together. Talk of Punch knocking the Fantuccini down. Mine's all show. Punch is nothing, and cheap as dirt. I've also forgot the flower girl that comes in and dances with a garland. That's a very pretty figure in a fairy's dress, in a nice white skirt with naked carved arms, nice modelled, and the legs just the same. And the trunks come above the knee, the same as them ballet girls. She shows all the opera attitudes. The performance, to go through the whole of it, takes an hour and a half, and then you mustn't stand looking at it, but as soon as one thing goes off, the music changes and another comes on. That ain't one-third, nor a quarter, of what I can do. When I'm performing, I'm standing behind, looking down upon the stage. All the figures is hanging round on hooks, with all their strings ready for use. It makes your arms ache to work them, and especially across the loins. All the strength you have you must do, and chuck it out too, for those four figures which I uses at evening parties, which dance the polka, weighs six pounds, and that's to be kept dangling for twenty minutes together. They are two feet high, and their skirts take three quarters of a yard, and are covered with spangles, which gives them great weight. 
There are only two of us going about now with Fantuccini shows. Several have tried it, but they had to knock under very soon. They soon lost their money and time. In the first place, they must be musicians to make the figures keep time in the dances. And again, they must be carvers, for it won't pay to put the figures out to be done. I had ten pounds the other day only to carve six figures, and the wood only come to three shillings. That'll give you some idea of what the carving costs. Formerly, I used to make the round of the watering places, but I've got quite enough to do in London now, and travelling's very expensive, for the eating and drinking is so very expensive. Now, at Ramsgate, I've had to pay half a guinea for a bed, and that, to a man in my position, is more than I like. I always pays the man who goes along with me to play the music, because I don't go out every day, only when it suits me. He gets as good as his 23 shillings a week, according to how business is, and that's on an average as good as 4 shillings a day. If I'm very lucky, I makes it better for him, for a man can't be expected to go and blow his life away into Pandean pipes, unless he's well paid for it. End of section 12section thirteen of london labour and the london poor volume three by henry mayhew this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by gillian hendry street exhibitors part five guy foxes until within the last ten or twelve years the exhibition of guys in the public thoroughfares every fifth of november was a privilege enjoyed exclusively by boys of from 10 to 15 years of age, and the money arising therefrom was supposed to be invested at night in a small pyrotechnic display of squibs, crackers and catherine wheels. At schools and at many young gentlemen's houses, for at least a week before the fifth arrived, the bonfires were prepared and guys built up. At night one might see rockets ascending in the air from many of the suburbs of London, and the little back gardens in such places as the Hampstead Road and Kennington, and, after dusk, suddenly illuminated with the blaze of the tar barrel, and one might hear in the streets even banging of crackers mingled with the laughter and shouts of boys enjoying the sport. In those days the street guys were of a very humble character, the grandest of them generally consisting of old clothes stuffed up with straw and carried in state upon a kitchen chair. The arrival of a guy before a window was announced by a juvenile chorus of Please to remember the 5th of November! So diminutive, too, were some of the guys that I have even seen dolls carried about as the representatives of the late Mr. Fox. In fact, none of these effigies were hardly ever made of larger proportions than Tom Thumb, or than would admit of being carried through the garden gates of any suburban villa. Of late years, however, the character of Guy Fawkes Day has entirely changed. It seems now to partake rather of the nature of a London May Day. The figures have grown to be of gigantic stature, and whilst clowns, musicians and dancers have got to accompany them in their travels through the streets. The traitor fox seems to have been almost laid aside, and the festive occasion taken advantage of for the expression of any political feeling, the guy being made to represent any celebrity of the day who has for the moment offended against the opinions of the people. The kitchen chair has been changed to the costermonger's donkey truck, or even vans drawn by pairs of horses. The bonfires and fireworks are seldom indulged in, the money given to the exhibitors being shared among the projectors at night, the same as if the day's work had been occupied with acrobating or nigger singing. The first guy of any celebrity that made its appearance in the London streets was about the year 1844, when an enormous figure was paraded about on horseback. This had a tall extinguisher hat with a broad red brim and a pointed Van Dyke collar that hung down over a smock frock, 
which was stuffed out with straw to the dimensions of a water butt. The figure was attended by a body of some half dozen costermongers, mounting many coloured cockades and armed with formidable bludgeons. The novelty of the exhibition ensured its success, and the coppers poured in in such quantities that on the following year gigantic guys were to be found in every quarter of the metropolis. But the gigantic movement did not attain its zenith till the no popery cry was raised upon the division of England into papal bishoprics. Then it was no longer Fox, but Cardinal Wiseman and the Pope of Rome, who were paraded as guys through the London thoroughfares. The figures were built up of enormous proportions, the red hat of the cardinal having a brim as large as a loo table, and his scarlet cape being as long as a tent. Guy Fox, seated upon a barrel marked gunpowder, usually accompanied his holiness and the cardinal, but his diminutive size showed that Guy now played but a secondary part in the exhibition, although the lantern and the matches were tied as usual to his radishy and gouty fingers. According to the newspapers, one of these shows was paraded on the Royal Exchange, the merchants approving of the exhibition to such an extent that sixpences, shillings and half-crowns were showered into the hats of the lucky costers who had made the speculation. So excited was the public mind that, at night, after business was over, processions were formed by tradespeople and respectable mechanics, who, with bands of music playing and banners flying, on which were inscribed anti-papal mottos and devices, marched through the streets with flaming torches, and after parading their monster popes and cardinals until about nine o'clock at night, eventually adjourned to some open space, like Peckham Rye or Blackheath, where the guy was burned amid the most boisterous applauses. Cardinal Wiseman and the Pope reappeared for several years in succession, till at length the Russian war breaking out, the Guy Fox constructors had a fresh model to work upon. The Emperor of Russia accordingly came out in the streets, in all forms and shapes, sometimes as the veritable Nicholas, in jackboots and leather breeches, with his unmistakable moustache, and often as old Nick, with a pair of horns and a lengthy appendage in the form of a tail, with an arrow-headed termination. And not unfrequently, he was represented as a huge bear crouching beneath some rude symbol of the English and French alliance. On the 5th of November, 1856, the guys were more of a political than a religious character. The unfortunate Pope of Rome had in some instances been changed for Bomba, though the Tsar, His Holiness, and his British representative, the Cardinal, were not altogether neglected. The want of any political agitation was the cause why the guys were of so uninteresting a character. I must not, however, forget to mention a singular innovation that was then made in the recognised fashion of guy-building, one of the groups of figures exhibited being, strange to say, of a complementary nature. It consisted of Miss Nightingale, standing between an English grenadier and a French foot-soldier, while at her feet lay the guy between two barrels marked gunpowder and so equivocally attired that he might be taken for either the Emperor of Russia or the Pope of Rome. At Billingsgate, a guy was promenaded round the market as early as five o'clock in the morning by a party of charity boys who appeared by their looks to have been sitting up all night. It is well known to the boys in the neighbourhood of the great fish market that the guy which is first in the field reaps the richest harvest of halfpence from the salesman and indeed till within the last three or four years one fish factor was in the habit of giving the bearers of the first effigy he saw a half-crown piece hence there were usually two or three different guy parties in attendance soon after four o'clock awaiting his coming into the market for manufacturing a cheap guy such as that seen at billingsgate a pair of old trousers and wellington boots form the most expensive item the shoulders of the guy are generally decorated with a paper cape adorned with different coloured rosettes and gilt stars. A fourpenny mask makes the face, and a proper cocked hat, embellished in the same style as the cape, surrounds the rag head. 
The general characteristics of all guys consists in a limpness and roundness of limb, which give the form a puddingy appearance. All the extremities have a kind of paralytic feebleness, so that the head leans on one side, like that of a dead bird, and the feet have an unnatural propensity for placing themselves in every position but the right one, sometimes turning their toes in, as if their legs had been put on the wrong way, or keeping their toes turned out, as if they had been struck so, while taking their first dancing lesson. Their fingers radiate like a bunch of carrots, and the arms are as shapeless and bowed as the monster sausage in a cookshop window. The face is always composed of a mask, painted in the state of the most florid health, and singularly disagreeing with the frightful debility of the body. Through the holes for the eyes, bits of rag and straw generally protrude, as though birds had built in the socket. A pipe is mostly forced into the mouth, where it remains with the bowl downwards, and in the hands it is customary to tie a lantern and matches. Whilst the guy is carried along, you can hear the straw in his interior rustling and crackling, like moving a workhouse mattress. As a general rule, it may be added that guys have a helpless, drunken look. When, however, the monster guy foxes came into fashion, considerably greater expense was gone to in getting up the figures. Then the feet were always fastened in their proper position, and although the arrangement of the hands was never perfectly mastered, yet the fingers were brought a little more closely together, and approached the digital dexterity of the dummies at the cheap cloth marts. For carrying the guys about, chairs, wheelbarrows, trucks, carts and vans are employed. Chairs and wheelbarrows are patronised by the juvenile population, but the other vehicles belong to the gigantic speculations. On the Surrey side, a guy was exhibited in 1856, whose straw body was encased in a coachman's old greatcoat, covered with different colours, as various as the waistcoat patterns on a tailor's show book. He was wheeled about on a truck by three or four young men, whose hoarse voices, when shouting, Please to remember the guy, showed their regular occupation to be street selling for they had the same husky sound as the eight a groat fresh herons in the Saturday night street markets. In the neighbourhood of Walworth, men dressed up as guys were dragged about on trucks. One of them was seated upon a barrel marked gunpowder, his face being painted green and ornamented with an immense false nose of a bright scarlet colour. I could not understand what this guy was meant to represent, for he wore a sugar-loaf hat with an ostrich feather in it, and had on a soldier's red coat decorated with paper rosettes as big as cabbages. His legs, too, were covered with his own corduroy trousers, but adorned with paper streamers and bows. In front of him marched a couple of men carrying broomsticks, and musicians playing upon a tambourine and a penny tin whistle. The most remarkable of the stuffed figures of 1856 was one dressed in a sheet intended to represent the Reverend Mr. Spurgeon in a surplice. It was carried about on a wooden stage by boys and took very well with the mob, for no sooner did the lads cry out, Remember, remember, the 5th of November, old Spurgeon's treason and plot, than a shout of laughter burst from the crowd and the halfpence began to pour in. Without this alteration in the November rhyme, Nobody would have been able to have traced the slightest resemblance between the guy and the reverend gentleman whose effigy it was stated to be. Further, it should be added that the guy exhibitors have of late introduced a new system of composing special rhymes for the occasion, which are delivered after the well-known Remember, Remember. Those with the figures of the Pope, for instance, sing... A penworth of cheese to feed the Pope, a tuppenny loaf to choke him, a pint of beer to wash it down, and a good large faggot to smoke him. I heard a party of costermongers who had the image of His Imperial Majesty the Emperor of all the Russias wobbling on their truck sing in chorus this home manufactured verse Poke an ingin in his eye, a squib shove up his nose, sirs, then roast him till he's done quite brown, and nick to old nick goes, sirs. 
with a larger guise little is usually said or done beyond exhibiting them in the crowded thoroughfares, the proprietors mostly occupy themselves only with collecting the money, and never let the procession stop for a moment. On coming to the squares, however, a different course is pursued, for then they stop before every window where a head is visible, and sing the usual remember, remember, winding up with a vociferous hurrah as they hold out their hats for the halfpence. At the West End, one of the largest guys of 1856 was drawn by a horse in a cart. This could not have been less than 14 feet high. Its face, which was as big as a shield, was so flat and good-humoured in expression that I at once recognised it as a pantomime mask, or one used to hang outside some masquerade costumier's shop door. The coat was off the Charles II's cut, and composed of a lightish coloured paper ornamented with a profusion of Dutch metal. There was a sash across the right shoulder, and the legs were almost as long as the funnel to a penny steamer, and ended in brown paper cavalier boots. As the costermongers led it along, it shook like a load of straw. If it had not been for the bull's-eye lantern and lath matches, nobody would have recognised in the dandy figure the effigy of the wretched fox. By far the handsomest turnout of the day at this time was a group of three figures which promenaded Whitechapel and Bethnal Green. They stood erect in a van drawn by a blind horse and accompanied by a band of one performer on the drum and pandean pipes. Four clowns in full costume made faces while they jumped about among the spectators and collected donations. All the guys were about ten feet high. The centre one, intended for Fox himself, was attired in a flowing cloak of crimson glazed calico, and his black hat was a broad-rimmed sugar loaf, the pointed crown of which was like a model of Langham Place Church steeple, and it had a profusion of black hair streaming about the face. The figures on either side of this were intended for Lords Suffolk and Monteagle, in the act of arresting the traitor and accordingly appeared to be gently tapping Mr. Fox on either shoulder. The bodies of their lordships were encased in gold scale armour, and their legs in silver ditto, whilst their heads were covered with three-cornered cocked hats, surmounted by white feathers. In the front of the van were two white banners, with the following inscriptions in letters of gold. Apprehension of Guy Fox on the 5th of November in the year 1605 and the discovery of the gunpowder plot on the 5th of November, 1605. At the back of the van flaunted two flags of all nations. In addition to the four clowns, there were several other attendants. One in particular had the appearance of half a man and half a beast, his body being clad in a green frock coat, whilst his legs and feet were shaggy and made to imitate a bear's. The most remarkable part of this exhibition was the expression upon the countenances of the figures. They were ordinary masks, and consequently greatly out of proportion for the height of the figures. There was a strong family resemblance between the traitor and his arresters. Neither did Fox's countenance exhibit any look of rage, astonishment, or disappointment at finding his designs frustrated. Nor did their lordships appear to be angry, disgusted, or thunderstruck, at the conspirators' bold attempt. In the neighbourhood of Bond Street, the guys partook of a political character as if to please the various members of Parliament who might be strolling to their clubs. In one barrow was the effigy of the Emperor of the French, holding in his hands, instead of the lantern and matches, a copy of the Times newspaper, torn in half. I was informed that another figure I saw was intended to represent the form of Bomba. In the neighbourhood of Lambeth Palace, the guys were of an ecclesiastical kind, and such as it was imagined would be likely to flatter the Archbishop of Canterbury into giving at least a half-crown. One of these was drawn by two donkeys and accompanied by drums and pipes. It represented Cardinal Wiseman in the company of four members of the Holy Inquisition. The Cardinal was dressed in the usual scarlet costume, while the inquisitors were robed in black, with green veils over their faces. In front of the cart was a bottle labelled holy water, which was continually turned round, 
so that the people might discover that on the other side was printed whisky. The practice of burning guys and lighting bonfires and letting off fireworks is now generally discontinued, and particularly as regards the public exhibitions at Blackheath and Peckham Rye. The greatest display of fireworks, we are inclined to believe, took place in the public streets of the metropolis, for up to twelve o'clock at night one might occasionally hear reports of penny cannons and the jerky explosions of crackers. End of section 13